get inspired our Blue Ecosystems Day in the course of the day and in discussions. Um, we have goodwill ambassadors among them, the voice of the next generation of leaders, and our UNAP experts on ecosystems from salt to fresh. So I'm so pleased to introduce Dia Misa. So please come to the, to the stage. Dia and Rocky Duani, please. They are both UNAP Goodwill Ambassadors for India and Africa, respectively. And I know that we need a little time to get them sorted with the mics. So in meanwhile, we are setting our guests. Let me also invite Grace Kutapa, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs Frontline Youth Channel, to sit. And our director, Susan Gardner, and, and marine oceanographer, um, aquatic scientist uh, leader. So welcome everybody. Little minutes for setting everybody. <laughs> so in meanwhile, we are getting all of our guests completely set. Uh, let me just flag, and I want to acknowledge that we have a high, great, an exciting audience online. So welcome everybody. Uh, good day, wherever you are in the world. So allow me to provide a little bit of context in meanwhile, uh, we are getting our guests completely sorted. Today we are changing up, uh, changing it up a little by asking our guests to reflect on how they have been inspired by nature, particular the underwater nature. That is the topic that we are talking about today uh, and to share their thoughts about it. But we have a very interesting dynamics on how to do it today to inspire their reflections. So we are having the last one. So my constellation of panelists, are you ready? So, perfect. Let me start with Dia. Uh, you have been such a champion on environmental topics, Dia, from reducing single-use plastics uh, and even getting policies passed in India to ban uh, to ban the use of the single-use single-use plastics, uh, to protecting wild wildlife from elephants to rhinos. So, you share this beautiful photos uh, with us. You please take a look. This is Dia in action. She's doing a cleanup on the beach. Dia with her beloved baby and son that now I was told is growing up. So please uh, tell us about them. These pictures also give us your message of hope for COP28. Um, as Susan mentioned, uh, you know, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by the ocean. And um, I have, when I first moved to Mumbai, it was the first time that I lived by the sea. And so my connection with the sea um, has been integral to the life that I've been able to make in the city uh, that I now call home and have been calling home for over 20 years. And one of my most beloved memories as a child was spending time on the beach with my father and swimming in the sea. And the picture that you see here, this, the one on the right, is of my child's first visit to the sea. And the other picture is from me from my first beach cleanup that I took part in um, nearly a decade ago. Uh, the reason why I shared these two images was because they reflect two very vital um, parts of my journey. One, my discovery of how polluted our ocean waters and sea waters had become and how individual choices contribute to that and how just by becoming more conscious, conscious and aware of our patterns of consumption, we could change the way we were living and hopefully bring down the pollution in our oceans and seas. Uh, and uh, I was deeply inspired by the incredible work being done by Afrosha that has now subsequently led to many, many more citizen groups participating and conducting these ocean and sea beach cleanups. 
And the second picture is important because up until I had my child, I responded to the climate crisis um, as a, a being that lived on this beautiful planet that cared so deeply for all these creatures and all these, this creation that we co-inhabit this planet with. But when I became a mother, everything changed. My love deepened, but my sense of despondency and urgency uh, became even more accelerated. And uh, today, as a mother, I feel so much more passionately about the work that I do. And I feel like my purpose has deepened so much more because I have to protect everything that our beautiful planet has given us so generously, not just for every other being on this planet, but for my children. And um, I'm just really, really grateful that my child can enjoy his time out in nature just as much as I did when I was a child and respond to every aspect of nature with such a sense of delight and wonder. And every time I look at anything in nature from his eyes, I feel that sense of wonder and joy so much more. And I think a very fundamental part of being a protector of the wild, of nature, of all that is that we share together is to have that love. That is what unites us. So that's my message of hope. And I truly hope this COP28, uh, all our leaders, every change maker and individual recognizes that our ocean systems and our seas um, are integral to protecting our planet and keeping it healthy and livable. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mia. It's amazing to see you sharing. I can see a strong woman and a mother fighting hard for the future of your son to have the right for healthy and clean oceans. Yes. So thanks a lot. This is really um, amazing to listen in. So now let me bring in you, uh, Rocky. You are a Grammy-nominated Ghanaian musician. You have been inspiring us with your songs uh, in so many special moments. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to have you here. In this photo, we have two photos and I want to make a clear distinction between them. One, uh, in the one of these pictures, we can see you and the joy coming through. And we can see your connection with the ocean and the nature, but also a more pensive side. You look like, reaching or scanning the future and the horizon uh, to understand what comes next. So please tell us about this picture and your message of hope and how this landscapes inspire or concerns you uh, nowadays for the COP2018 leaders. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, it's a great honor to be here and uh, the opportunity to share with you um, you know, my experiences and what the ocean means to me. I mean, growing up as a child, um, I grew up not close to the ocean, but I grew up a little farther from the ocean. And I remember the first time that I was, you know, introduced to the ocean, watching the waves and watching how the water moved. And then, you know, getting the courage to go and touch the water. And, you know, there was a certain energy of awesomeness. And that awesomeness was born from the feeling that this was a communication, not only between myself, but a communication of the land and our people to other people to across who we haven't seen. And in every blow of the waves, I could hear voices of ancestors and visions of people that who lived in other places and their songs and all of that so when i became music became my path the ocean was became a sort of symbolism for me not symbolism in terms of just being a water a, a big and awesome water body but a space where i could go and be able to distill inspiration that I felt that the inspiration was not only from me, but the inspiration was a chorus of global feeling and ideas. So 
it became a place of when I was writing music. I will go to the ocean, spend hours, you know, get myself in the water, you know, swim a little bit, sit by the water, close my eyes, listen to the waves, let the waves like really wash over me. And there was this spiritual connection. And it also led me to really start writing better because I felt that when I kept quiet and listened, there was this energy of inspiration that burst through me and it made my song writing better. I will sing to the ocean, work on my voices. So a lot of even my songs that eventually became, you know, standards that many people know were actually birthed from the ocean. But the ocean also affected me in two different ways. When I remember, you know, walking down Lombardi Beach, which is Ghana's biggest beach. One day I went there and I it was, it used to be my favorite beach. And I went there, it was full of trash. Because the trash, the, there was plastic, net, everything. And there was a feeling of sadness. And that sadness was about, I felt a certain level of failure, not only me, but a certain level of failure, our collective failure for such a body that inspires us, gives us food, uh, you know, gives us energy, you know, helps our weather, you know, Mother Nature is embedded in the ocean. And even in the scriptures, when you read, the water was there before the land came. So when even we talk of a bigger idea of God, I feel that the ocean is where we, we receive this energy. So seeing the dirt on the ocean, I felt a certain level of failure. So it really inspired and sealed with, with me the conviction that I have to do whatever I can to utilize the inspiration that I was getting from the ocean and my platform of music and the gifts songs that I've received from the ocean is also a means for advocacy to make sure that we work together, myself and everybody that I know work together to protect the, the, the sanctity of the ocean. So going to these photographs, first of all, the one on top is the pensive mood of meditation, the pensive mood of reflection. On the ocean, I like a lot of times to keep quiet most of the time and be taught and listen and be inspired. And also be able to formulate a perspective of what I want to do, like my next moves, my next steps, what are the big things in life that I felt I, I feel I should focus on. And the first photograph really reflects that element. It is a photograph of veneration, awesomeness, respect, and at the same time, inspiration. The second one is what I do all the time. I go, I get there, I run as far as I can. I jog on the ocean. I take off my clothes. I jump in the water. Afterwards, I sing. I sit on the shore and I sing and I sing and I sing. And it's this feeling of joyfulness. It's this feeling of gratefulness. It's this feeling to know that this earth is a gift to all of us. and through my power of song and through my medium, I have at least been playing my meaningful role to inspire people to do what is right when it comes to the ocean. And this is also a message that I feel is critical. All of us gathering here, all of us being in this sacred spot, because I call it sacred because last night I was walking and I saw the sea of humanity. And when I looked at the sea of humanity, it was everybody, every culture, and everybody was walking quietly, leaving the place. We were sharing the same space. We were aware of each other, but not aware of each other at the same time. But we all were gathered here for a common purpose, a common purpose of working to make sure that we inspire the entire human race to do what is right when it comes to nature, 
to clean the oceans, to hold the oceans high. So my message is one of hope, is that there is nothing higher than our collective will to be successful, our collective will to rise to the highest level. So the messages of doom and gloom, I hear them, but they don't affect me. I hear them, but they don't play a role in what I do. I feel that inspiration is the biggest power that we need right now. And we need to go forth and make sure that every day in our practice, we clean, we, we do what is right to make sure the ocean stays clean. Through our conversation, we spread the message. Through our the way we live, we live in a way that in the long run, maybe a few years from now, we don't need to convene here to talk about the ocean being in trouble, the ocean losing its ability to support us. So I am honored to be here. I know that we are a generation that can make it because we are the one who have the mantle right now. And victory is ours if only we work together. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rocky. And I think we can, the sounds of the waves are actually audible in your music. Fair. It's a great pleasure to listening from your perspective. Let me now bring you, Grace. You are here as a Global Fund for Coral Reefs Frontline Youth Ambassador, but you are also a work in the Philippines on blue finance. So you are an inspiration. You are also a practitioner. So this is a great picture, a uh, great photo of the young Grace, as you can see. Uh, did you know then that uh, would be that you would be working for the environment nowadays? And if you have the chance to say something to the little you, uh, what do you do, what, what would you see uh, at the at this moment that you want the leaders in this COP28 to resonate? on behalf of this little girl and then the young woman you are? Well, at that time, I definitely did not know that I would be working for the environment. At five years old, my permanent teeth was just starting to grow and replace my baby teeth. And I was still shielded from all the problems that's happening in the world. But I grew up in a coastal community in Mindoro Island in the Philippines, and through that, I learned what's happening on the ground. And going to school, I learned what's happening globally. And I realized that I couldn't just stand here and not do anything. Uh, through my work on the ground, I was able to engage with marginalized communities, fisher folk and indigenous peoples who are experiencing the impacts of the problems. And there's this quote in my local language in Filipino that goes, Kapag namulat ka na sa katotohanan, kasalanan na ang pumikit. It means once your eyes are opened about the truth, it is morally wrong to close your eyes again. Oh, wow. So we are morally responsible to act on this crisis. And through my work with uh, Blue Finance, Blue Alliance in the Philippines, supported by the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, I was able to see the issues that's happening on the ground, the gaps that we need to fill in terms of protecting our ocean, and also uh, working with the local community. I saw that solutions exist and people actually care. There is hope. Uh, there's one marine ranger, so rangers are the ones enforcing our marine protected areas patrolling with their boat, ensuring that there's no illegal fishing happening. Uh, Kuya Rodmar, that's his name. He is usually my dive buddy because he would he was trained by Blue Alliance, Blue Finance, to become a scuba diver. And he told me that he wants to protect the environment because he wants his kids and the future generations to still be able to see the beauty of our marine ecosystems. And... That's very important. The people in my community, the young people like me, actually care about the problem and we are working. We are working to resolve all the problems. We believe there is hope and we believe that we can translate this hope into action. That's why we're all here today because there is hope for us, the young people who will inherit this world and there is hope for the future generations who will be the next leaders 
of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. I wish the little girl could see you now. <laughs> Dr. Susan Gardner. So it's my pleasure now to bring you on the stage. Uh, you are a scientist, you are a woman and a leader in the UN Environment Program, and you are responsible for a division that takes care of all ecosystems, fresh, salt, land, and water. So, but we can see you in this picture. You are enjoying the ocean element. So I would love to listening. How do you feel about it? And what is your message for the other leaders, your peers in this COP28? Well, thank you, Leticia. And certainly it's the people of UNEP, the people of your branch that are doing all the amazing work that you lead that is how a division like the Ecosystems Division is able to reach forward to achieve a mandate uh, to support member states. You know, this photo in particular, the one at the top, uh, it connects a bit to some of the stories that I heard here, uh, because if you zoomed out, you would see that actually I'm diving with my family. My two kids had just gotten their scuba certification. And my husband and I are both marine biologists. We actually met in Mexico on the Pacific coast studying gray whales. And we started, I would say our courtship probably took place underwater as much as it did uh, above. And we, um, and, and we both agreed, like one of the things we wanted to ensure that we instilled in our children was a love for nature and, a, and an experience with being uh, in the sea. And so that was an exciting moment for us because we got to pass that on to our children and the four of us were out there diving together, you know, and, you know, being united in a way where you don't talk about, you know, I'm hungry or when are we going to get there? Or, you know, ah, she got more of this. You're just together in the moment. It was really beautiful. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, I've been inspired, I think, as a central issue as across my career when I was a scientist. Um, by really looking at the vulnerabilities in our ecosystems and what we're doing as humans to impact them. And so I began my career looking at invasive wetland species, but I quickly moved into uh, more ocean and coastal work to try to understand, for example, how contaminants move through uh, dolphins and porpoises across the blood brain barrier to actually affect echolocation and sonar, how those same persistent organic pollutants uh, could move through uh, the placenta and actually accumulate in uh, marine mammal fetus before it is even born. And so uh, that also led me to Mexico, where I did a lot of work on gray whales, but also on sea turtles, trying to understand the whole range of threats to marine biodiversity. So it's often bycatch, you know, unintentional bycatch. It's often intentional illegal harvest. Uh, in a lot of cases though, it's about the contaminants that we put into the ocean that for example, sea turtles that can live to be above a hundred years old are gonna be accumulating over that whole lifespan. Uh, and so I was inspired to see what I could do in terms of contributing information to solve these problems or at least to understand them better. I kind of, I like to think that, you know, every one of these freckles and these wrinkles on my face is, is a mark from a data spreadsheet where maybe there was something in that data, some information that, you know, helped contribute something to our understanding. And that's what makes me really inspired. I'm inspired by the stories that you've told. I'm inspired by the, the intelligence and the, and the passion and the dedication of our young people. Um, I'm honored and thrilled by such important voices, Rocky and Dia, that you bring to these so that you can allow others to understand these issues better than if it was just the UN flag out there flying alone. Um, and uh, I believe because we have the data that you know, so many scientists uh, have put forward to the world that we understand the solutions and we can do this. And that inspires me. Thank you very much, Susan. This is really inspiring by all means and uh, more is to see your concrete leadership guiding us to this direction. So I would say there is that we couldn't have made better to trigger or to kick off the, the ecosystem, the Blue Ecosystems Day than this panel. Uh, we are talking about 70% of the world, of the planet. We are in a blue planet. And if we add the 
fresh waters, 77% of the planet is blue, is fluid, and fluidity is about connection. As uh, Rocky mentioned, Susan as well, you can listen in the voices of everybody, even if you don't know them or where they are, they know they are out there. And the ocean is this connectivity and the water is this, is this body that brings us together. Of course, this will play and have to play, has to play a big role in the climate change uh, crisis uh, as a solution. So with that, I would like to invite you, Susan, to conduct us to the closing of the session. Please remain the other panelists and uh, we will give you, uh, you will give us the last remarks. Over to you. Alice, thank you so much. Um, like I said before, this it's your voices. I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> Oh, thank you. It's it's these voices, it's these stories that you share that that resonate, that stay with us, that that generate the continued understanding of the importance opportunities that we have with our ocean. So thank you so much. And there's another really important voice on oceans. You know, when we think about the exciting events of this Blue Ecosystem Day, we can take a pause to think about just uh, last year in July, uh, when the world converged in Lisbon for the second ever UN Ocean Conference. And many of you will remember that excitement and that energy as we discussed everything from issues of investing in blue nature-based solutions to those more sensitive, and very important topics like deep sea mining. And, and I think a number of us walked away from those conversations very energized and ready to to, to get to work. We were inspired by young people. We were inspired, for example, by our very own UN ambassador for life underwater, our Aquaman, Jason Momoa, who sprinkled stardust on all of us. And these UN conferences are that opportunity for the world to take a pause and focus on blue ecosystems. And UNEP is enormously pleased to be supporting France and Costa Rica in the massive success that we will have at the third ocean conference set to take place in June, 2025 in Nice. The important leadership of these two countries is key to the success and bringing together so many critical stakeholders to ocean ecosystems. And so it's my honor now as we excuse our panelists to introduce our next guest, a true friend of UNEP and a staunch advocate for global oceans, Minister Berville, State Secretary for the Sea of France. His formidable experience has led you through service as a politician, as an economist, and as a true guardian of the sea. Minister, thank you so much for sharing some remarks. Uh, here is, you hear me? Yes. Bonjour, bonjour. How are you? So, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suzanne, for your words, for your work with your, all your team. And I think it's, it's a true privilege to be here with you uh, this morning. But we are lucky also in our fight to protect the ocean and to protect the environment and protect our planet more generally, because we have institutions such as the United Nations Environment Program who are fighting to protect the ocean, fighting against illegal fishing, fighting against plastic pollution since the 1970s, and they're still continuing and having new battles, and we're going to probably discuss about the deep sea mining uh, also in the next uh, future years. But I'm happy to be here with you because I realize this is not my first COP, but this, but this is my first COP as a minister. And this is, for me, something really striking in the sense that the place of the ocean is quite limited. And thanks to this kind of event, we can share together, of course, the story of people living on coastal uh, areas. And we can also try to raise the voice of people and raise, no, at least give 
the, the, the mic to the people like you who are advocating for the protection of the, uh, the ocean. And I'm here because I want to share just two priorities on uh, or, or a few elements of what we're going to try to do together with the objective of the United Nations Ocean Conference in 2025 in Nice that we are organizing with uh, Costa Rica. And Costa Rica will organize a high level uh, meeting next year and will have uh, the responsibility of gathering scientists, uh, of course, uh, activists, uh, politicians, but also member of uh, the business community with one goal, making sure that people realize that ocean is key to fight climate change. Because as we know, it's, as you all said, it's 70% of the surface of this planet. It's a key element also to tackle the erosion of biodiversity because most of the biodiversity are coming from the ocean. It's still coming from the ocean also. This is where life began. And also that um, the, the, the ocean is also a key element for sovereignty. And I think sovereignty is liberty. And liberty is the capacity of each people, each individual to choose their life. And as you know, 80% of the trade is through maritime route through maritime transport. So when we talk about like sovereignty, when we talk about like uh, the capacity of de delivering medicine, de delivering product is through also uh, 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 the ocean. And in every single phone that we have, 90% of our data, data are coming through submarine cables, 90, nine, zero. So it means that like in terms also of sharing the stories, sharing uh, our passion, sharing also uh, the, the, the science, it has also to take into account the ocean and the capacity that we still protect the ocean. So I'm not really happy because there is no picture of myself when I was a, a kid. Uh, because you will have realized that I'm a little bit like a, a someone is in this position because I was born in Rwanda. So there is nothing really related between Rwanda and Ocean, because as you know, it's a landlocked country. I grew up uh, in France because I was adopted uh, right after the genocide in 1994 by the French family. And I got lucky. First of all, I got lucky because I managed to survive this genocide. That was my first love. And the second one, thank you. And the second look I, I got is like, I got adopted in a French family that was living 10 minutes from the sea. So I, I learned to, to love the, the ocean. And, I, you know, I was quite fascinated because I'm from Brittany, the west of France, the most beautiful part of France, of course. Uh, and it's a place, it's a region that's where ocean is everywhere, in your food, in your life, we have a strong fisherman community, but we also have like the first offshore wind uh, uh, production. We also have a lot of tourism by the sea. We have like beautiful place, uh, marinated protected areas. And I realized that ocean, as you all said, was a place where you could like dream of a lot of things, where you could also uh, 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 experience a lot of uh, 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 good thing. It was also a place where people were not really, I wouldn't say happy, but were not succeeding in what they were doing in in uh, in the land. They could have like a another way of, uh, of expressing themselves uh, in the sea. I can tell you that I'm really bad at sailing, but it's between ourselves. Uh, I'll try to 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 be better at sailing when I, I, I stop being like a politician. Uh, but I realized also that uh, this experience of the sea, it could heal people. It, it could give like them like a, 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 a sense that uh, they could succeed, succeed in, in a lot of different forms. So for me, ocean was also a, a, a sense of, uh, uh, and it was also related to creation, to liberty, and also to solidarity. Because when you take a ship, you don't know exactly where you're going to go. Or at least you don't know all the storm you're going to have to pass, but what keep you uh, alive, what keep you safe, what 
give you the hope is like you're together in the same boat and you can have the spirit of uh, solidarity. That's what I like about like uh, ocean people, ocean like communities is this really the spirit, the strong feeling that together we can just like overcome all the biggest storm, all the biggest uh, wave. So I'm here not to, to share my life, uh, even if I, I could do it like uh, with great pleasure <laughs> with you guys, but I'm here because I have one conviction. First of all, that thanks to the the fight to protect the ocean, I think we can bring the entire humanity to have a positive message also uh, to to tackle all the big challenges, biodiversity, climate change, economic sovereignty, making sure that we do not leave uh, no one behind. And I have hope because over the last, let's say, 15 months, we and we together, we managed to get success that people thought was impossible and especially impossible in this time of really like complicated geopolitical moment. We managed to agree on a treaty protecting the high seas. And in March, the community, thanks to the UN, thanks to the United Nations, also uh, environment program, because they were also pushing uh, and giving data, giving like a, 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 um, a science saying that we need to protect the, the ICs. We managed to sign, well, at least to agree on this treaty. And now we're in the pace of the ratification, the signing and the ratification. And this treaty is doing something simple, the BBNG, biodiversity, beyond national jurisdiction. It will protect 70 it will protect 50% of the surface of the planet. It will protect 70% of the ocean. So when we talk about like protecting the environment, when we talk about protecting the planet, if you do not protect the ICs, there is no way we're going to manage to achieve uh, this objective. So this treaty is basically saying we create ICs, marinated protected areas. We need to have systematic environmental impact assessment when we start activities. And, and for me, this is something really important. We need to make it in, in the solid, with solidarity, with this just transition, saying like, if we discover something that, you know, ICs will, uh, I don't know, will make, um, make sure that we can solve, for example, um, Sorry, I uh, I just the word in, in English, uh, a medicine for for example something like a, in the high seas. Then we're gonna have to share it with the whole humanity. So saying that the ocean is a common good, is a common heritage of the humanity, and it's not the first come first served. So that's something really crucial. It, it was stuck in the, in the in the deep sea for 15 years, and thanks to the global communities, we managed to close this uh, agreement. And I'm really proud that uh, of the whole community, and thanks to the voice of uh, ambassador of people like you, really passionate, we managed to convince a lot of people that we will need this treaty to make sure that we achieve our climate uh, uh, objective. So now we're in the pace of making sure that there is a ratification and we need 60 countries by 2025. And I'm hopeful because now people realize that ocean is really important. And the second, uh, uh, element for me of optimism is uh, regarding the deep sea uh, mining. I don't know if you know these activities, but there is some countries, or let's say some company, who want to go above 4,000 meters and start deep sea mining because it will be useful uh, for the ecological transition. I don't believe so. Because we only know 3% of the deep sea. And if we only know 3% of the sea, there is a high chance that there is a species, there is like a, a part of this ecosystem that, that is really crucial for human life and for the entire uh, 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 planet life. So the battle we managed to win last year was not to start deep sea mining in 2023 at it was, uh, 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 how do you say it? At it was like um, anticipated. So we drew a coalition of country against the deep sea mining for a, a precautionary pause for uh, a moratorium. And we managed to make sure that we invest more in research, we invest more in knowledge, in science that's starting to do an activity that for me, for sure, will have irreversible damage on the ecosystem and it will harm Earth 
to protect the ocean, to protect the climate and protect uh, coastal community. So this was not something we thought would be possible two years or three years ago. And we managed to do it because we show people, we show leaders, and President Macron was the first one last year in the COP27 saying, I'm against deep sea mining. And we have the responsibility, France, because we have the second largest maritime space in the world. So if France is starting deep sea mining, it will have consequences on other countries. So we say we're not going to benefit from this money. We're not going to benefit from this activity, but we're going to protect it because if for the, the, the human, uh, uh, the entire uh, human species, and we want to, to do it. But I wanted to tell you something about why blue ecosystems are really important. You know better than I, and you all said it. But for us, it's really important because the blue ecosystem is the key and it's critical, uh, of course, because it's a carbon sink. And it's critical for food. If you do not protect the blue, the blue ecosystem, then you'll have less capacity of feeding the coastal community, of course, but feeding the entire world. It's critical uh, also because it will help us to mitigate uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, climate. So we need to make sure that we identify those kind of spots, we protect them, and we reward also the country protecting uh, this uh, coral life. There is no way or there is no solid argument saying that we should uh, uh, be uh, as generous uh, as uh, we should be generous with country uh, uh, not protecting this uh, carbon sink and not uh, uh, rewarding the one really protecting and this kind of uh, ecosystem. And the last one, the last element why um, uh, blue ecosystems are really uh, in important is that also, of course, because they are like a, a huge part of our biodiversity, uh, there can be a source for medicine, for pharmaceutical, for research, for science, and for scientific progress. So we need to protect them. And in this sense, France has a strong ambition uh, that we integrated in our national strategy for biodiversity that the prime minister just uh, presented two days ago. And we have just two big objectives, protect 100% of the coral reef and protect 100% of the Posidonia. And for us, it's one of the key uh, uh, element, key factor that would enable us, enable us to really do our part, first of all, but also show to the world that we, we can do it, we can do it quickly, and we can do it in a way that uh, we put science, we disseminate, of course, the, the different like research that we uh, gonna do, and we can do it in different places. Because as you know, France is a oceanic, uh, a nation. We have territories in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, in the Indian Ocean, in the Mediterranean. So the ISD with this uh, protection of 100% of our coral reef, 100% of the position is to show that even if there is a different like a geographical uh, context, even if there is a diff uh, uh, different like uh, 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 areas, we can have the same ambition. And doing so, we will continue growing our objective of protecting 30% of our ocean and uh, 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 water space and having 10% of our ocean under really highly protected uh, management. So that's our ambition. And and I'm gonna finish by this. Uh, uh, of course, there there is no real ambition if there is no financing. So that is why we're gonna continue investing, especially on the protection of the mangrove and the coral reef with more than 50 millions to do that. We're going to do through our development aid and our cooperation financing, mobilizing more than 900 million euros for uh, ocean related project and, and, and cooperation. And we're going to continue doing so with the objective of the United Nations Ocean Conference. And I would just want to, to conclude with uh, the United Nations Ocean Conference. For us, and I, uh, I'm pretty sure for you also, it will be a key moment, a key moment to make sure that we conclude a lot of multilateral international process. The first one is, of course, to make sure that we ratify BBNG and preserve the marine biodiversity. And also with a strong element of protecting the whales, the sea turtles, that's my favorite like, animal. So I was really happy when I heard like uh, Suzanne Gardner talking about sea turtles. But we need to make sure that we also, we, we protect 
all the species that really are threatened by human activities and also by sometimes fisheries. So the first objective of this COP is making sure that we ratify the BBNJ. The second one is to make sure that we do not start deep sea mining. So we're going to continue to fight uh, against it and grow this coalition. So in all of your country, make sure by 2025, representative, you elected people, they come in Paris with the will of not starting deep sea mining. And um, you have my team here at your disposal for all the different data and all the different like uh, uh, elements. But uh, it will, for me, it's the, the, the battle of the century. If we start deep sea mining, then we'll not be able to do what we want to do in other uh, aspects of the, the climate change and climate biodiversity. The third objective of this uh, half of COP is to fight against illegal fishing and, uh, and making sure we put in place sustainable uh, fisheries across uh, the world. And doing so, we will protect especially emerging developing countries uh, and making sure that there is no one country taking most of the fish in the world. So we need to have cooperation to protect also the food of the future generation. The fourth uh, uh, element for us really important is, of course, to make sure, and the United Nations Environment Program is a key element of this, is to make sure that we manage to conclude the international treaty for, against plastic pollution. And that's a key element for us. And, and that's something I know in countries such as is India is really something uh, uh, that you want to move forward, but we need to make sure that we conclude uh, this treaty by 2025. And the last one, and I will stop by this, uh, it's to, to, to accelerate the decarbonization of the maritime economy, because you know that maritime transport is 3% of the global emission. So we need to make sure that we continue trading, of course, we continue exchanging, but by having new technologies, by having alternative uh, 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 fuel, maritime fuel, and making sure that uh, this sector is also taking uh, its part. I was way too long. I'm sorry because when I talk about like ocean, like uh, I can go uh, as deep as the yeah. <laughs> but I, I really wanted to to say thank you for the work uh, you're doing. I know that sometimes like people working on ocean feel a little bit like uh, isolated, but lonely in those big like conference, like uh, talking about the 1.5, talking about like, uh, you know, fossil fuel, talking about like uh, uh, also the subsidies on, on petrol. But trust me, for President Macron, for France, we're conscious that we can't win those big battle without taking into account the ocean. And there is no way that in terms of uh, food sovereignty, in protection of the biodiversity, in the fight against climate change, that will manage to 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 achieve our objective and protect our citizen without protecting the ocean. So let's continue the fight together. Let's sail toward the United Nations Ocean Conference in Nice. Thank you very much. Et vive l'océan. to be there. Thank you all. Thank you for a wonderful session. Uh, we're going to do a quick photo at the top front and uh, um, the next session will be starting shortly. Thank you.
Clark, please. Oh, I have sound. So colleagues, I really would like to start the Good morning, everyone. We're getting, we're getting somewhere. Perhaps we could be, it's, okay, better? Until someone at a different height stands here. Good morning, everyone. We're going to move from thinking about oceans to thinking about monitoring progress in addressing drought risk and impacts. The role of ecosystem-based approaches and that little subtitle is the reason we're sitting here on Blue Ecosystems Day. So those blue ecosystems are incredibly important in helping us to address the risks of drought. I'm your moderator. My name is Valerie Kepos. I'm, prin I'm principal specialist in nature-based solutions at the UN Environment Programme World Conservation Monitoring Centre. And I will be taking you through a series of opening remarks and um, essentially keynote talk to get us all thinking about this. And then we have a great panel coming to let me, oh, and we have a, a further presentation. And then we have a little bit of a panel discussion where I hope we will also be able to take some questions from the audience. So I have some questions for our panelists, but I hope you will all be thinking about yours too. And to start us off, I'd like to welcome Dr. Leticia Carvalho, who's the head of the Freshwater and Marine and Freshwater Branch of the UN Environment Programme, and she's going to give us some opening remarks. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to join now in a different role from the previous panel. But indeed, it seems this is, fits a lot into the Blue Ecosystems Day because the presence and the absence of the water is actually what defines our life in this planet. So this makes full sense in the day. And I would like to say good morning, excellencies, partners, colleagues, and friends. I would like to acknowledge that we have a big audience as well, uh, virtually uh, connected to us. So here we stand once again at a critical COP and facing the formidable challenge of climate change, a pivotal moment demanding a shift of our traje trajectory. So we all know that the impact of the climate change is evident in the scaling, the, the frequency, the intensity, uh, the duration of the droughts across the globe, as well as the inverse of the droughts, that the catas catastrophic flooding. So I would like to give some examples uh, of where we are. Maybe they are speaking loud and volumes in the media, but we always remember the sub-Saharan uh, sub uh, Africa faces projections of temperature increases surpassing the global mean. If we go and travel to the Horn of Africa, where million people, a million people have already been displaced, and I'm talking about 15 million children are out of school, and 8.9 million livestock have, have been lost during the droughts uh, over the past years. And then, of course, the flip side of the same problem. 2022 floods in Pakistan submerged one third of the country and affecting or living without home or food 33 million people, damaging completely the water system uh, in place. 
I also would like to remember uh, recently in the Southern Sudan, we have heavy seasonal rains caused the, uh, the Nile River to rise to nearly uh, 17.5 meters. Uh, and this is creating a semi-permanent permanent flooding uh, affecting completely the livelihoods of the people uh, around and across the margins of the river. So it's just imperative that we fortify our social and ecological foundations to extend the rentless onslaught of climate change, specifically the increasing severity and consequences of drought. That's, we, that's why we are going to deep dive into this nowadays. But let me remind you, as I was telling in the beginning, Ecosystems, especially the freshwater ecosystems, including the groundwater and ecosystems, uh, they are not so visible, but they are as equally important as what we see at the surface. They provide critical services for addressing drought and other climate change impacts, yet they are vulnerable and we don't, just don't see how vulnerable they are. Ecosystem-based approaches uh, are powerful tool, conserving natural vegetative cover, uh, for example, helps, helps to ensure the water filtrates uh, and is able to recharge rivers, aquifers. So maybe we don't understand all of this cycle and it's not so visible, but it is a cycle. It is continued and we need to take care of every single step and pathway of this journey of the waters in this world, salty and fresh. Before we kick off the day, uh, let me just remind of two additional crucial points that I would like to leave you with. Firstly, we cannot afford to continue dredging our ecosystem's capacities to retain the water that is essential for withstanding the deepening effects of the drops. This is key message uh, for today. Secondly, our actions need to be supported by evidence. We cannot really act in the vacuum. That's why we need to have all hands on deck especially the experts, the intelligence, the ones that are collecting data. And I can mention here, we have representatives of UNEP collaborating centers, WCMC, UNEP DHI. And it's really important that these entities are really here uh, to support, to provide the scientific evidence that will inform policy and then action. We must enhance the monitoring of freshwater conditions and other pivotal social and ecological elements in, region, in regions facing water scarcity. And again, always remember remembering that scarcity and excess are really two sides of the same coin. So I really hope that the experiences that we are going to share today and the panelists that were coming before me uh, will inspire conversations and more important, will influence decisions in this crucial moment in, at COP28. Really appreciate it for the opportunity. And Look to see you in the course of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leticia, for that really nicely rounded um, kickoff for our discussions. Um, I'd now like to introduce Charlotte Hicks, who's a senior technical officer at the UN Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center, um, who will give us a bit of a keynote presentation to really introduce the topic more thoroughly. Um, then where we'd like, hope the discussions will go today. If I, if we, okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you to Val for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Charlotte Hicks, a Senior Technical Officer at UNEP WCMC, and it's great to be here today talking to you um, and providing this overview of drought risks, ecosystem-based approaches and where we are in terms of measuring progress. I'd also like to acknowledge one of my colleagues, Caroline King Okumu, who may have been in touch with you, but uh, she was unable to join us uh, at, at COP today. So we had some examples from Leticia of the types of drought risks and impacts that we are thinking about today. So climate change interacts with an increasing demand for water. And we know that the frequency and intensity of droughts uh, is increasing. And with that, we have an increase in their costs to society and to the environment. Drought sensitive agricultural activities are the main source of income for some 1.3 billion people around the world. 
Uh, and at the same time, uh, ecosystems in drought affected areas are also increasingly vulnerable and increasingly under threat, not only from climate change, but from human activities and other drivers as well. Failure to address this pattern uh, of avoidable drought risks places around 700 million people at risk of displacement by 2030. That's according to the UNDRR's recent special report on drought. Uh, this will be, the failure to address these risks will perpetuate inequalities uh, and it continues to situate drought in this really complex picture of risks and trends that are all interacting. Global threats in terms of agriculture, economies, the environment and for communities. So how we manage land and water are very closely interlinked, and these affect our social and ecological resilience to drought and to other disasters. When we have healthy land and healthy soils, um, we are able to improve the benefits we receive from these ecosystems in terms of increased water storage capacity, increased infiltration of water, and improved water quality. And these are all really important hydrological services in the context of addressing drought and the impacts of climate change. Changes in land use, including the conversion of natural ecosystems, so wetlands, peatlands, forests, and grasslands, can disrupt this hydrological cycle and put the provision of these ecosystem services at risk. It's because of this that the role of healthy freshwater ecosystems is vital for sustainable development. And this is well recognized in various international frameworks and agreements. Uh, we can highlight three examples here. So from the UNCCD, uh, which recognizes that wetland ecosystems are vital to achieving the land degradation neutrality targets. We also have the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, and Tristan is here today to tell us more about this one as well. Uh, and we can see that wetlands will be key to achieving the targets under the new Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, with wetlands home to around 40% of all plant and animal species that live and breed in wetlands. Um, we also have the UNFCCC, uh, where the restoration and conservation of wetlands uh, will be playing a critical role in our ability to mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change. For this reason, as Letitia also emphasized, it is really critical that we are able to safeguard these ecosystems uh, and to put in place policies and actions that can protect and restore them rather than continuing to degrade them. Ecosystem-based approaches are one such strategy uh, you can see the definition from the CBD here, um, a strategy for the integrated management of land, water, and living resources that promotes conservation and sustainable use. We also have the UNCCD's decision in uh, 2022, which invites parties to look for these synergies and complementarities across different multilateral environmental agreements by using things such as sustainable land management, ecosystem-based approaches and nature-based solutions. Um, we can also think about what this looks like in practice. And we have the example of the Freshwater Challenge. So this is a country-led initiative that aims to accelerate the restoration of 300,000 kilometers of degraded rivers and around 350 million hectares of degraded wetlands by 2030. And why countries would be doing this well, to achieve these multiple benefits and to address the commitments coming out of uh, their commitments on climate change, biodiversity, restoration, um, land degradation, disaster risk reduction, and of course the SDGs. So setting targets for policy and action and being able to clearly measure and demonstrate progress is an integral part of this challenge of addressing the risks posed by drought and climate change. Uh, global frameworks and systems are increasingly in place and countries are increasingly tracking and reporting on the condition of their ecosystems, their capacity to provide critical ecosystem services, the effects of drought, uh, as well as the resilience of their populations and communities. 
So we have a couple of examples here under the UNCCD and the CBD. Um, I'll just highlight, for example, the relevant strategic objectives under the UNCCD. So you have there to uh, improve the condition of affected ecosystems, linking back to the CBD as well, uh, and to mitigate, adapt to, and manage the effects of drought, uh, so as to enhance the resilience of vulnerable populations and ecosystems. I won't go into a lot of detail here, um, but just wanted to also highlight that countries are also putting in place these targets and developing policies that include restoration and conservation of hydrological ecosystem services. So this slide shows a breakdown of water-related approaches that have been set out um, in around 77 um, country reports on land degradation neutrality and national drought plans. Uh, and you can see the majority of them recognize the interconnectedness of land, water security, and drought. So on top of these international and national frameworks and processes for monitoring, uh, there's also a growing body of guidance and support available, um, such as the resource on the screen here um, from the UNCCD, which tries to break down the strategic objectives under the UNCCD, uh, and help countries in their reporting. We also have um, methodologies and data sources being identified and detailed in terms of reporting for the uh, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And increasingly, we have technological platforms um, and more readily accessible data that are supporting these monitoring efforts. So we will hear more from Google, um, the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, and from the CBD today. Um, but we could also highlight some of these platforms, including the UN Biodiversity Lab, uh, which has hundreds of, of data layers covering biodiversity, ecosystems, natural resources, and so on. There's also the World Environment Situation Room being developed by UNEP. Uh, there's DHI's Global Hydrological Model and many, many more. So where do we need to go to next in terms of actions that can help us to reduce the impacts of drought and conserve freshwater ecosystems and strengthen monitoring? Uh, I'd just like to conclude with a few suggestions and key messages here, um, noting that we do need to progressively improve the planning, implementation, and learning uh, at national and local levels. We also need to uh, compile, document, disseminate uh, global good practice guidance. Uh, and that includes for the policies and actions that can protect and conserve and restore ecosystems, but also for monitoring. And we should be taking advantage of the global platforms and partnerships that are already in place and building these links across these different processes and the, the multilateral environmental agreements. Um, we also need to continue to push for this continuous interaction and exchange of data on what is happening on the ground in terms of drought risks uh, and freshwater ecosystems across different scales. So from the local to the national, regional and up to the global level. So I'm going to conclude this overview and uh, thanks everyone for your attention. I hope you enjoy the panel discussion today. Thank you, Charlotte. That, that gives us a good sense of where we're going and how these issues fit together. Before we move in, into the panel discussion, I'd like to invite uh, Bridget hoyer Grasselink from Google to actually tell us something about Global Wetlands Watch. Bridget is the Director of AI and Sustainability for Google, and she's thinking very much all the time about how data and new ways of using it can help to advance on social agendas. And so over to you, Bridget. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thanks to all the organizers here today for having me. Um, I'm Bridget hoyer Gosling, and I'm at Google.org, which is Google's philanthropic arm. And my work there is really focused on how we can be leveraging technology and data to address pressing global challenges. And of course, climate change is, is top amongst those for us. 
Um, and I'm excited to share a little bit more today about how Google and uh, and the work of our partners is really advancing uh, the work that's needed right now to support monitoring and reporting on freshwater ecosystems and, and of course, drought risks. Um, this is how I point to this thing. Is it on? Is it on? It's. I think it's on. It says on. There we go. Perfect. Um, as a as a major company it's, who is also a user of water, it is of course critical that we are first attentive to our own water use. And we know that we need to be importantly right now stewarding our water resources at this critical moment. And so at Google, we actually aim to replenish more water than we consume uh, and help to improve the water quality and ecosystem health in the communities where we live and work. We've actually now set a target of replenishing 120% of the freshwater volume that we consume on average by 2030 something that we're uh, working hard toward and need to continue to make progress on, but I think will hopefully be a, a step in the right direction for us and also setting the, the bar for other companies who are water users as well. And while it's of course critical that we continue to monitor and manage the environmental impacts of our own operations uh, and our value chain, we also as a technology and innovation company know that we can do more. We can do more by helping to lead the transition to a more sustainable future and supporting organizations who are really enabling new solutions. Uh, and we are right now, as might not be a surprise to you, really excited about AI. We're excited about the ways that AI can be accelerating solutions to tackle climate change, really by helping us better understand our planet, by providing timely insights, by helping a scenario plan, and by doing that in more real time and on a global scale than we've ever been able to do before. We know that decision makers are doing critical work right now to set out the frameworks that Charlotte talked about, the collective commitments that have been made through CBD and other, other global moments and at the same time, we know that people are lacking the information and insights at granular level, at national levels to drive that action. We've seen platforms like the ones that, that um, Charlotte mentioned, of course, but we need to have even more of an understanding at a greater capacity than we have uh, today. We also know that you know, we can't do any of this alone. So Google.org provides support and resources to organizations who are closest to these problems and challenges and to importantly own the context and space to be able to implement the solutions. Insights are great, but they don't drive action on their own. We have to be able to embed those insights alongside experts who are able to take those all the way through to actually see the change on the ground. And so at google.org, we support organizations who really have bold ideas to or using AI to drive climate action. Um, and recently we've done a number of global calls actually for ideas that could uh, we could support with our funding and with our technical expertise to uh, enable more of this type of work in the world. Um, we're seeing already some great examples of that, and so I'll run through a couple of those today. Um, one is a longtime partnership that we've had with UNEP, actually, uh, and alongside the European Commission's Joint Research Center and DHI uh, to develop the Freshwater Ecosystem Explorer. So when the SDGs were launched, uh, there was an ask for UNEP to have all member states provide indicator data for 6.6.1, uh, the, the freshwater related uh, uh, SDG. And at the time, that was not the case that the majority of countries could actually report on that data. And using tools like Google Earth Engine, which provides scientific data across, uh, across the globe, we've been able to help close that data gap together with our partners uh, and be able to provide sources for accounting of freshwater resources and importantly, how they're changing over time. So it's not enough for obviously just to do a one-time inventory on any of this, but to help really understand in more real time. This is a free and available open source that uh, allows us to provide national, subnational, and basin level data on freshwater ecosystems, and obviously also help us to understand how we can respond to water scarcity. Um, we are also seeing some really interesting ways that AI can actually be potentially working on water use as well. So here uh, in the Middle East, we know that this is one of the most water scarce, scarce regions in the world uh, and, and rapidly changing and, and potentially worsening. And so we've actually recently um, partnered with the International Water Management Institute, providing them a $1 million grant to create an AI-powered platform that will help to assess the potential for recovering local lost wastewater and reusing it for agriculture, for industry, and for the environment. Agriculture, of course, one of the main, main uh, uses of water within the region. And so factoring in data like distance of treatment plants, the actual quality of the effluent that's coming out, and then specific water requirements, the tool will provide new insights and models that will help to hopefully inform decision makers in their ability to increase the use of reclaimed water, which recently the, the Gulf states have, um, have made a deep commitment to. 
And then finally, I'm very excited today to announce that we've also um, providing are providing $2 million in support through some of those global challenges that I mentioned to a partnership with DHI and UNAP uh, for Global Wetlands Watch. Charlotte talked about already the importance of wetlands, the commitments that have been made to trying to protect and restore these ecosystems. They do so much good for our planet. And we know that they're uh, critical and people are relying on the services provided. They also act as a sponge, right? They're absorbing and able to provide an opportunity for us to actually think about ways to reduce carbon, but also reduce flooding and, and critical tool and adaptation. And of course, releasing water over dry spells if we think about droughts and the changing climate um, patterns that we're in. So with UNEP as a, as a key partner, the Global Wetlands Watch will be using AI, satellite imagery, sensors and other data, temperature data, data to monitor global wetlands and provide near real-time wetland data and analysis. This will be a new first of its kind tool that's able to look at this critical ecosystem and provide us with new data and information. It's gonna start with just uh, kind of five key countries who are, uh, who are gonna help to inform the design and ultimately give us a global inventory uh, in high resolution that will hopefully inform a lot of the commitments that are being made and importantly allow us to monitor some of that real-time change and continue to drive action and decision making. This is a new effort uh, and so like any globally relevant collaborative uh, is going to need engagement from a range of stakeholders, so policymakers, funders, NGOs, uh, and so that official launch will be in early 2024. I just forgot what year it was for a second. Um, and, um, and so stay tuned for that, but also reach out if you are uh, working in this space or relevant to, to those partners who I mentioned. And I'm hopeful that obviously we'll be able to see some really incredible work coming out of this and even just the coming year. Um, when we think about the critical need to protect our ecosystems right now and our water resources, we know that we need to bring the best of our tools to bear. And I built a deep believer from our position at Google that we think that technology innovation can be one piece of that puzzle. So really grateful to our partners who are, uh, who are embracing that and helping to bring that hope for reality to life. And um, hopefully it will give us a chance to all make collective progress together more quickly. Thank you so much. Back to you, Valerie. If I could invite our other two panelists up. Um, We'll get them mic'd up, and while they're being wired up and therefore can't defend themselves, I'll introduce them. Um, I've already introduced Bridget, and you've heard from her, and we'll hear more from her in a minute. Um, next on from Bridget, sitting in the middle, is Tristan Tyrell, Tyrell who works with, with the CBD, with the Secretary to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and has been working in this multilateral environment agreement space for quite some time um, and has lots of thoughts about how these issues fit together. And finally, um, someone we're really pleased to have who has experience more at the national level and therefore nicely com complements this rather global perspective on the panel is Dr. Senaka Basnayake. I hope I've said that right. Um, who comes? Who is the director of climate Re of the climate resilience department at the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center (ATBC), and he's a researcher. He spends a lot of time um, thinking about climate risk and working with both empirical data and model data to um, to understand climate variability, climate change, and what we're seeing in the way of extreme events, including droughts. So I'm really pleased to welcome all three of our panelists. And if I can, and I think he knows this is coming, I'm going to start with Dr. Sanaka. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit briefly um, what challenges in the Asia Pacific region, um, what the Asia Pacific region is facing in terms of drought and other climate change impacts, and a little bit about your thoughts about the roles that the role that freshwater ecosystems can play in addressing some of those risks. It works. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting us uh, for this, you know, uh, to be a panelist in this uh, panel. Um, as I'm coming from a disaster management organization or even a climate resilience building organizations, I would like to start uh, my uh, intervention uh, through uh, some of the statistics of the data. Uh, as we all know that, you know, as per the SCAP, UNSCAP report last year, 
um, they we faced or experienced uh, 140 uh, disasters, uh, 7,500 deaths, and uh, 64 million people impacted, and then of course, like you know, 57 uh, million dollars uh, economic losses. So it's a kind of like year itself. It is huge. And we will be expecting more and more this year because we have been experiencing in summertime so a lot of like you know the extremes or the disaster events. So this is the global situation. Uh, it's, we also know that you now we are now currently in 1.1 to 1.2 uh, the global warming uh, world uh, centigrade compared to uh, industrial era. So it's going to be like you know as we were trying to sort of uh, control the temperature. And we have set some limit like 1.5 degree we were talking about. So it may be like crossing it maybe in 10 years or two decades to come. So we are like really in a difficult situation where like we'll be experiencing more and more drought. So the reason I'm mentioning like, you know, I'm trying to connect uh, these statistics to the real thing. So we'll be experiencing more and more events, the flood events as well as drought events. Um, and then we, we need to be very much mindful. And then global call for this, you know, early warning fall is a kind, I, I would say that is the right time. So we are getting more and more sort of like, you know, uh, energy or the momentum uh, to work together regionally, globally, as well as in country uh, to sort of like, you know, put together all efforts to address this issue. So, um, so regarding the challenges, uh, in particular the, to this, you know, the drought um, uh, situation, uh, what we have seen actually, the El Nino, of course, um, um is i mean this year also we are like you know experiencing and then some of the ex countries already experienced in this particular region asia uh of course asia and the pacific so the indonesia uh australia so we'll we'll have more impacts but this year so as probably you know that uh indian ocean dipole is also in the same time so it's happening like you know it brings more rainfall to the indian sub especially the south asian region so it's a kind of like combined effect we have seen but a lot more to come so regarding the challenges that we have been uh, experiencing like you know not having science and evidence-based information uh, you know with us so it's a kind of, uh, when it comes to forecast and monitoring, flood, what you got the drought monitoring and forecasting, it is really challenging because you need to have that information uh, sort of like uh, season to sub season, seasonal scale or even seasonal scale in order for the countries or the people to make some adjustments. So the other challenge that we have seen, like, you know, not having proper policy and governance setups. So we have been talking like internationally or the globally, for example, drought uh, risk management or drought risk or mitigation uh, strategies. But when it comes to countries, uh, it is probably not there. So some policies are there, but the policies need to be implemented uh, in order to do that. So reach what you call the within the countries, uh, some sort of like, you know, mechanism, inter-institutional coordination should be there. It is not happening. So it is good that the global what is the frameworks uh, are now there and there's a pressure push uh, from the governments to think through it and to work with the, uh, the other organization. I know that UNCCD, the focal points, mostly the Ministry of Environment, whereas the Department of Meteorology, Hydrology, National Hydrometric Services are not under that sort of like, you know, uh, the ministry, as well as the disaster management organization is under another ministry. So it's a kind of like, you know, uh, coordination is needed. Now it's a good way, like it's good things like, you know, because of this, you know, global, as I was mentioning, agenda. So there's a lot of pressure for the countries to think through and, you know, work together. So um, uh, then of course, the financial support from the governments, National, national budgets in particular, because you know, countries like LDDs or even uh, developing nations, they may not be having like, you know, proper sort of uh, planning, the financial uh, planning for each and every year allocating because, you know, because of the forecast, because they are also not so sure about whether this year is going to be sort of like, you know, uh, El Nino event or the dry event or the drought event. So it's a kind of another challenge that I want to uh, emphasize here. Uh, we have been talking about unlocking financing for climate action. So this is also important. I stop here. Um, and then I don't know, maybe I have addressed all the uh, things because uh, maybe maybe the next round probably I can talk about more about the role of ecosystem services. Okay, uh, I think I, let, yeah. let's, let's move thank on you. and we'll come back to ecosystems yeah, thank you. indeed. Hmm? Okay. Tired of looking at me, huh? Okay. Okay. I sit, is this going to work? Okay. I can sit there. Okay, that's fine. There are, uh, you still have to look at me. All right. Um, if I could then move on to Bridget, and we'll come to Tristan at the end. Um, Bridget, I wondered if you wanted to build 
possibly on some of the things we've heard from Dr. Snaka, to think about what we need to do to strengthen monitoring and evaluation of impacts and progress in addressing those impacts and, and you know, thinking about whether it's about platforms or whether it's about something else. Yeah, so I, I won't um, talking about yeah. So obviously, I think that, as I said in in the prior remarks, there's a role that are that sort of technical platforms can play. And I think it's critical, right? We have to have that kind of data and information. And ideally, we need to have it in a consolidated place, right? You spoke about kind of the need for policy and, and interconnection across policies and, and collaboration there. But also when we are able to pool the, the data that we have together at a global scale, that provides us with a picture that we wouldn't otherwise have. It also allows for regional engagement right none of these these systems are obviously uh ones that abide by the country borders that we've drawn out or the subnational borders they allow us to see the picture in a in a, a broader way and i think that's one critical piece to make these systems work we also have to have that data and engagement from from government and from from policymakers and some of that means actually sharing and putting data out that might not otherwise be currently a part of those systems so marrying up what we're able to see from satellite imagery, what we're able to model using artificial intelligence with actual ground truth data is, is the critical piece of getting this right and actually getting that kind of trust uh, built into these systems as well, right? People don't necessarily believe always what you see just, you know, in the, in the, um, in the data maybe from a satellite, but we need to sort of make sure that that's ground truth. And that means marrying up with governments and what they're seeing with local communities, actually bringing those who live close to these environments and ecosystems into that mix so that they can feel kind of a co-ownership approach here. So it's kind of, I think that full end-to-end -end change, right? Technology and will give us new tools and platforms that we need to see both that full uh, investment through the life cycle to be able to drive to impact, as I mentioned earlier, but also investing in that process throughout so that we're able to bring kind of the full picture that we have across government systems, um, you know, UN and NGO systems, as well as what we can kind of bring with the technology to bear. Thank you, Bridget. That was excellent. Um, Justin, where do you see opportunities? We've we've heard quite a lot about global agreements and governments and processes. Where are the opportunities to create synergies and efficiencies across the different Rio conventions in relation to these issues of, of droughts and, and freshwater ecosystems? Thanks, Val. So, yeah, great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Sorry. me. Sorry. Um, yeah, so some of the challenges, I think, in terms of what we're hearing now is is the various synergies at all levels. So it's at the convention level, the sort of the global level, agencies working together, bringing on board other partners, not just relying on, certainly from within the UN uh, sphere of, of particular sort of more traditional data sets, but bringing in some of the new ones, and then coming down to some of the issues that you were talking about, about just where the government agencies are recognizing each other, talking to each other. Um, I think there's there's a couple of um, potential opportunities there. Certainly at the at the secretariat level, there is this expectation for the secretariats of the CBD, UNFCCC and, and CCD to work together. There's the joint liaison group that's supposed to bring them together. Um, and there are a number of, of working groups under that. I would say that water is not one of the priority areas, though. And I think that's something that maybe uh, factors into some of the, the lack of synergies and the lack of efficiencies that that, that exist. Um, I've heard others say that climate change impacts are a water issue. It's either too much or too little. Um, certainly from a biodiversity perspective, Charlotte, you mentioned the fact that 40% of species are, are directly dependent on, on wetlands. As humans, obviously, we need water. You, you mentioned your presentation about this particular region and, and uh, uh, scarcity. Um, and so there's this, there's this need, this recognition that has to be made of the importance of, of water for all three of the conventions and the, and the, the various goals and, and objectives that, that each of them are trying to, trying to achieve. Part of that issue is data and understanding and recognition. And so um, within the GBF, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, sorry, I need to stop using acronyms. Um, but uh, the recognition of, of water, of route is there 
kind of in within the framework. Disasters certainly uh, related to climate change, and then Target Eleven, which is uh, nature's contributions to people, ecosystem services. Essentially, it's it's a bit of a catch-all for everything. Otherwise, water is in there is more on the spatial in terms of protected areas and restoration. Um, but if you look at the monitoring framework that was adopted with it, there's a supposed a, a scarcity paucity and a scarcity and a paucity of of uh, agreed uh, um, indicators relating to both freshwater and disasters um, and it's a negotiated process so governments have to feel comfortable with the with the indicators that they're adopting but the headline indicators the key indicators that are supposed to be used by all governments and then for global reporting there aren't any specific indicators relating to either freshwater or disasters. They're in other columns, a sort of complementary, uh, sort of voluntary ones. But some of the issues behind that is just recognition of the availability of data and trust in that data. Where's the data coming from? Has it been ground truth, et cetera? And whether the methodologies for the indicator development itself are, are in place. Um, so there's a need for, for agencies to recognize the importance of the issue, to recognize who is working on what and, and, and then coming together and then understanding what data are out there in order to bring this forward. Thanks. That was fantastic. I'm not sure we need concluding remarks at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think I would like to ask each of the panelists whether, if they have a few more things they'd like to say, um, by way of wrapping up the session, we've heard something really interesting about the challenges We've heard something really interesting about coordination and, and, and the challenges of coordination, both at global level and at national level. And that's um, something that clearly we need to be working on. Um, and we've heard about the, the need to be sure that we actually understand what all those big data are telling us from the perspective of the people on the ground who are suffering the impacts and the scientists who actually know what it means on the ground. So we've, we've got some, some nice themes running here, um, but I'd like to give each of you a chance to say anything final you have you have in mind, I think. Um, starting with you, Dr. Sanaka, you said you wanted to say something about ecosystems. <laughs> Please say something think, about ecosystems. I do ecosystems. They're pretty much covered, but anyway, so I, I, I'll highlight the point that, you know, when it comes to sort of like, you know, the actions uh, uh, in order for us to address this issue. So uh, I would like to um, highlight the fact that maybe the monitoring and forecasting of drought in particular, so that should be uh, strengthened because there are so many tools developed out there. So uh, like, you know, but the thing is like, you know, customization of these, those tools into specific countries and local context is needed for which data is needed. Data should come from the respective countries in order to validate and calibrate the models uh, uh, to that. So. And then, of course, uh, um, it is probably mandated. With, it, it should be with the mandated organizations. So, and then collaboration and coordination among other organizations is also important. The one, the final thing that I want to highlight, like, so it should be, we should have local-led programs, adaptations. Because, you know, like, you know, even if you have good tools, uh, even if you have good systems, the early warning systems, so at the end of the day, so maybe the people who are really facing the issues when it, let's, let's, when it comes to farmers, so we should educate them, we should uh, educate how to use those, you know, information which we are providing, like, you know, which uh, provided by the government or subnational governments. So it's a kind of like, you know, maybe to have sort of local-led programs uh, to have maybe bottom-up approach for in particular the adaptation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Even more thoughts about how we connect from the bottom to the top and back down again. Very interesting. Bridget, your last thoughts? Any? I, I think I'll just pick up I'll just pick up on the point around trust and sort of how do we how do we bridge the gap that I think sometimes exists between these um the the kind of you know government process, the official processes, and the new tools that are coming online. And I think that in this moment where urgency is obviously paramount, there's an opportunity for us to be thinking about actually working on that that gap and making sure I think some of it, you know, as you said, right, comes from local understanding and making sure that we have an opportunity to really invest with governments uh, who often are under-resourced in this data capacity as well, right? Most don't actually have data capacity on their own uh, in their own organizations. And so it's hard to necessarily interface. And so it's an area where that we're thinking about actually, and I think where further investment and, and attention can help us get the most out of what we're going to be able to see from especially new advancements in AI 
to actually get to that impact and and build trust in the in the process such that we could also see these tools being valuable for some of the global conventions and um, and frameworks and and commitments that are being made because at the end of the day we can't just all be you know putting data out into the void and hoping that someone will will use it and change things we actually need to make sure that all steps of that process are invested in excellent thank you and a really interesting and important point about tailoring what we have to the need we have tristan thanks um yeah thanks uh so uh, just a couple of thoughts nature-based solutions and or ecosystem-based approaches which is the language that's been used in the global biodiversity framework but it's terminology that's also been picked up under UNFCCC and UNCCD as well as elsewhere. And it's about uh, trying to translate the concerns into something that policymakers will actually take action on. Um, now, whether people want to use nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches, or maybe be a bit more specific about, about water issues uh, themselves, um, whatever works in, the particular, in, in that particular context. But the fact uh, that, these terms like nature-based solutions are being picked up uh, and ecosystem-based approaches are being picked up across the various different fora is very important, certainly when just relating to your question about synergies and, and efficiencies. Um, and the other thing about this local to global, um, absolutely couldn't agree, couldn't agree more. Uh, the GBF is, is the Global Biodiversity Framework, mm -hmm. is whole of government, whole of society. At least that's the way it's supposed to be, but it's recognizing the role of all the different actors at all the different scales uh, within that is is essential, and that comes from the private sector and sort of philanthropic level, local communities, and how they communicate up through that government system, however it's it's set up. But it it ultimately comes down to a need to have the data in order to show that this is a concern, um, and to be able to translate that into actual policy action, policies and action. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all the panelists. It's been a really interesting discussion that helps us think about the connections between science, policy and action and how important all three of those pieces are if we're going to get through this and help other people and help people get through it. And that we actually need nature to help us all get through it. So thank you very much to the panelists. Please, can I ask you to thank them? And thank you. Thank you.
No, no, I just don't use the race name like, you know, the prime race name. French name. Yes, but I use Linux ones. I know. But this one has sound issues, so I use Linux to so solve the sound issues. Uh, some kind of static thing, but Samuel just don't have a place to name it to use his own thing. Please uh, turn on the camera uh, and uh, talk to us a bit, if you can hear us. Oh, great. Can you hear it? Hold on a minute. We need to check one more thing with you. Uh, hold on a minute. Yeah, this one should be. Please count to 10. Hold on a minute. Let's let's check again, please. Uh, count to ten, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There. Yes. Great. Uh, then it is all sorted. Please stay online with us. Uh, don't leave the camera. Uh, don't leave the. But if you want to leave the place, uh, please turn don't turn off the camera so we can see that you're uh, active. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I do. Thanks. For now, you can keep the mic muted uh, and turn it on when you feel ready to talk. Thank you very much. We're going to start in five, uh, uh, in six minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming to see, uh, to participate in this side event, Unlocking Sustainable Investment in Nature-Based Solutions for Climate Action. Uh, we really welcome you and uh, welcome your participation. The uh, format of the session is we have an op some opening words, then we have three presentations, um, and then a Q&A. Uh, and we hope that will take 45 minutes. And so let us begin. Thank you. So the emissions gap report in 2023 tells us that greenhouse gas emissions have reached a new high in 2023. And that 2023 is likely to be the warmest on record. The production gap report shows us that the world is planning 110% more fossil fuels in 2030 than is consistent with a 1.5 degree uh, pathway. And the carbon budget for a 1.5 degree world would be wiped out by these plans. At the same time, the adaptation gap report shows us that the gap is widening, the gap between finance needs and uh, adaptation finance for developing countries. It also tells us that adaptation needs in the developing world are set to increase to $387 billion by 2030. And so we have the challenge clearly set out in front of us. Um, and this session today is really about setting out the business case for nature-based solutions to, um, to, 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 be, to, to be an investment uh, approach uh, regarding the adaptation finance gap and the extent to which uh, we could accelerate uh, adaptation efforts through nature-based approaches. Uh, the Adaptation Gap Report has many, much information, but one of them uh, is around the cost benefit of, a, of investing in nature-based approaches. For example, every billion invested in adaptation against coastal flooding leads to 14 billion reduction in economic damages. 16 billion per year invested in agriculture would prevent approximately 78 million people starving um, or chronic hunger because of climate change impacts. And so with that, let me introduce our, uh, our speaker for, for the opening words. Ms. Madeleine Diofsa is the head of the Climate Change Division in Senegal's Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development. She has 20 years of experience in the UN climate change negotiations, including as a member of the consultative group of experts on national communications, the LDC expert group, and the adaptation committee. Beyond that, she has years of experience managing and coordinating climate change projects and programs in Senegal. Ms. Saar serves as Senegal's national technical coordinator, on climate change, providing oversight on country projects under the Green Climate Fund and leading the process for the development of Senegal's nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. Ms. Saar is the first woman to chair the LDC group since it began negotiating as a bloc at the UNFCC 22 years ago. Welcome, Ms. Diouf. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for your 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 your, your kind word to my uh, 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 to my humble person. Uh, I, I just want also to welcome you all to uh, uh, unlocking sustainable investment in that based solution for climate action event uh, 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 um, organized by by UNEP. Uh, it is my my pleasure to to really uh, be part of these uh, events. Uh, because we do things as LDCs is a key opportunity uh, to use nature as a key pillar uh, to scale up climate action and also to preserve at the same time the nature. And I think in the deliberation we are having actually, in particular for the GST, we are emphasizing the necessity to have both in mitigation and in adaptation uh, section the issue of uh, nature-based uh, solution. So this, uh, this, this, uh, this side event is really uh, uh, in line with uh, what LDC's countries 
uh, are, are pushing for. I just want also to highlight uh, that we do have really a, a, a COP28 opening with uh, an unprecedented uh, and historical decision is the operationalization of a lost and damaged fund and new funding uh, arrangement. And some pledges are met, met. I think actually we arrive around five, more than uh, 5 million, my 500 million, but was being mobilized from the two days. So I think there's really a, 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 a willing of uh, all the, uh, 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 the international communities really to, 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 to tackle the issue of lost and damage. And nature is vital. Protecting nature is vital. It's vital for, for the adaptation, it's vital for the lost and damage uh, process, uh, 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 and it's vital because our communities are close to nature, and in particular for LDCs. Uh, our livelihood is based on nature, so uh, uh, it's why we need really to see way for enhancing action uh, to really preserve uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, ecosystem. And uh, for that, I think the lost and damage uh, uh, decision is, is really a, a high milestone. And also uh, uh, the discussion we're having also on how to scale up finance adaptation is also an opportunity to do more on, 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 on the preservation of natural solution. We really look for having the, 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 the decision around the doubling of adaptation. We're looking also to have a decision around the global goal on adaptation. That will help us really to, to, to really navigate around uh, 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 the implementation of key action on serving uh, 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 and protecting our, our, our nature. And I think really this, uh, uh, this side of us is a good opportunity to highlight all these opportunities we have through this uh, uh, climate UN process in order really to preserve and also scale up action on nature-based solution, but also uh, be in line with uh, our community's need. Uh, before uh, uh, maybe I, I, I go further, on my uh, national uh, 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 specificities. I, I want also to use this opportunity really to thank uh, someone, uh, uh, Salem Ook, Professor Salem Ook. Uh, we, 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 we lost it uh, before the pre cop uh, He was one who were really combating uh, 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 adaptation action. He was one who was also mentoring the LDCs group because he was the one who really helped us to set up this uh, LDC group on 20, uh, and thousand, in 2001 uh, from the Marrakesh discussion. And also he was really putting for uh, local led adaptation. So being close to communities, uh, looking how to help communities to keep their livelihood uh, taking on board uh, uh, their, uh, their, 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 their ecosystem. Uh, uh, this is important. He was also the one who were really fighting to the appropriate uh, a consideration on loss and damage. And I think uh, he's really uh, uh, someone who we need to think, but we need also to continue uh, uh, make his work uh, as we he started. And uh, we, we just want to use this opportunity to celebrate uh, his uh, work and his memory. Seeing that uh, in Senegal, we 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 really concerned about a nature based solution. We have a big park, the Nyokolokoba Park. We have also some mangrove in the south of Senegal. We actually working around uh, with many NGO uh, in how to really conserve uh, and also how to uh, 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 ensure that this uh, uh, nature is preserved. It's really important for our point of view really to see how we can involve really appropriately these communities on all strategy we're gonna develop. They are the one who can really preserve the ecosystem where they live. So this is, I think, something we have to push for through all these action we're putting and we need also to help them to preserve this ecosystem they have around them. So I think uh, 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 we, we, we really have uh, these uh, opportunities to move with them in a transformative uh, uh, potential uh, approach on natural-based pollution. But for that, we need also to build their capacity. They have very tra traditional knowledge, but we having climate change is something new. So how to combine 
the knowledge with this uh, situation we all facing. So I think this is also something we need to to develop in order to really have uh, uh, to keep them sustainable livelihood going ahead. So. Just to conclude, I think uh, in our section today, and I want also to highlight the, the UNEP, uh, UNEP GAP report on adaptation. Uh, we also use this report for all our uh, 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 deliberation to call for enhancing finance. We know there is a big gap. Uh, uh, we're talking about doubling adaptation is around uh, 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 20 billion by 2025, but we know through this report, we need more. We know we need around 200 billion to 300 billion per year. So this gap is really important, and we need here really to make this uh, uh, this uh, this advocacy to ensure that our partner uh, 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 really are, are, are working with us to 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 resolve the gap, and also to make appropriate resources in ecosystem-based adaptation. I think is linked to local-led adaptation, is linked to the livelihood of our communities. So this session today will really give us opportunity to share lesson, uh, uh, to share projects uh, and perspective uh, uh, supported by UNEP and also ecosystem-based adaptation uh, uh, practitioner. I think it's really important. We are here to scale up action. We are here to make the advocacy of our communities uh, in regard to, to their need. And as I say, it's a matter for survival for them. So this is also, I think, something we have to be all proud to working closely with UNEP on that way. So uh, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the LDC's uh, 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 country's constituency and encourage you on all uh, your front uh, 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 rigor and responsiveness uh, you're doing in order really to ensure that the finance uh, is flowing significantly in the natural-based uh, solution uh, 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 approach. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, 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 give back the floor to Neb. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you for those wonderful words uh, that have set the stage for this uh, session. Thank you. So with that, let me turn to Ike Berra. He is a senior program associate at the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, hosted at the United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security. Mr. Burra is responsible for the overall assessment of climate change adaptation options from ecosystem perspective. Prior to this, Mr. Burra worked at GIZ on advancing climate risk insurance um, and with a focus on applying integrated climate risk management approach to the renewable energy sector in Barbados. So, Mr. Berre, over to you. You have a presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, and today I bring uh, a practical example from our institute. Um, so, particular our Particularly, our climate risk analytics team at UNU um, is working with many quantitative assessment methods and approaches. And today, I um, would like to share with you our experience with a tool called Economics of Climate Adaptation Framework. Um, so, in a nutshell, um, the tool, which we call ICA, um combines several features so basically it combines hazard modeling together with exposure vulnerability analysis but also includes cost benefit analysis of different kinds of adaptation measures including nature based solutions um so the tool what it does it first of all provides predictions of current and future climate risks to your intended yeah, study area could be an urban area or city, uh, regional um, scale, but yeah, larger municipality, but also provincial level or national level. And it does also provide yeah, indications, projections, estimates of future and current expected damages for selected assets. And when I say assets, uh, basically referring to infrastructure you may have, 
um, available in your study area, but that could also be, for example, ecosystems that would be worth to, to protect from a certain kind of hazard. Um, so the tool does then also include adaptation measures and, and the impact of measures on your selected assets. So what is actually the reduced hazard risk? What is the reduced vulnerability of a certain asset in your study area? And what are actually the costs uh, for you as a, as a mayor of a municipality to invest? Um, so in short, it gives you an idea on yeah, what happens, what happens where, uh, when, and at what cost. Um, um, I would like to share with you some some findings we had. So uh, with the several studies we conducted, and our um, our experience also in integrating um, ecosystem-based approaches or nature-based solutions. Um, so we conducted studies under under different hazard types and scenarios, uh, mainly for flood events, but also droughts, and also different scales. Uh, we conducted it already in urban areas, but also in larger national areas, um, provincial levels, focusing on agricultural sectors. And um, the studies have shown that in many, many cases, nature-based solutions have been very cost-efficient um, measures or strategies compared to conventional yeah, gray engineered um, approaches. So um, I think would say one takeaway from us was that NBS can be way more affordable, especially in the investment and uh, the maintenance phases, um, but particularly also very efficient when we talk about um, multi-hazard scenarios, but also, yeah, very cascading contexts. Um, you have to imagine with engineered solutions or great solutions there, yeah, show their impacts immediately and also measurable, right? In a way um, that you can see an immediate result of, of your investment. Um, however, they are particularly focusing many times only on one hazard and uh, do have, yeah, a delivery of impacts in only very short term periods. Um, on the other hand, we also seen that nature-based solutions do actually take, if efficient or with the objective of being efficient, take large areas of land. And as we all know, land, particularly in urban or peri-urban areas, do have a lot of land use pressure on them, right? Coming from different stakeholders or interest groups. Um, um, NBS can also involve ecosystems that by themselves are quite vulnerable to, to the impacts of climate change. So these are yeah, aspects you should consider when, when designing NBA um, approaches. However, despite the shortcomings, I think one major takeaway from our studies have been that the nature-based solutions um, do have a good opportunity um, or characteristic. So in the face of uncertainty of risk, uncertainty of vulnerabilities, or even uncertainty of effectiveness, um, an MBS approach can be still seen as as a, as a very low risk or yeah no regret intervention. Um, so um, I've been told that only have five minutes and the tool reapply is rather complex. So um, show you a QR code that brings you to to a community we have established just around this tool. We showcase several. Um, case studies we conducted. Um, it is some sort of a community of practice, I would say. Um, the tool itself um, is also open source. So uh, in case you are interested even in uh, yeah, setting up such a, such a tool uh, in, your, in your work area, please approach me. And um, since we still talking about finance today, um, and before I close, just give me maybe also or give you like three findings also we we have observed uh related to to financing nbs within our studies um so the first finding and challenge we we have observed um, particularly in, in the studies that had a focus on urban environments or peri-urban environments was that from a private investor perspective um there's only a subset of of ben benefits that can be considered yeah, monetizable benefits. Um, if we talk about an urban context, for example, avoided costs of stormwater treatment, right? Um, avoided costs of urban irrigation services, but also carbon sequestration. So these are all benefits with a very strong link to private entities. Um, however, there are also benefits that occur on various other um, 
public public entities, right? Um, NBL do also provide benefits like maybe noise reduction, air quality improvement, uh, biodiversity. But these benefits do not necessarily have a link to to a private private entity. Um, um, so we see there was a challenge that that even the combined private benefits of nature-based solutions do often not outweigh the investment costs. And here we sometimes have to find and possibly public-private solutions to keep that balance here and to make it more attractive for investors to have a yeah, return on investment. The second point, um, base based complexity of NBS. It can be a highly contextual. Um, we localize climate risks. We have localized vulnerabilities, which you cannot translate to other places. Um, we have local regulations, ownership. So there are many localized aspects we, we need to consider. And that makes it really, really difficult for us to upscale uh, interventions. Um, last point is data monitoring, uh, also verification processes. Um, um, how do we measure the performance performance of nature-based solutions? Yes, there are certain performance indicators we can measure, um, but it's there's much more work to do, particularly also to inform financial instruments and financial me mechanisms. Um, um, also looking at the insurance industry, for example, um, um, there are possibly also three intervention types, how the insurers would intervene in NBS solutions. So first, of course, ensuring the actual natural capital of a nature-based solution, like looking at the flow of service that provides the natural capital, but also investing possibly into, into interventions that can reduce uh, the physical risk of the insured assets they have in their portfolio. And the third one, intervention of a financial institute or also insurer would be possibly also to invest uh, at large into NBS for, for financial returns. Um, so just some thoughts and experience from our side. Um, feel free to approach me afterwards. Um, if you want to know more about our tool, um, I'm happy to discuss with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ike. I'm certainly uh, interested uh, to know about that. So I'll follow up with you. Thank you. OK, so the next presentation is from me. Um, it's. Uh, done on behalf of UNEP. Uh, we've been working on adaptations since 2010, UNEP as a whole, um, and it's really taking departure from the LDCF, the SCCF funds that were negotiated um, in the early 2000s. Um, this is really what what lifted the adaptation work in the international community. Um, since then, we've been programming on adaptation fund, we've been programming on green climate fund, but this body of experience is largely from least developed countries, uh, the least developed countries fund. Um, so we're calling it a decade of experience. I don't have the clicker. I do have the clicker now. Uh, decade of experience really about um, implementing nature-based solutions for adaptation. Ecosystem-based adaptation is, is really um, how we've been helping countries to uh, design and implement projects. We work through a national execution model, uh, which means that we work hand in glove with our partner governments to design and to execute these projects. So there's some photos. That's a photo of a project in Nepal um, that's been going on for about two and a half years now. And that's Antigan Barbuda. Um, over in the top right hand uh, um, uh, corner. And there we've been implementing a mix of uh, climate proofing infrastructure and revolving home loans, a revolving fund for home loans to, to um, help communities uh, adapt and protect themselves from extreme weather events. That bottom uh, left hand picture is from Sudan, where we've been helping communities in the West Nile state um, with agriculture and with water provision. That central photo is from Tanzania, where we worked with various districts to support them on agriculture and water scarcity. And the bottom left hand picture, I believe, is from Nepal as well. 
Okay, so just to say that uh, UNIT plays an active role um, with our partner governments to design and to implement projects and to really try to build capacity for ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, and this policy brief brings together some experiences. Um, our very earliest resolution comes from 2008, um, resolution 1.8 on ecosystem-based adaptation. And since then, um, we have been programming and we've supported over 50 countries, I would say, um, at uh, benefiting over 3 million people. Uh, we work on developing normative guidance. We have many materials that are posted on our website, translated to Spanish, Portuguese and French as well. Um, and developing thematic briefing notes like um, how to do ecosystem based forestry interventions. So some insights um, from these 10 years of experience, which I think would be interesting for the audience. Okay, first of all, um, in order to implement ecosystem-based adaptation or nature-based solutions, we need to adopt a holistic approach. It's not just about the climate change risk, it's also about the underlying drivers of vulnerability. So really understanding those interconnected stresses on ecosystems is important in order to identify the solution. And this also uh, 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 connects with what uh, Ike was saying earlier on. Um, designing and implementing in interventions across legislative barrier boundaries. So transboundary projects is often very important, particularly where watersheds are shared between countries. And looking at the integration of ecological considerations with livelihoods, governance and capacity development is really important for sustainable uh, interventions that create impact. Um, in terms of adaptive capacity of stakeholders, what we've noted is sometimes there are challenges with demonstrating and sequencing um, the benefits of EBA. So planting trees, for example, for uh, flood attenuation benefits takes a few years to, to show. Um, and so what you really need to um, show is immediate benefits in the form of livelihood improvements for communities. So understanding those benefit streams uh, and designing projects accordingly uh, needs to happen. Recognizing gender and other considerations, incredibly important, uh, because if we don't, we can often um, uh, sort of accentuate the status quo in terms of power relations in, in communities. And building trust and managing expectations is incredibly important. The whole stakeholder consultation process at the community level and having communities participate in the design of the project is very, very important. Long-term sustainability. In terms of sustainability, promoting collaboration between grey and green infrastructure, it's, it's going to be quite rare, I would say, for green solutions to be the entire problem. Normally, it would need a combination of grey and green approaches. And so we're experimenting more and more with those as the climate change issue becomes more accentuated. Identifying levers um, in local budgeting processes, domestic budgeting processes, incredibly important for sustainability. And this is one of the financing avenues that the Adaptation Gap Report uh, has emphasized as, as one of the most important um, avenues. So really understanding how local budgeting processes happen um, and, and integrating um, monitoring indicators and so on for those budgets is, is one of the things that we're working on, particularly also with our national adaptation planning projects. And then building monitoring frameworks, also very important, but also quite difficult. And again, this is something the Adaptation Gap Report has highlighted as being one of the key areas that, that is lagging. So understanding what are those indicators and how do, how do we monitor them? And then the fourth area of uh, lessons learned, if you like, is project design and quality, designing EBA projects with a gender responsive approach. Often it is true that some of our partners may not understand why that's important. And so we're building capacity on that issue. Understanding legal rights and obligations. Um, often projects work better if we are able to agree with communities um, on how different approaches will work. 
Um, and so the idea of, um, you know, consent, uh, consultation and consent is, you know, comes into that. And then, of course, awareness raising and communication. Unfortunately, awareness raising communication is often left behind, but it is actually one of the key enablers to making projects work well. So we're doing a lot more to, to make that work better. Okay, and so I just hope that those few lessons in the five minutes that I've been giving to present, I hope that those few lessons um, spark, you know, questions, curiosity, maybe observations from your side when we come to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaker is online, I believe. Dr. Francisca Tanneberger, is she online? Okay, and she's also going to present. There she is. Welcome, Francisca. Hello. Francisca is the head of the Griswold Mirror Center in Germany. Is This is a science policy practice interface for all peatland related questions locally and globally. So let me see. Okay, so Francisca, maybe you can introduce yourself because I have a lot about your center, but I don't have a lot about you. Maybe you can just say a few words about you. Thank you. We can't hear. Sound. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, I'm, I'm both a peatland scientist, so I, I do research on peatlands, uh, so one of these uh, wonderful ecosystems we are talking about today. Um, but I also am um, one of the two directors of this Maya Center, and we are engaged in policy, in uh, knowledge transfer about peatlands, because there is a lot of things we can actually gain from better managing peatlands, better understanding peatlands in terms of climate protection, biodiversity protection. So we we try to to raise um, the topic uh, also on a global scale, and I was part also of the global peatlands assessment. So I coordinated the um, country chapter, the chapter for Europe, uh, and that was a big effort and actually launched at COP27 last year in Sharm El Sheikh as the first ever global peatlands assessment. So then I think I will start with my five minutes. Um, I do not have a presentation, but in my background, actually, you see a peatland. I'm just very close to this peatland now in northeast Germany. So it's, it's landscapes we talk about. It's um, open space. Um, and uh, you do not see people on this picture, but it's also very much about people. Why do we talk about peatlands when we talk about nature-based solutions? Um, peatlands cover globally, you may say, only 3% of our land but they constitute a really key ecosystem for addressing climate change, adaptation, but also the biodiversity crisis. The distribution of peatlands is, uh, is not even, so we have a, a stronghold of this ecosystem in the Northern Hemisphere. We have about one third of the global peatland extent in North Asia, but also in the tropical part of Asia. We have a lot of peatlands in North America. You may think of, of Canada, for example, as a very peatland rich um, country. But again, we have peatlands in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in uh, Peru, for example, with a very large extent. We have them in Africa, in, in almost all countries, um, with a stronghold, again, in the um, Democratic Republic of Congo, in the Congo Basin, and the other countries um, in this region. And of course, we also have some uh, peatland shared, about 12% of the global peatland extent in Europe. And... Um, my role is also a bit to talk about what we all did wrong with our peatlands, because in many other parts of the world, you managed your peatlands in the past much better than we did. Um, in Europe, more than half of the total peatland area has been drained in the past. So we remove the water, we artificially drain them. And you see it also in the background of my picture here. So there's a lot, a lot of infrastructure. We actively take the water from these lands, uh, also we more and more understand now that we actually need to have them back, that we need the water. In the other regions I mentioned, it's much less. It's only maybe 10% in Asia or less than 5% in North America and Latin America of this ecosystem that has been destroyed, degraded in the past. But the good message is also that we can restore peatlands and we have the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So there's a lot of 
mm -hmm. restoration, and um, there's a lot of scientific background actually how this can be done. The other key reason, I mean, why peatlands are really important is that they contribute now a big proportion of our greenhouse gas emissions globally. We estimate that it is about 5% globally. Um, and in some of the regions I mentioned already, it's it's much more. The biggest in Libya greenhouse gases is actually Indonesia. Um, but also Europe is um, second place, uh, especially European Union countries. So we contribute a large part of the global um, emissions. And uh, in some countries, it's it's roughly 5%, also European Union, of the total amount in 5% um, maybe in, in, in Germany as well, where I'm situated at the moment. In some regions, like the region where I'm now, it's 40% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I also mentioned already, it is about people actually, also you do not see them on the picture right now. Um, I spent last night here also with a farmer, with a family of farmers here in this region, because um, it's about management, about communities, about stakeholders. So it was the reason for draining the land, but now we can also find solutions with these people. Um, but this will not happen on its own. So we need investment, we need finance for it in all parts of the world. And just to explain maybe four areas of potential um, yeah, we can target actually with sustainable investment, sustainable finance. I mean, one area is clearly the, the climate benefit from revetting, from cutting emissions by raising the water table again. You may think of carbon credits, for example. You can um, put the avoided emission into a credit, but also the additional sequestration in these systems, because these ecosystems are able to sequester CO2 again and to form peat and to extend the carbon store that we have in our soils. There's a lot of work on it already for the last 10 years in many regions. There are methodologies around. Um, we uh, In the European Union, a carbon removal certification framework is currently um, designed. But of course, it's also very much important to keep in mind that, I mean, we also need a uh, phasing out of carbon credits at some point, because uh, at least those that uh, sell in avoided emissions, because we have to get to net zero in all sectors and all areas then we can really maybe enable the carbon sink, the additional sequestration uh, in via credits. Another area is, is clearly wilderness. So revetted peatlands in, or uh, undrained natural pristine peatlands, they have an interesting and big role in and also in wilderness areas for biodiversity, for tourism. Uh, and then of course there comes production also in. So these lands to a larger extent have been used for agriculture. And they can be used also for agriculture in a wet condition with a water table that actually protects the peat and no longer harms uh, the peat because it's artificially lowered. And this is something that is called paludiculture, wet agriculture or wet forestry. And um, there are many examples, many species. So in an area like the one in my background, it would be grasses actually, reed, cattail, such species. It can be mosses, it can be trees in, in the tropical peatlands, for example. In Africa, it's very much about papyrus as a species. And you can really think of many different uses for these species. They are very productive. They bring a lot of interesting properties because these plants are able to grow in a bad environment. So they have a lot of useful properties also that make them very good raw materials. And an increasing and emerging area now is also renewable energy to combine them actually with revetted peatlands. So you should not do it on pristine peatlands, of course, but if you have a degraded peatland already, you may think also of combining it uh, with solar energy or with wind uh, mills, for example. Key point I would like to make is we talk about sustainable finance and sustainable bar finance on peatlands, on these ecosystem means peat preservation. Anything else is not sustainable. We need to protect carbon store, we need to stop the release of CO2 from the soils. This is of uttermost importance. And with increasing interest in nature-based solutions, we also see an increasing number of weird things that are sold as solutions or false concepts emerging. So we need to be very careful what we actually call sustainable. In, in my opinion, peatland revetting paludiculture is really a prime example of a nature-based solution because we can substantially cut emissions maybe by 15, 20 or more tons per hectare and year that are not released because the soil is wet again. We can cut the probability of fires because we have a lot of fires on drained peatlands that especially also contribute to um, large CO2 emissions in many regions. We can stabilize the, the water regime. We can keep these peatlands as wet areas, as a kind of sponges in the environment. Um, we improve water quality because we have no longer release of nitrate, for example, from the drained soil. 
And what is very important also in tropical countries and in coastal regions, we stopped subsidence because the carbon that is released as CO2 to the atmosphere um, means also that we lose height, that we lose um, elevation and that the land subsides. And with wet peatlands, we stop subsidence and we may even allow the areas to grow um, together with a potentially increasing um, uh, sea uh, water. We can um, support biodiversity, we can really address climate and biodiversity and in terms of adaptation uh, peatlands cool landscapes you're probably aware of this they can really um, provide cooling effects and this is also something that we need in many regions um, and last but not least i mentioned agriculture i mentioned that we need um, uh, solutions with people and here's really paludiculture which comes in it can provide biomass for food for fodder for fibers and um, there's a big interest now in also climate positive building materials because the entire building sector needs to become fossil free and um, we have a big chance actually for such materials. And we need the demand for it as well. And again, here is where finance comes in. And this is something we are active now to build really an alliance of, of companies, for example, demanding this kind of biomass, demanding um, such solutions from wet peatlands, because then we can really make a big step forward if we provide funding for the rebetting, but also for the farmers directly then for keeping and maintaining wetland and also um, stimulate the demand side for this kind of land use, uh, which would be um, sustainable. I'm looking forward to questions and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was extremely informative. Uh, we will come back to questions. Uh, but without further ado, let me then introduce our last speaker, Jessica La Guardia. She's the Climate Change Unit Head uh, at the International Cooperation and Climate Change Directorate of the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of El Salvador. Jessica has experience in public policy management, finance and economics. She worked for almost 10 years in the monitoring of business projects, economic government programs and environmental policies, as well as financial analysis and grants management. She is now monitoring and implementing international multilateral agreements on the environment through public policies, projects and partnerships with stakeholders. Welcome, Thank Jessica. You. Let me see if I can. If I... Uh, I know it's... Um to a chair. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Unit, for having me here um, and uh, for helping or for giving me the opportunity to share the experience of El Salvador in implementing a project called City Adapt. It's City Adapt in El Salvador and Nature Based Solutions um, in Urban Areas. So this project was financed by GAF funds and it was implemented with UNIP as our partner agency. Okay, you can hear me? Yeah, okay. So, um, so we have three components of this project. The first one was to incorporate the ecosystem-based adaptation into urban development uh, planning. The second component of this project was to uh, to make or implement and demonstrate ecosystem-based adaptation measures to reduce the vulnerability of local communities. And the third one was, of course, of awareness and increased knowledge about these measures in the region, right? The project was implemented in three different countries, in Mexico, in Salapa, Mexico, in San Salvador, El Salvador, and in Kingston, Jamaica, through it was uh, through seven years and around twenty thousand beneficiaries. But the main goal of all these three components was to uh, to create capacities in local governments and local communities on how to adapt to climate change through these ecosystem-based adaptation measures. So here you can also see like uh, a map, but this is a. Uh, an analysis on vulnerability that was made in the area. Uh, we selected the watershed Arenal Montserrat, which is located in a, volca in, in a volcano. Uh, and we made this analysis on vulnerability to evaluate the, clim the climate, the social and environmental, and environmental risks. And of course, uh, one of the main risks that was found was the risk of landslides and flooding. Uh, 
possibly because of deforestation in the area of changes in the land use and changes in rainfall patterns as uh, we have also our, our climate change scenarios. Uh, and we also were looking to prevent the loss of ecosystem services, right? The provision of water, the provision of food, uh, reduction of vulnerability. Um, oh, well, that, that's like a small video on the, on the analysis, but yeah. on the, that it was made. It was, this analysis was also used during the storms of Cristobal and Amanda that hit the country in 2020. And it was also used to model all the floods that this uh, climate uh, storms uh, affected the country. So with this analysis, we also identified what kind of nature-based solutions we were going to implement in this area. So uh, four of the main uh, actions were infiltration ditches, the absorption wells, live fences, and uh, repair and restoration. So through these uh, actions, we well, one of the main uh, results was the restoration of coffee plantations with all the benefits that the restoration, uh, landscape restorations bring. And these uh, ditches were made through uh, uh, 48 kilometers of ditches to infiltrate the water. And this measure proved to be efficient for water collection and soil uh, conservation, right? Because it would prevent the erosion from uh, from continuing and stopping erosion. So it also helped us with the soil conservation. And as well, it also helped with the livelihoods of the communities that lived in that area. The absorption of wells helped us, well, there were 30 wells that were uh, implemented in this area and in the high areas of the watershed. And it also helped us uh, efficiently to uh, to avoid the, uh, to collect the runoff of the water, right? The water, uh, collection before it went all the way down to the lower areas of the watershed and live fences that help us uh, in the high erosion places to prevent the, the landslides. We also wanted to highlight with the project the complementarity that, uh, that exists between gray and uh, green solutions. Uh, they, are, they don't have to be necessarily to be, have fighting interests. They can be complementary to complement each other. In this project, uh, complemented very well with, uh, with the construction of a detention pond, a water detention pond that was, or a lamination pond that was constructed that cost a $21 uh, million. And this pond was supposed to, or is supposed to, uh, to capture the water that, uh, that, that uh, to retain the water volume to avoid floods in the lower areas of the of the watershed, but we complemented this great infrastructure, this pond retention of water, with a uh, with a uh, ecosystem based adaptation solution. Right, with these infiltration ditches uh, that we constructed in the upper part of the watershed, that would also absorb that superficial water runoff. Right. Um, and it was also, we also calculated that the absorption capacity of those ditches was of 140 cubic meters per kilometer of infiltration ditch. So the interesting part of this um, calculation or this analysis does, is, that is, is that if we assume that 50% of the coffee farms that were in the upper part of the, of the watershed made the restoration and uh, implemented also uh, ecosystem-based adaptation measures, they would retain water that would equal to 50% of the of the ponds of the of the lamination ponds capacity. So uh, so that was also like we can also through this analysis see how they complement and the, how the uh, the nature-based solution is half as effective and uh, it can provide better benefits with less costs, a cost-effective analysis. Uh, besides the more, uh, the other benefits of nature-based solutions in livelihoods, in biodiversity, as we know. Then uh, we also, with the project, there were also some rainwater collection systems that were implemented and were installed in 10 schools and one uh, community in, uh, collection system was also put in place. And when the analysis was also made to, to see uh, the cost benefits of these constructions, it also gave positive uh, benefits on this, 
on these uh, measures. We had uh, calculations on net present value of internal rate on return and cost benefit ratios that also proved to be positive uh, with this uh, with these investments in in uh, water collection. We also made uh, different scenarios uh, evaluating like different uh, reductions in rainfall, which is also aligned with our climate change scenarios. And they also proved to be efficient, especially uh, with the like seeing how before the cost of the government of on uh, we would stop like schools because of there was no water availability and that was a cost, but now that that is a cover with this measure. So that was also a benefit. And uh, another analysis that was made was how this water that was collected with these systems was used. And uh, 60, more than 60% was used for cleaning, 58% for the toiletries and 44% was for drinking water. And I just wanted to highlight that this drinking water was new because before the kids had to take their own water bottle, each one had to take their own water bottle so that they could be drinking during their during their their school schedule. But now they have this availability as well, right? So that would also increase and help in their livelihoods and uh, and their needs. So uh, this is also the QR. So if you want to find more information on the project and its products and all these um, studies, you can also scan the QR and find more information about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So we've reached the end of our presentations and we're entering into the Q&A phase of this session. Um, while you're all collecting your thoughts and questions, maybe I could just uh, kick off with a few of my own, uh, one for each participant. Um, the first one is to Madeline, who gave the opening words. Uh, Madeline, you mentioned, of course, that, you know, nature, agriculture, the natural resource base is incredibly important to many, many developing countries because people depend on it for their livelihoods. My question to you is, to what extent is it possible to promote transformational approaches um, in traditionally based livelihoods like agriculture? To what extent is it possible to do that from, from your research and experience? Thank you. Just thank you, thank you for, for your question. Yeah, it's a complex one. <laughs> I guess there are also some uh, of our colleagues here who can make uh, very, very, very also very experience. Um, actually, uh, uh, yes, because you, you know we have a traditional land management, and there is a big conflict between the national government land management and the traditional land management. So uh, uh, we 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 moving really to, to see how we can make this, uh, this combination between business, agricultural management, and family land management. Mm -hmm. So this is a big issue. And we know that business private have more capacity in order to face climate, uh, to consider climate impact compared to uh, 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 farmers who really not have these capacities. So how to deal with combination? I think this is part of the strategy we have to develop at the national level. And it's also uh, uh, something we take have to take on board on, 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 on the way we we, 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 we elaborating our adapt uh, adaptation national plan, particularly on agriculture, taking on board also land management and all these things around environment biodiversity. So in Senegal, we we have we are trying really to to really uh, uh, um, promote agroforestry, agroecology. So we do things, but it is one opportunities for farmers to cope with climate change and ensure having these uh, 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 productivities 
they, they need for their livelihood. But it's also something we need to, uh, to bring to the business for them also to keep the environment. So this is really, as I say, a, 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 a challenge we all facing. And one aspect might be really important is water because Senegal is in a size zone. I, one of the speakers was talking about uh, 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 the drainage from peatland, but water management. Also, uh, how to bring fertilizer to farmers and bring green uh, uh, fertilizer to farmers. So all these elements need to be taken on board. And I think the approach of agroecology is something that uh, need to make his uh, place on this process and also i think it's also a natural based solution it's a combination of conservative nature but also having the productivities farmers need from land so this is things we need to combine thank you for your question thank you but uh, yes as i say it's challenging <laughs> thank you madeline thank you. okay i'm being told that we have to wrap up very soon but have we got time for one or two questions from the audience Two questions, maybe. Okay, so we'll take one from the front and one from the back. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. This is the first time a man has to ask a question before women, so it's a gender balance. Thank you. I'm Joseph Badirokila, a manager from the Climate and Knowledge Development Network, CDKN. I'm based in Congo and I cover uh, West and Central Africa. So I would like to make a quick comment on uh, what uh, Madeleine said. No, she, she doesn't, she didn't say that because Senegal have launched last year um, a very ambitious uh, uh, activity, uh, financing LLA in the, the sub region. So it's a very, very, in, in, Question, yes, thank you. Excuse me. So it's very in line with this one. So I think it can be taken as a pilot country for for this kind of uh, topic. So I, I'm going to, to be very quick. Uh, so uh, I was very interested in your, your tool. My question was uh, is uh, how do you collect data to to fit your your your, your platform and also can this be used as a, a, a software so you take it to play, you install it, or as a solution you, you, that you can customize depending on where it will be used. Um, okay, uh, the other one is, uh, I have question for almost every, everybody, but uh, well, we talk to Maybe Because we're being asked to wrap yeah. up, so yes, you can keep your question to one and then we'll go to the back if you don't mind. Oh. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, Aka, over to yeah. you. Okay. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, quick answer to the data and the software update question. Um, data, yes, okay. Um, big question. Data um, can come from any source that is kind of, uh, yeah, verifiable for us. So, so we work a lot together with public entities, of course, uh, when we, for example, do asset valuation, um, we do get in touch with, with um, asset data sets uh, to come up with the economic, uh, costs or economic economic values of such. Um, um, of course, hazard modeling in its own, uh, you very likely then depend on historical uh, hazard data, also on historical damage records, etc. So it's a bit challenging, but what we also observed is um, that um, I don't let it count anymore that there's no data. Uh, many cities are extremely good at collecting data, to be honest, but they do not actually know how to use them and what kind of uh, uh, yeah, questions to answer with those data sets they actually have. So I would say more, um, would move it more into more direction, make people more aware what they could actually answer with the data, the data they're already collecting. Uh, software uptake, um, yeah, it's it's an open source tool uh, run on Mat uh, Python and MATLAB, um, but also the philosophy behind is also to to provide also public administrations and public admin, administ, um, uh, authorities with these tools to be also able to have the capacities and the right tools to also conduct their own risk assessments, their own cost benefits. Because I feel like we're living also a bit in a time where also the cities have to provide the numbers 
to the financial sector. So it's a bit the language and issue here as well. I think in order to also speak the same language, the financial sector requires, we also need to equip also public authorities with the tools to bring these numbers to the table about the benefits, right? So, um, and these tools could help potentially to, to bring numbers to the table, to quantify the benefits that actually the private environment or the private investment environment would like to hear as well, yeah. Thank you very much, Jacob. Lady at the back there had a question, and this will be our last one. Or over time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Rachel. I come from Uganda. And you, you put on something about communication. And I, when I look around, how are we communicating to the last man in the village to understand what climate change is all about. Before we look for money, there has to be acceptability by the people in the communities. We, how are we using the cultural leaders? How are we using the cultural aspects of people? Because when they understand through their cultural systems, then we can expect them to embrace. When the money comes, they can work. So how are we using this? Where are the arts in this whole thing? Where is the music? Where is the paintings? Where is the... Because I'm looking around, I'm an artist myself, and I'm I'm wondering, are we going to communicate this to the last people that we need to adopt and believe in what all these conferences are saying? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I feel that your point touches on the issue of different communities and different languages. So over in that corner, Ika, he's been speaking the language of economics and finance. Not only. <laughs> Not only. If you it, Jessica here has been talking the language of a planner. Um, I was talking the language of an evaluator. And so we're all talking about the same thing from different standpoints. But I think the trick is really if we want to make a difference at the community level for projects to benefit every community member, it has to be driven by the communities. And so thank you very much for making that point. I think with that, we have to wrap up. We haven't had enough time for the Q&A, but I thank you for your attention and your participation. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good day, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Leticia Carvalho. I'm head of Marine and Freshwater Branch in Ecosystem Division and United Nations Program Environment Program. Today, we are going to dive into the concept of the blue carbon and its application and in the carbon market. First, you will hear two opening remarks from two senior government uh, representatives from Indonesia and Norway. And I need to tell you that our guest from Norway is a bit delayed, not <laughs> just in time. Amazing. Excellent. So we have all the important guests uh, already in the panel. So sorry, just give me a second. So we can just move on. So with that, uh, I would say we will have two senior government representatives, one from Indonesia and Norway, and they will tell us into this in important topic. Second, two technical presentations will set the scene on blue carbon and the carbon market and its relationship with the coastal communities. I think this is the fundamental unique, uniqueness feature of this event. And third, Final discussion with government representatives and experts will explore the blue carbon market and what integrity means for this new uh, and innovative tool. So it's a pleasure to invite all of you for the our blue carbon uh, event. I need first to share some of uh, amazing statistics about the functions of the ocean. These are my favorite four statistics about the ocean. The ocean hosts 95% of the planet's life. It's also, it also absorbs 93% of its excess of heat and about 30% of human generated carbon dioxide. Also, the ocean produces more than half of the oxygen in the planet. It's just like magnificent if you take stock of these four amazing ecosystem services provided by the ocean. So we need the tools in our toolbox in order to address the global climate, ch climate challenge and blue carbon is a vital tool. And you will listen a lot about this uh, in, the, in the course of the afternoon. Let me just say that uh, this is coming from a long-term partnership between UNAP and uh, GRID Arendal that we actually merges into UNAP GRID Arendal Collaborating Center. So we share uh, with Pride this partnership. And ever since the 2009 uh, landmark report titled Blue Carbon, produced by UNEP and GRID Arendal, that's what I want to make reference, that this is not a new uh, start, but actually a follow-up uh, moment. This concept, the concept of blue carbon itself, uh, has gained much attention as a promising nature positive solution to climate change that merges in a very interesting way at the times of the GBF just approved. Uh, marine conservation with climate action. And I think now we have the two twins and the, bio, the, the biodiverse uh, GBF uh, coming Montreal agreement and the Paris agreement. So we finally uh, got now the governance arrangements at the level of our proposal since 2000, 2009 in combined conservation, ocean conservation and ocean climate nexus. Many countries are now recognizing uh, at the top of this, this initial, let's see, push provided by UNEP and uh, Great Arendal. Uh, blue carbon ecosystems and climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies in their NDCs, what is amazing step as well. And we hope to see uh, the NBSAPs, the equivalent uh, national plans for biodiversity, also acknowledging the importance of the blue ecosystems and their services for climate in their helm as well. And this is what uh, our event is about today. I would like now uh, to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Victor Gustav Manopo. Victor has worked for several uh, strategic institutions in Indonesia, one of the champion countries of this topic. Currently, he is mandated as Director General of Maritime and Marine Special Planning at the Ministry of, Envi the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. Uh, Victor, I would like to invite you to take the podium and speak for us. Thank you so much. 
ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guys, a very good afternoon to you all. Thank you for inviting us to and talking the time to attend this meeting. Based on the mandate of uh, President Regulation Number 98, 2021, the Ministry of uh, Marine Affairs and Fisheries is a national focal point for the blue carbon or ocean sector in the climate change policy in Indonesia. <clears throat> the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries is also the national that National Data Custodian for Seagrass, one of the blue carbon ecosystem. This institutional mandate has the consequence that we are authorized to develop a blue carbon methodology that will apply national, nationally and design a national roadmap for blue carbon. To this end, we are currently preparing detailed regulation regarding carbon economy evaluation policy for the ocean sector and a roadmap for mitigation action in marine sector. This thing is guys, in our view, highly quality and integrated blue carbon investment should include or consider first, its contribution to environment through the conservation of the remaining intact ecosystem and restoration of the diversity and integrity of the degraded or destroyed ecosystem. The second is, it ensures inclusive participation and leadership of local communities with clear social, ecological, and economic benefit. And the third, comply with scientifically sound international and national methodologies and protocols, ensuring transparent and accurate greenhouse gas funding. The President decree on Indonesian on, on carbon economic valuation and its def derivatives regulate now how to carbon market in implemented in Indonesia. Potential partner can interact with the national focal point for blue carbon to carry out blue carbon related activities in Indonesia. Therefore, Indonesia no longer has an, an unregulated same for the carbon market like before, where foreign entities can directly carry out activities in Indonesia. I hope the session will be a good opportunity to build a partnership on blue carbon and may this meeting mark the beginning of the brighter, more sustainable future for our blue carbon management. And the last thing, the blue carbon action should be in line with the government policy, particularly the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries Blue economic policy. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Indonesia is the world powerhouse uh, of blue carbon. I think everybody knows about this. Its mangroves and seagrasses hold the largest blue carbon stocks globally, accounting for an estimated 17% uh, of global blue carbon in the world. So thank you very much for bringing here, representing such a precious geography. So now I would like to turn your attention and immediately hand over the podium. Uh, and we'd like to introduce our second speaker that is very much on time, Mr. Per Frederick Faro, uh, Director of Climate and Environment uh, in NORAD. And let me just flag that NORAD is the Norwegian Minister of Climate uh, and Environment and its agency of aid. Please, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, very much. And thank you to UN Environment Program and Grid Arnold for hosting this uh, very important um, discussion. And thank you to Indonesian colleagues for excellent introductory 
remarks and and also to add that from the Norwegian side we are delighted to be a partner of Indonesia both on the forest side and on the ocean side so both the blue and the green carbon uh, together I think a few points and I'm, I'm actually going to start with what was my third point to pick up on your point if this is going to work the anchoring in national policy regulatory frameworks and so on is an absolute condition for its success and respecting those elements of the nations where the activities that are taking place is crucial um, and of course that also indicates the need to have governments that take these things seriously in terms of regulatory reform and so on and Indonesia is a leader in that respect both on forests and again on, on the blue carbon side so thank you so much for for that um because I think carbon markets clearly hold massive potential both to initiate change and to drive a lot of needed finance into natural solutions to both climate change and also to biodiversity and nature as you pointed out but I think the history of of REDD plus projects at the project level gives us some reason for caution um, I'm sure you've all seen newspaper articles about less than robust results being sold and essentially climate finance money going to hot air and we don't want that to happen it's not good for governance and it's not good for nature and it certainly doesn't help the atmosphere um, so it needs to be done right and it can be done right and I'd suggest a few things that are quite matter of fact but still important um, to emphasize the first one is that those buying and paying for the carbon credits do that as an add-on not as a substitute for cutting their own emissions that is an absolutely crucial precondition if this is going to be genuinely helpful to the atmosphere the second of course is the environmental integrity of the of the results making sure that there is additionality that the baselines are robust and so on um, there are ways of doing that but the temptation will always be to lower the bar uh, and if we accept that then we don't really get results and we have a market in nothing um, that must be avoided Social safeguards and benefit sharing are absolutely crucial. Um, and I would add that there's a lot we can learn here from the history of natural resource management more broadly, because this is really a natural resource that the countries in question hold. And the resource rent from those resources should mainly accrue to the country and its population. And again, I think Indonesia is, is taking the lead in making sure that happens. Uh, people doing a good job should get paid for it, but uh these are these are sovereign resources and should be treated as such third point is transparency and accountability is absolutely essential um especially given that many of these markets are voluntary in nature um based on standards that are often set unilaterally the transparency and the accountability um, is what keeps this system honest and again I know this has been very much on top of the on the Indonesian agenda I think most countries trying to deal with this are are taking this very seriously so integrity standards that are of the highest quality transparency and accountability uh, and governments and local populations being in charge and reaping the benefits these are the essential perspectives in other words this must be run as a system to produce a public good and for the benefit of the people living in the area if that happens it has a unique and massive role to play in making sure that we can finance the transition effectively thank you for your attention so thank you very much for uh, I think everybody knows that Norway is a front runner champion uh, in international climate policy. The Norwegian Development Agency, particularly NORAD, uh, has been tasked um, with steering Norwegian development assistance to support the aims of the Paris Agreement. 
We love to see this coming together with the benefit of the ecosystems as well. Also, I must say that Nori is uh, the founder of a legendary uh, coalition, the International High-Level Panel on Sustainable Ocean Economy. That's a global initiative uh, that is aiming to build momentum towards a sustainable ocean economy, including the blue carbon. So with that, I would like to say my sincere thanks to Per, to Victor, for bringing good examples of, of countries championing uh, such a important, but is still to be unfold uh, topic. And as we move to the second session of our uh, event, let me introduce of our event, Partnerships to Improve Blue Carbon Market Integrity. That's again, integrity is the key word uh, that we are looking forward for this voluntary new tool. I would like to introduce as well, Mr. Steven Lutz, uh, Blue Carbon Lead and Acting Head of Marine Program of Grid Arendau, great partner of UNAP, as I already mentioned. Uh, Grid Arendau is a Norwegian foundation uh, and UNAP collaborating center. We are very proud of this uh, partnership, as you will see. Steven will moderate the next two sessions uh, and is our technical expert on blue carbon. It's Steven, my pleasure for you to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leticia. So now um, brings the next session, which is um, some technical presentations on uh, blue carbon market integrity or related to blue carbon market integrity. And these are to set the scene for the panel discussion, which will come later. In a wee bit of an introduction to myself, um, my name is Stephen Lutz, uh, blue carbon lead, Grid Arundel. I've been working on blue carbon for uh, over 14 years, even before it was called blue carbon. And I was very fortunate to join Grid Arundel and to work in support of uh, the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, we developed the Global Environment Facilities Blue Forest Project, and I currently lead the Indonesia High Integrity Blue Carbon Market Project under the Norwegian Oceans for Development Program. This uh, project is obviously a partnership aiming to improve blue carbon market integrity. I would like to also invite uh, my co-expert uh, to the stage, Grace, if you could come up. Um, Grace uh, Kapan, Katpang is the Communication and Science Coordinator for Blue Alliance Philippines. She is also the frontline youth representative for, to COP28 for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. Okay, please, please go ahead and you'll, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll, be put, you'll be set up. And so I'll start my presentation in, in just two seconds. All right, so here we go. Um, so the development of blue carbon follows the development of terrestrial forestry carbon projects. And in these projects, uh, the carbon that is saved from planting trees and conserving forests is measured, certified, and sold um, as offsets on the carbon market. These offsets are then purchased by companies that want to offset their carbon emissions now, for example, just this year, um, Grid Arndal, my organization, we offset our emissions from our travel with a project in Kenya called Vanga Bay, and I'm going to be showing a, a wee bit on that. Um, so we're very proud to offset. But the questions for us is, well, well what, do we, what do we offset with? We want to make sure as a conservation organization that we offset with the highest quality project possible. Okay. There's a lot of blue, there's a lot of carbon out there, but how do you how do you know which ones is high quality or not? In any case, uh, by 2050, blue carbon or, or carbon offsets, not blue carbon, are expected to be up to a 550 billion dollar market, and that's potentially much needed finances for the conservation and restoration of these threatened ecosystems. However, the carbon market is not our get out of jail free card. We still need to reduce our carbon emissions. The market is a tool for speeding up climate action to help meet the Paris Agreement. Over the past few years, there's been almost exponential interest in the development 
of and the demand for high for, for blue carbon projects. And that's because they're seen as high value and, and in high demand. However, and this is something that Per, per uh, mentioned a wee bit, uh, the integrity of terrestrial forestry carbon market projects is in question. Earlier this year, you had an article come out from The Guardian reported that some research calling the calling into question the integrity of terrestrial forestry carbon market projects. And the research has found that many, many forestry carbon offsets have problems with their certification, leading to their climate claims being worthless. And I'll say, uh, paraphrase uh, Pierre to say, we don't need hot air, we need real carbon. Um, also, just a few weeks ago, Channel 4 UK also reported that on fraudulent carbon uh, forest, forestry projects, including allegations of human rights abuses um, on indigenous populations. And obviously that's not a really, that's not a good thing because we, we really need blue carbon to be real and it has to be part of a real solution to climate change and human rights abuses are not acceptable at all. A danger for the blue carbon market right now, as it's just beginning and just growing, is that we don't learn the lessons from terrestrial forestry carbon projects and that we repeat the mistakes. However, from experiences with the United Nations Environment Program, we know that community-based blue carbon market projects can work. The carbon finance and benefit sharing from such projects can have great community impact. One such project is Mikoko Pomoja in Kenya. Now, this was the first um, blue carbon market project to be introduced into the voluntary carbon market. And it, it was also part of the uh, UNEP Jeff Blue Forest project, and we replicated this project and it is being replicated throughout the coast. But in this project, the communities associated with this project, there's three villages in, in Vanga Bay, Kenya, um, undertake mangrove conservation and planting activities. And the revenue or profit from the project after it supports these activities has supported um, community benefit activities, such as the building of three freshwater wells, providing sustainable safe water to the community, school books for local children, hospital equipment, and other community activities. The blue carbon projects in Kenya are working. They have high community support and are being replicated, as I mentioned, along Kenya and are serving as models for ethical and just blue carbon internationally. Ultimately though, the blue carbon market, you know, as I mentioned, is rapidly developing and it faces a wild west situation. I don't think that's in question. There are many challenging challenges facing those who want to invest in developing these projects, including for communities and governments. And I think Pear mentioned a few of those challenges, but they include pressures from brokers who want the best deal for their investors, and that's fair. And there's also a lack of transparency and information about how the market works. The market's not there to govern these ecosystems. It's, it's, there, for, it's, it's there to be a market, okay? There's also, uh, uh, however, consumers want high quality and high integrity offsets. For example, it, in, my, in Microsoft's guidance on the purchasing of high quality offsets, it includes environmental justice as an investment. So the question would be, well, how do you measure that? Additionally, and a report on that. Additionally, such act, efforts as the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets uh, that is associated with Red Plus, uh, are advancing the standardization of high integrity in voluntary carbon markets, building trust and confidence. So even though I would say that there is some quite negative news, there's also some positive news and positive directions that are going on out there. It is clear that multiple types of blue carbon market projects are already on the market. And this may mean that multiple different types of blue carbon offsets are being sold. We need to make sure that when you buy a blue carbon offset, you are really getting what you think you are purchasing and not the hot air. This image is from the Vanga Bay Community Office in Kenya. This is the project that Grid Arndal, my organization, bought our offsets from. Right on the wall for everyone to see are all the finances from the selling of blue carbon offsets. Every Kenyan shilling is accounted for and illustrated to every member of the community. The communities here, and there's also three villages in Vanga Bay, are, are incredible supporters of this project. A question arises is that if coastal villages in Kenya can make the blue carbon market work and demonstrate profit and this level of financial transparency, why can't this be rewarded? Why can't this be replicated throughout other projects? 
before blue carbon market projects proliferate? How about we, we learn from forestry carbon and understand how these projects can really and accountably deliver what they're promising? Thank you. Hi everyone, I am Grace. I live in a coastal community in the Philippines in Calapan City in Mindoro Island. Our house is just a 20 minute walk to a 41 hectare community managed mangrove protected area. And this is a drone shot I took around that area and it shows the inter interconnectedness of nature with of humans with nature with mangrove forests. In my conversations with community members, they have noted the role of these mangrove forests in protecting us from storm surges, from flooding that have become more stronger and frequent in our country. For fisher folk, mangrove forests can help improve fish catch as they serve as breeding grounds and refuge for many marine species. Beyond carbon, mangrove ecosystems have many benefits to the community. However, many of our mangrove forests are, are at risk. While certain areas benefit from mangrove protected areas, an expense of mangrove forests in my community and in many other coastal areas in Mindoro and in the Philippines or globally around the world remain vulnerable. This is due to human expansion, development of settlements and establishments. I work with Blue Finance and Blue Alliance in the Philippines. Our program is focused on helping the planet one marine protected area at a time with the support of the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. To protect these mangrove ecosystems, we have collaborated with the UPA Sustainability Institute, our project developer and carbon market facilitator. Together, we assess opportunities for conservation, restoration, and enrichment of mangrove forests and the potential of integrating them into our aquaculture sites. This project aims to generate blue carbon credits, but I want you to focus on this picture on the lower right. Our project is currently in its community consultation phase, identifying the status of mangrove forests and potential project sites. To ensure blue carbon market integrity, we need to invest in people first. Cuba Sustainability Institute has a strong focus on collaborative management and community involvement. We have an official mandate as Blue Alliance Philippines with the local government to co-manage MPAs and to manage these mangrove ecosystems through our co-management agreements with them. We are officially mandated by the local government to manage marine ecosystems, which adds to the validity of our conservation projects. We also give high importance to equitable, fair, and inclusive solutions. The involvement of the local community is crucial to the sustainability and integrity of our project. We need to know the status of the land, who owns it, how is it being utilized, are the local community using it already for their livelihood, and if we establish a conser conservation project in this area, how will, how will it impact them? We also need to figure out the process of revenue sharing, how the revenues will be shared between us, the communities, and the local government. And this takes time. Our blue carbon project is in its early stages, started only about a year ago. Engaging with the local community takes a lot of work, but it is very important. Blue Carbon ecosystems are allies in the global fight against climate change. By working closely with local communities in our process of blue carbon conservation and restoration, we can ensure the sustainability and integrity of our project to maximize the benefits to people and the planet. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to invite our panelists up on stage to sit with Grace, and they will get um, uh, attached the microphones. Thank you. Yes. 
Um, the shipping ports, the shipping ports. I'd like to introduce the panel where they're getting set up. On uh, the far right, we have um, uh, Fegi Nurhabami. Uh, I apologize if I'm mutilating your name. Is, is the Deputy Director for Disaster Mitigation and Climate Change Adaptation at the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia. As the National Coordinator for Ocean and Climate at the Ministry, her focus includes uh, blue carbon, especially seagrasses. And uh, just a side reflection is seagrasses are obviously an important uh, blue carbon ecosystem that are just beginning to enter into the market. Uh, there's only, I think, uh, uh, one or two projects that are out there. Much is needed to understand uh, and locate uh, their carbon and how they can be developed in the market. Um, on my right here is uh, Dr. Al Binger, the Secretary General of the Small Island Developing States Sustainable Energy and Climate Resilience International Organization, or SIDSDOC and uh, the Energy Science Advisor of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. He's a member of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Technology Executive Committee, and a former professor and director of the University of West Indies Center for Environment and Development. Okay. Sid Stock represents 32 islands at the UN and connects the energy sector in SIDS with global markets for finance and sustainable energy technologies. Next to Al, we have Jane Glavin, is the co-owner of Distant Imagery Solutions, a pioneering effort in building an and engineering aerial and underwater solutions and environmental analysis, monitoring and habitat restoration. Her pride lies in incubating groundbreaking technologies while empowering communities through their impactful community training towards self-sufficiently. Sufficiency, sorry. Um, formerly with Ajedi Abu Dhabi, she led milestone projects in environmental data exchange uh, and, and steering initiatives like the National Blue Carbon Program and Climate Change Study in the region. We also worked on the Abu Dhabi Blue Carbon Demonstration Project together way back um, in the early days of Blue Carbon. So great to see you. Um, and she has a knack for large scale project management and environmental expertise, and she navigates the con lead concept to funding with finesse. Okay. And we've we have already um, heard from Grace. Do you want to say a couple words more on, on your introduction? Or are you good? Grace. Yes. But we've already introduced. So if you want to say any more about yourself. Oh, me? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I am Grace. I am here at COP28 as the Global Fund for Coral Reefs uh, Youth Frontline Representative. I also work with um, Blue Alliance in the Philippines and Blue Finance. We have this project on the responsible investment in MPAs in the Philippines, specifically in Mindoro Island, where I live, that is supported by the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. And yeah, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, I live in a coastal community in the Philippines, and I have seen mangrove forest trees and how it is important for us in the coastal community and how it benefits us. Thank you. And so I'm going to ask an introductory question of each of our panelists, and then we'll get into a little bit more a deep dive deeping into the into the um, uh, conversation here. But the question that is the same for each panelist to begin with is uh, from your perspective of you, uh, what is the greatest challenge to achieving high integrity uh, blue carbon markets? Or do you have sort of overall thoughts on that at this stage? Um, and I'm going to pick somebody to start. Uh, Jane, could you start? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here as well. Honestly, it's a privilege. So for us, I think, and how we started our journey is that we really believe that uh, communities in developing countries should have the ability to uh, be able to lead and expand and upscale the projects that they're working on in, in a real way themselves, rather than always having external bodies come in. 
So we build an, uh, our aerial solutions, drones and kites and balloons out of sustainable wood and 3D printed parts. And so trying to make it as easy for developing communities to also do the same by having communities be able to uh, restore at scale. We've done it here in the UAE, uh, 4.5 million mangroves so far, uh, giving this ability for, for communities themselves to be able to become self-sufficient, to lead their own efforts, to be able to not only restore, but also monitor, not just from a carbon perspective, but from a biodiversity exp experience as well, that monitoring and the use of uh, these technologies towards uh, upscaling further towards uh, being able to do the MRV section of the projects as well is important. And I think that's that language of having the communities not only just being a, a, a service there that benefit, but they should be leading these projects themselves, similar to James Cairo and the, and the Makoko Pomoja, it needs to be enhanced and enabled further. Thank you, um, Jane. Yeah. And I'd like to ask uh, Feggy the same question. From your perspective, um, what is the greatest challenge to achieving high integrity blue carbon markets within Indonesia? Okay, uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me here. So, um, uh, referring to uh, Victor's previous uh, statement, there are three um, conditions or three points that needs uh, to be consider into the high integrity or and high high integrity blue carbon. The first is contribution to the environment. The second, the inclusiveness to uh, of the community, especially local community. And also the third is uh, a clear and robust uh, methodology, right? So in my views, in my opinion, I think from those three points, uh, the second one is the most important and the most challenging. I think uh, the inclusiveness itself, it's a, uh, I think it's the, almost the same with you, Jane, right? Because the people itself is the actor of the, actor of uh, the blue carbon itself. So when you're talking about uh, blue carbon, it's not only the ecosystem, it's not only the environment, but you have to count the people. And that's the challenge, I think, how to make sure that all the stakeholders that live, especially the one that lives near the ecosystem, has the benefits from uh, the ecosystem itself. So, yeah, usually they live there. They used to have uh, maybe a livelihood that related to the ecosystem, maybe for tourism or as a fisherman. But then they have to... Uh, then they have uh, also the benefit for uh, from the carbon, the blue carbon itself. So it should be uh, the greatest challenge, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's great. It's it's great to hear that Indonesia places community as number one. That's very very good to hear because, uh, as we know, that that's not always the case in the market. So thank you very much. And, and Grace, I was wondering. You know, you mentioned that you're just starting with the project in year one. If you could give us sort of a more local perspective of the challenges that have involved in that first year, um, we'd love to hear that. And if integrity has come up in your conversations and how you address it, thank you. Yes, we are currently at the earlier stages of our project. And one uh, challenge that we are facing is that some of the mangrove areas are privately owned. It's not publicly owned by the government. So we have to really work with the communities to determine who owns the land. We have all these maps that we uh, ask the communities um, which one is the boundary, where, which one uh, is owned by this person. And that is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. And after that, of course, we have to figure out the process of revenue sharing, but we are not there yet. And in the Philippines, in our context, there is no uh, set framework or policy yet on blue carbon market and blue carbon credits. And so we are the pioneer or one of the pioneers of establishing this kind of project. And there's no uh, successful case study yet that we can follow. So we're really working from scratch and making sure that we are um, initiating the right steps, working with the local communities to have an, a high integrity blue carbon project. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm coming to Al 
um, for your from your perspective, or the or, or if you could speak on the perspective from small island developing states, which may be a little bit different than um, than these larger blue carbon countries. Um, what do you think is the greatest challenge to achieving high integrity blue carbon markets or engaging in this market? If you could give us some reflections, thank you. Let me just add my thank you for the invite and for having me on a panel with such brilliant ladies. It's the first in my career I've served on a panel with all ladies. It's very unique <laughs> and uh, I congratulate you. I, certainly I will learn a lot today. Um, on, on, on islands, you know, we have a few islands in, in the SIDS, of course, compared to the Philippines and Indonesia. <laughs> We, we're just a little beanie stop, so it's great being here. Um, you know, I, I remember when we first talked about this uh, in, in oceans in Lisbon last year, I remember thinking, wow, this is, this is something that should be very important to us as islanders. The ecosystem in which our mangroves and our seagrass exist are probably the most important ecosystems we have. They are for our food security, they're a big part of our tourism industry and their livelihoods, um, especially for women. And uh, in the SIDS, 51% uh, of our households are headed by ladies. So th this makes it even more important and for being on this panel, even more relevant. Um, so what we said was uh, in, in the word of, um, I don't remember, you might remember a former Czech prime minister called Václav Havel who discussed about the market. And he said that the market was a great servant, but it was a terrible master. And I, I think that is what I want to keep in mind all the time when we talk about blue carbon, because there are a lot of unscrupulous people who come to the islands to sell ideas and to whether it's our biodiversity, whether it's our wetlands and Ourselves, we, we don't take as good care of these resources as we should. Um, charcoal from uh, mangroves used to be considered a very important energy source. It was high value, it had high heat, it, it cooked nice. And we destroyed a lot of our mangroves making charcoal. Then our hoteliers came and they saw the beach. They didn't make the connection between the beach and the mangroves, so we destroyed a lot of mangroves and seagrass to build resorts, hotel. Then the sand started to disappear and other things. But also very important is most of us in, in the small island states are in the hurricane or the cyclone belt. And those mangroves and seagrass is what removes the energy from the sur surge of the tides and stuff. So it has multi-purpose function well and beyond what uh, we could sell it as blue carbon. So in a way, we're guilty of not seeing the forest for the trees. And uh, we want to begin to change that. And it begins with capacity. I think uh, we want to ask uh, our colleague from Norway, who put it so bluntly, without capacity as you're building in your communities, without making people aware, it is very hard to get anything done. So we have two, two countries who have so far um, done conservation for mangroves, um, Belize and the Seychelles. But it's uh, very traditional. It's large acres being set aside for people to live alone with very little interaction from the community. So we, we need to learn those lessons and we think this is a great place to start. So thank you very much for all the education I will get today. Uh, thank you. And you mentioned some of the sort of next steps, which brings me into sort of the next question that I'll pose to the panel. And if I get a volunteer, great. If not, I'm going to pick one of you. Um, so watch out. So uh, in, you know, in this sort of next steps on, on market development and ensuring high integrity, Al mentioned uh, uh, adding capacity, which obviously means that there needs to be financial support for that capacity. Um, and I was just wondering if anyone from the panel had any other thoughts on what is needed or next steps in developing high integrity. Um, and I would love a volunteer. Uh, okay, Feggy, it's you. 
So if you could tell us maybe some next steps that, that are going on within Indonesia and how um, maybe communities are going to be recognized there and how that would result in eye integrity. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, in Indonesia itself, uh, we have uh, the regulation number 98. Right, it's about the carbon pricing strategy actually. So uh, we already set up the market uh, for it's not only pro blue carbon, of course, it's for the carbon of Indonesia, uh, where all the carbon should be registered into one system. What we call as RNPPI is the National Registry System at the Ministry of Mayor of uh, Environment and Forestry. So everything should go from there. After you have uh, you validated your uh, your uh, validated and verificated uh, your carbon credit, it should be registered there. And then it can go to uh, uh, different things. If you want to go to um, kind of a result-based payment, maybe not the market, but a result-based payment, or we can go to trading the offset or cap and trade. So it uh, depends on the scheme actually, but uh, yeah, we're preparing that and Last uh, September, uh, we also launched what we call IDX Carbon. It's a carbon exchange for, uh, uh, yeah. Right now it's um, more on uh, carbon uh, credit from uh, energy. And so no blue carbon uh, credit yet that goes to the exchange, but uh, it's only from uh, energy for uh, right now. But yeah, maybe we can go there because Right, right now, I think um, uh, the blue carbon is um, we have the red plus scheme, right? We also already have uh, include mangroves into the red plus scheme also, and it's already I think it's a uh, uh, the pioneer in Indonesia. So uh, we have one of the province that got the payment from result based payment, and but it's not including the seagrass yet. So it's only mangrove right now that uh, that uh, counted in Indonesia. Because uh, mangrove uh, already part of the NDC, so it already counted uh, for Indonesia NDC. While seagrass, right now we are still in the process for counting and building the methodology, like what Victor said before. Uh, right now we have a very tight target. Actually, perhaps we can like uh, map all the all seagrass and build the methodology at the same time, and also preparing the regulations to support not only the NDC target but also the uh, the, the carbon pricing itself, the carbon market. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and thank you very much for mentioning all those aspects, some of which we'll be helping you with through the uh, support we're getting from the Norwegian government on the Indonesia High Integrity Blue Carbon Market Project. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pick on you, Jane, now. Um, since you're our technology whiz on stage, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how this sort of technology and drones and, uh, and uh, underwater ROVs could be used to support either goals for uh, communities or high integrity on the market. If you could give us some reflections on that. Yeah, I think, thank you for the question. I think <clears throat> it needs to start with the democratization of technology itself and this idea that technology for for fit for purpose, not just technology for technology's sake, but really fit for purpose solutions that are built around the needs of the communities themselves towards doing uh, monitoring or upscaling their projects uh, is really needed to start with giving the that technology in a way that the, these communities are building it themselves. It doesn't mean going in with these high-tech solutions that nobody can maintain or operate. These are the, the solutions that are coming out to be really available to the communities that they build them themselves. And if you build something, you can maintain and operate it and utilize that towards understanding, not only from, again, a carbon perspective, but around the biodiversity of the site itself, around actually uh, understand you can for illegal poaching and legal fishing, multi-use and having the communities as part of that full suite of restoration actively engaged. And I think that part of that is needed is that it's not only the 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 solutions that are out there being built with communities in partnership but also the support from others from 
funding mechanisms from other such as we ask you know everybody uh the norads everybody the development agencies to really work with the communities that to accept different ways of doing things that at this time you know as we see here in cop every solution is needed on the table and it might mean changing our perception and how we think about uh, humans with technology, but uh, taking a nature-centered approach is possible and having the support and sometimes that enabling factor to do so. And for us, that's some of our greatest barriers is, is convincing others of new approaches are equally as valid on the table, as long as they build that integrity. And that integrity to us means the communities doing it themselves they they should be leading these projects and, and fully capable of upscaling these projects themselves thank you jane yes we don't need gigantic solutions because communities have been doing a lot of these things for 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 years that we can learn from you know and, and al i think this, this brings us back to some conversations we've had on bio rock um for uh for small island developing states to protect vital infrastructure and restore reef areas which is also being piloted in uh, Indonesia um, as a low-tech uh, solution that communities can engage in. We don't always need the gigantic ones. So let's go a little bit deeper into the community. And Grace, I'm targeting you now. Um, in your opinion, what are the sort of notable advantages for local communities engaging in the blue carbon market? So you have that community. How did they get involved? And are you guys having discussions on benefit sharing? And what did those look like? You could give us that two part. Yeah, definitely. So we're currently in the community consultation space and communities will be definitely involved in our project uh, through conservation. So they will be part of the conservation program. Um, in Blue Alliance, we have these rangers. Um, in Tagalog, we would call them um, Bantay Bakawan. So they protect our mangrove forest. Bakawan in Tagalog means mangrove. And of course, they patrol in our mangrove forest, ensuring that there are no illegal loggers or cutting happening. And of course, in the community consultation phase, we have to learn how the area is being utilized at the moment, especially for potential restoration sites. So we need to know how this will impact the community and how they can benefit from it. So we don't have a framework yet for benefit sharing, but it is definitely in our plan because um, the mission really of Blue Alliance and Blue Finance is the Philippines is not just to protect our mangrove marine ecosystems. It is also to benefit the lives of local communities. And in doing this project, we hope to do both. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you. So as I mentioned, the you know, there it seems like there needs to be some information shared on exactly what these benefit sharing arrangements are. For um the Kenyan projects, they use the Plan Vivo standard. And this mandates that the community gets 60% of the revenue from carbon offset projects. And those Kenyan communities have gained from 60 to 80% of the revenue because the labor involved with blue carbon market projects can be very low cost in, in some of these countries. Um, now that's not the deals that I've heard from other sources. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard deals and this is commonly where uh, private investors are hoping to develop projects and they would get 50% of the revenue for the term of the uh, contract, which is 25 years. Um, that's a different model and that's one that's being advanced out there. So I think we definitely need to share these models with you guys um, and, have a, and, and enable your conversation on this, empower your conversation on this. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to Al. You mentioned a little bit about you know, islands being approached um, all the time. And I was just wondering if you could give us your thoughts on how the potential risks of exploitation for indigenous populations or for SIDS or communities um, might be addressed um, in type of governance mechanisms or other thoughts or reflections on that. Um, I was thinking that we need some kind of uh, international certification. Um, I was thinking of what kind of models exist, and uh, the one that comes to mind is not necessarily the most appropriate, but I was thinking of something like the World Intellectual Property Organizations that allows 
best practices to be shared, um, allows information to be readily available, provides capacity building by training local people, and at some stage has the ability to basically make it difficult for people who are selfish, cowboys as you call them, to not participate in the market, not to benefit from the market. I think the longer we let arbitrary standards go, is the more difficult it's going to become to control it. And these ecosystems are, are not, not that forests, terrestrial forests are not important. I mean, there are water, there are biodiversity, all these. But these ecosystems that are coastal, as I said before, have multiples. If these were to disappear, all our mangroves and our seagrass would disappear in islands. Sooner or later, we would be in trouble of being disappeared. Not even those reefs, artificial reefs, could save us. So I think if we recognize that there is a higher level of importance to these coastal marine ecosystems and figure how collectively we can put in place some international standards and international practices and stuff, I think it would take some of the cowboy to get it more regulated and, and would find more honest people who invest in it rather than just people who want to see if they can get a 50 or 60 percent return on investment on the shortest possible time. I mentioned to you the, the difference between the man who owns the boat and the people who work on the boat. The guy who owns the boat wants to catch as much fish as possible in the shortest time so he can make a lot of money. The people who work on the boat want it to be sustainable because they want to have a livelihood. And I think we, we need to see that kind of perspective in, in, the, in the blue carbon as it develops. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to give the opportunity if anyone of the panel has any last thoughts on blue carbon market integrity. Going once. Okay. Please. Uh, okay. Um, uh, from uh, our perspective, I think uh, what we want to see is uh, a market that is transparent and give the benefits uh, not only for the investors, but also for the community itself, because um, like all said, I also have a, a some kind of experience uh, with a businessman and say that saying that, um, um, yeah, they should have a certain percent for the business, and your government, uh, your community will get only twenty percent. I was like, what? The... Um, I think that's very common right now, right? I think a lot of uh, I think a lot of uh, people, not only me, experience that when we're talking about uh, the carbon market itself. So I think um, the challenge, the biggest challenge right now, Stephen, is how to uh, you know to make sure that uh, the benefits that gets from the carbon market itself is not only um, uh, not only for uh, one side or one stakeholder, but also for all stakeholders with their own portion, with the agreement, clear and transparent agreement. Okay, that's for me, thank you. Thank you, and I'm gonna sum up quickly because we're running, we're quickly running out of time. Um, thank you very much for, for participating in this panel. We've heard um, the perspective from Indonesia and how communities are have been put up front, which is fantastic. We've had, we've had a perspective from the view of a local community who's just beginning into the carbon market. Thank you, Grace. We've had the perspective how our technology might be able to help with, uh, with empowering communities and increasing integrity. Thank you, Jane. And we've heard how uh, small and developing states need uh, support and capacity in order to navigate this complicated field of carbon markets and to realize the true potential of blue carbon. Thank you, Al. So I, I would say overall, the recent critiques of nature-based carbon offsets, offsetting provide us with an excellent opportunity for a sober reality check on what's happening in the market. Some people are, are, say, don't mention the Guardian article. I say mention it and mention it to everyone. So I see this as an opportunity to grow. By all means, let's review the current blue carbon projects and see if they are actually delivering on their carbon, community, and biodiversity promises. Let's also focus on making the market work specifically for communities and countries, creating a north-south revenue stream that values nature and where carbon offsets 
can play a role in its protection if done right. For the market to flourish and make real progress in the fight against climate change, it needs to hear the criticism and evolve. Thank you.
This is a real welcome, but we've already seen the first signs of a new phase in collaboration between the agencies, not just all the different agencies that you saw on stage, but how quickly they managed to coordinate that effort. Um, this High Level Dialogue is uh, obviously sponsored by the Environment Management Group. We are here to talk about strengthening the UN system climate action in support of the parties to the UN Convention, uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, um, we do have an awful lot of people who are going to be speaking today, and uh, they've promised that they're going to come with their best thinking on exactly how we can accelerate collaboration between different UN agencies in the service of accelerating action on climate change. So I'm not going to take up too much time here. You all know why this is important. And most of you have got that thousand eye stare of, uh, of uh, uh, participants at COP. Um, but I think this is an opportunity really to listen. I don't think there's ever been a time before when the heads of so many different agencies have really come to talk about what collaboration can look like. And if we can listen and learn, I think there could be ways to accelerate action in a very meaningful way. So we're going to start with a couple of uh, opening statements, and then we're going to have two different panels. And first, but to open the entire thing, it's my immense pleasure to welcome Ms. Inga Anderson, who is the Executive Director of UNEP and the Chair of the EMG. She's going to add some opening words. Thanks, Inga. Well, to my colleagues, just uh, thank you very, very much, everyone, for being here. As you know, the Environmental Management Group was established by a UN General Assembly resolution in 2000, and it is supposed, and we then UNEP have the great um, responsibility and honor to be the sort of secretariat uh, for this group, but we co-own it and co-operate it together. And it, it, it is the wisdom of the UN system and member states that already 23 years ago, we started this work. We meet, um, online and we meet always on the sidelines of the General Assembly and we always meet at the general, at the top and we do a lot of work together uh, because we understand that member states expect that we collaborate and coordinate. And so that is why, for example, together we agreed on a common approach to biodiversity, which we worked in, in, in line with the COP of biodiversity, COP15. That is why right now we have embarked and we're nearly finished on the common approach to plastic. And that is why we are embarking on a common approach to pollution and chemicals. So each of these issues that we lift, we lift because if you work in UNICEF, there's a different on-ramp. If you work in uh, drugs and crime, and not that you are in drugs or crime, Rada, but if you work to combat illegal activities, there's a different on-ramp. If you work in regional commissions, there's a different on-ramp. If you work in ITU and technology, there's a different on-ramp and so on and so forth. And this is what the environmental management group holds, that we hold it together. And I just want to say a few, a few points here, uh, colleagues will follow. What I want to say is that just uh, a week ago, we, UNEP, issued the global, the emissions gap report. And I just want to mention to you what we are saying. We're saying that CO2 emissions increased by 1.2% in 2022, increased. We're saying that our national determined contributions, which we all work so hard to get crafted, when we add them all up, it will mean that at 2100, we will be at 2.9 degrees, 2.9. When we then add the conditional NDCs, i.e. I will also do if there's money for me to do, then we get at 2.5 degrees. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not nowhere near enough. Right now, we are at 1.1, 1.2 degrees. Or put differently, in 2021, we emitted 55 gigatons of CO2. In 2022, we emitted 57 gigatons. When we calculate what is there, think of it, think of the CO2 we emit like a bathtub, and we're pouring the CO2 into the bathtub. It, we pour then 57 gigatons in in 2022. We have 250 gigatons left when we will bypass 1.5. Uh, 1. So 57 a year, at least last year, 
250 gigatons left, do the math, five years. Or if we want to hit uh, two degrees and we really don't, do the math. And uh, so we will have 950 gigatons, do the math, divide by 57, or you can be you even divide by 50 to make it easy for you. And you can see that it does not compute, which is why the Secretary General is expecting the UN system to work hand in hand to be absolutely clear that we do this lift together. The NDC synthesis report that has been brought out by our friends at UNFCCC makes it very, very clear that we are falling short. And the global stock take recall that we agreed in Paris that every five years we're going to stretch our ambition and we are going to do more in the next round of NDCs. Then it took us three years to negotiate the rules for, for how to do the stock takes. So in 2018, we got good to go. And so here we are, 2023. I just came from the global stock take meeting, which is why I'm hot and bothered, um, because clearly heads of state are making it very clear. We need to step up on, on electricity. We need to step up on transport. We need to step up on textile. We need to step up on building and construction. We need to step up on agriculture and we need to step up on finance. These are the areas on which we have to step up and there can be no discussion around it. And that will take us all. So we at UNEP, we are just extremely privileged to hold this, um, in trust, this coordination in trust for the whole system, since we are dealing with environment. We speak about that triple planetary crisis, the crisis of biodiversity, the crisis of pollution and waste, and the crisis of climate change. These three crises together are what they are intricately linked, and we cannot deal with one without the other. So this dialogue then, addresses from my brilliant colleagues, the areas of climate change, but also the intersect with the mandate with which each institution come and how they look upon it, economic issues, uh, technology issues, as I said, illegality and drugs and crime issues, et cetera, et cetera, nature issues, um, trade issues. Um, and so on and so forth. And this is very important because when the whole UN system lifts, we lift in strength. So I hope very much that the key messages from this EMG dialogue will be something that we can fold into the broader system in the UN, downward into our staff, who, by the way, are doing an amazing job. And so in closing, let me also recognize Hussein, who is the secretary of the EMG and who makes all the magic happen and without whom we wouldn't be here. So let me hand it back over to the facilitator so that we can get this thing going. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. This is a, a notion that I'm gonna come back to at the end. So pay attention for this. When the whole UN system lifts, we lift in strength. It's a powerful statement and I believe it's a very true one. And I think we're going to understand in the next hour and a quarter or so, what that actually means in terms of the whole system working together and what it looks like when it looks like lifting in strength. So now I'd like to invite Mr. Daniele Bialetti, who is Senior Director of Programs Co Coordination at the UNFCCC. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues. Uh, great pleasure to say a few words on behalf of our uh, Executive Secretary, Simon Steele, that is taken in many different places at the same time. But I, I think for us, uh, as uh, UN Climate Change, it's very important to, to be here, to be part of the work of the MG. So many important agencies represented here at the highest level. And I think I can start from building on Inger points on the UN GAPA report. I mean, these type of uh, realities are telling us that we are far from where we need to be. And, uh, and our synthesis report, analyzing the, the elements of, of the NDCs uh, that we have now on the table, not only says that we are far from the trajectory of 1.5, but also that support is essential and needed more at the national level to support countries, parties, in implementing their commitments under the NDCs. And here, one of the critical aspects of the UN system coming together, supporting countries in delivering in what they're committed. Some of them are conditional, some other are, are simply in need of financial support. 
And we have also uh, a number of, of uh, agreements from SDGs, Paris Agreement, Sendai, uh, all these, uh, the, the Global Biodiversity Framework, all these are instruments that are really allow us to work together and, and, and have our, our shared commitment for, for, for the planet uh, and, and building out forward the vision for a new future. Uh, our COP year has started very well. I, I think we are very pleased, first of all, with the decision on the funding arrangements uh, and the fund for loss and damage. Uh, hundreds of millions are coming through. Maybe by the end of today, we may get $1 billion already in terms of uh, pledges and commitment, which is great. It was uh, long overdue, this decision. And the next really days until the end of, of the COP are looking at the outcome of the global stock take, bringing the pieces together on mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation, particularly on finance. Um, it's not going to be easy, uh, let's, let's be clear, because not only we are to look backwards, but also forward in terms of informing the next round of NDCs to be submitted in 2025. And again, here is the cooperation at the level of your UN system that is really not only helping countries to prepare them, but as I said, in making the steps at the national level to deliver on them. Last point is on transparency, one of the pillars on the Paris Agreement. Next year, the first biennial uh, transparency reports will need to come and two, actually two are already being received by us. So this is the moment in where parties, they have to demonstrate that what they have committed is being delivered and the challenges in delivering so. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks again. Uh, thanks, uh, Hussein, for, for inviting us. Always a pleasure. And I look forward to listen to so many contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, um, I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm uh, Dr. Gabriel Walker. I'm, um, uh, I've been working on climate change now for more than 30 years, um, like many people here in this room, and I've worked on al almost every aspect of it. I was uh, deeply honored when Hussein asked me, invited me to moderate this session, because in this room are people working on everything I have ever cared about. So uh, I'm currently working mainly on carbon removals, one part of the climate story, but I have worked on all of them. And this is something that's a great honor and pleasure for me to do. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite my first panelist to come up onto the stage, please. If you're in panel one, please come up onto the stage now. Let me let me read out the names. I'll read out the names. So we have Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, who is Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union. We have Ms. Sanda Ogiamba, who is Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations Global Compact. We have Ms. Rola Dashti, who is Executive Secretary of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. We have Ms. Rolf. Sorry, we have Mr. Rolf Payet, who is Executive Secretary, Secretary of the Basel, Rotterdam and, Stock, um, and uh, Stockholm Conventions. We have Ms. Zoritza Orizevich, who is Executive Director of the World Tourism Organization of the United Nations. We have Ms. Garda Wali, who is Executive Director of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. We have Ms. Maria. Helena Semedo, who is Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization. And we have Ms. Valerie Hickey, who is Global Director for Environment, Natural Resources, and the Blue Economy at the World Bank. And I believe that's given us enough time for everybody to sit down. So as you hear, it's an extremely esteemed panel, and every panelist has been asked to give a very brief opening comment to um, answer two particular questions. So what they're going to say is, uh, where in the UN system are the systemic issues that we're facing? Where could co co collaboration, more collaboration, be more valuable and powerful? And what barriers are, are those, uh, those potential collaborations facing? So where in the system could collaboration be most valuable? And what are the barriers? What's stopping us from doing that already? So I'm going to hand over the microphone. And could I ask you, in the interest of time, to just to introduce yourself again and then to give your answers to those questions, please? Good afternoon, 
And you have to excuse me because I'm slightly hoarse. So Doreen Bogdan-Martin, I'm the ITU Secretary General. And I have to say, I love the gender balance on uh, this panel. So, um, we, we, we do have a token, token male here, obviously, just to keep the balance. So I would say quickly, um, in terms of the areas where I think we need to be focusing, I would say on data collection and sharing. Uh, we need to do more when it comes to monitoring, when it comes to forecasting, when it comes to response. And I think that's something if we uh, work harder together, we can we can do better. I would say the second space would be in standards, technical standards, looking at things like energy efficiency standards, uh, e-waste standards. I think we can also do much more in standards. Um, the third space I would say is in inclusion. Um, so when we look at the, the populations that are most affected, they're actually the populations that are the least connected. And so when we're looking at digital solutions, we have to keep in mind those that are not connected. Um, in terms of challenges, to answer your second question, I think a challenge is resources. That's a big one, financing. Uh, the other challenge, I would say, is that we all have our own mandates um, which means that on the ground, we have different line ministries, and I think we can do better working as one on the ground. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And already some rich food for thought there. If you'd like to pass the, the speaking, Conchon. Okay, thank you. I am Marilena Semedu, Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization. Let me maybe start that for us in FAO, this COP is a moment of achievement of something we have been saying from a long time, that the food and agriculture solutions are climate solutions. And the declaration, the, Dubai, the Emirates Declaration approved uh, yesterday and signed by 110 leaders show that is the time for the food system. Is the time to show what is the food system, that we need to work in a systemic approach. Mm -hmm. And we need to move from systems to think on to move from silos to think on system. And when we talk to system, we need to work all of us in an integrated way, in a complementarity way, where we have our mandate, but we need to see how we produce the food, how we transform the food, how we consume the food, meaning that all of us in the UN, we have a place there. And the challenge we have is how to move to this systemic approach, how to work together to find the solution and to link the food system solution to the climate solution, where we have health together, where we have environment together, where we have uh, animal, plants, humans all together. And to me, this is the challenge. And we have solutions. So one is the One Health, where FAO, WHO, UNEP, uh, one is missing. OIE, we are working together. FAO is working with, I look at my colleague, IEA, imagine to bring nuclear approaches to food and agriculture. Uh, we work with several of you. How we can move to this systemic approach, this one, how we can bring innovative solution. You need to bring innovation because you need to be more efficient in the way we work. And another important point is finance. We need to move at scale to transform. And we need to have adequate finance that will help all of us to the proven solution to move at scale and to have the impact. Maybe just to conclude to say that we in FAO, we are working in a roadmap how to achieve SDG2 at 1.5, how to link. And all of the UN will be invited to work with us in this roadmap, is a UN roadmap to link the SDGs and the climate solutions. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, Rola Deshti, Executive Secretary of UNESCO. Uh, let me add uh, on a challenge, but it's also an opportunity at the same time, is strengthening our knowledge base. We collect a lot of data, okay? However, it's scattered. And I think a good thing to do is to strengthen the knowledge base and to 
bring back all these data sets in certain platforms, and EMG can do an advocacy for strengthening this. We started an initiative at uh, ESQUA between, it's called Manara, and another one is Ricard for Climate, which we brought in various data sets of linking them through APIs of the different agencies, whether it was FAO, UNFPA, other agencies, ILO, ITU. So to bring the data sets forward so that member states and all other agencies can go and pick up the information from one set instead of we collecting. What gives us also, we understand who's collecting the data, so we don't need to repeat collecting data. So we spend our resources more efficiently and effectively. The second thing, it will identify for us how much we need to invest in, in appropriate technologies so that we can mainstream this data and becomes more beneficial to all of us. So this is an area that I think uh, EMG also can work uh, on. The second thing is that as we all agree on the climate pathways and the global actions, however, to achieve this, we need to address also the specificities of the region and the countries at the national level. So it's extremely important on how do we achieve the global goals, taking into consideration the specificity of the regions. And, and I can speak about, for example, when we're talking about energy transitions, we can advocate for circular carbon economy to reach the same goal. So, and it's a specificity at the country level, at the regional level, what it is the best mechanisms to, to go forward into this. So, understand it's not one size fits all. It's extremely important as we go along. And which I, I will uh, leave you with is the issue of uh, my colleagues have said climate. It is a challenge, but it is also an important thing. We mainstream climate actions is extremely important and uh, its impact, its impact on the economy, its impact on uh, and the social stability of the, of the region, its impact on the food system, and its impact on finance and others. So how to integrate and mainstream, and EMG can have a big role in advancing the mainstreaming of climate actions into various sectors and various areas. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yeah. So my name is Leda Oeli. I'm the executive director of UNODC. That's the Office of Drugs and Crime. And I will try to build on what the colleagues have said. So I believe that uh, you asked about the opportunities. Where can we live together and lift in strength, as, as Inger has started by telling us? The colleagues mentioned data standards and also uh, collaborating uh, in programming. I think the best place to do this is at the country level, at the UN country team, where with the UN reform, we have the different entities working together on the ground. So the UN country team is a platform where we can understand what, who is doing what, and what are the resources available, and how can we avoid any uh, misuse uh, of resources or repeating what someone else is doing, but build on each other's strength and collaborate and have clarity on each other's mandate. So I think the UN country team is an important place and platform. At the EMG level, I think it's also very important that we understand what are the strengths of each and every one of us of the EMG members. And what I'm trying to do at the EMG is to try to integrate and mainstream rule of law and climate action. So uh, Rola was speaking about mainstreaming uh, and uh, in climate action. What I'm thinking about is that for every country and for every region of the world, every bit and piece counts. And what we are seeing now is a lot of crimes that affect the environment either directly or indirectly. So when we speak about deforestation, cutting, <clears throat> cutting trees, trafficking in timber, trafficking in fauna, in wildlife, also fisheries, what are we doing to protect and prevent pollution of oceans, uh, hazardous waste, uh, plastic waste, and so on. So there's a lot of crimes that there isn't enough awareness at the country level and at the regional level and with the nature of these crimes. How can we stop these crimes? How can we end impunity? How can we build capacity of law enforcement officers at the country level and at the regional level? How can we review legislation and create also uh, and, and show the nexus between different crimes 
and the crimes against the environment, like the drugs trafficking, for instance. There's a direct connection in, in parts of the Amazon, for instance, in polluting rivers while doing illegal mining for gold by using mercury. There's a direct connection in cutting forests for cocaine uh, cultivation, and so on and so forth. So I think the nexus between different crimes and crimes against the environment and mainstreaming rule of law in the different uh, climate, uh, climate action agendas and working together very closely, not just at the policy and global level in the EMG, but also at the UN country team level. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. My name is Rolf Payet and I come from the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions, basically dealing with chemicals and waste. Now, I have a few life lessons to share in this, this important discussion. And I think the first one, which I want to share is when one fails, everyone fails because we have but one planet and if we if we fail in dealing with drugs if we fail in dealing with food and if we fail with dealing chemicals and waste then i would think that we will all fail so for me that's the most important message and that should be enough to bring us together to work together the second lesson is that yes we all talk about mandates but i think we have sub mandates sub mandates because the biggest mandate we all share is for a sustainable development, a sustainable life, and a sustainable and healthy planet. So we have technically the same mandate. It's a, we only differ in the sub-mandate. So we should be able to sit around the table, identify where we can reinforce, support each other, cooperate with, with each other. And I think that's very important. And sometimes even within the same sector, and here I'm talking about the chemicals and waste sector, we don't talk enough to each other. So we've had three big international meetings, our COPs, the COPs of Minimata Convention with Mercury. We've had the, the Global Chemicals Conference and we're sitting, I've given them a deadline for the end of this year to tell us how we're gonna work together. And I think this will now spread to all our partners, WHO, the FAO, UNODC, because one thing I learned as well in my work is that Illegal traffic in drugs is very much linked to biodiversity. It's very much linked to, to waste. Many of these uh, illegal transactions use waste, illegal waste, illegal biodiversity to build up the infrastructure and to build up. So there is no way that these things are disconnected. Now, yesterday we had a very interesting presentation here, one of the first of, it, of its kind, in fact, is looking at the linkages between chemicals and waste and climate change. Now, to some of you, that may appear obvious, but it, to many of us, it is not so obvious because of the complexity of the issues we're dealing with the climate change and the complexity of issues we're dealing with uh, under chemicals and waste. But they are all very much, very, very much closely linked. And in fact, we had a representative from the uh, Inuit uh, Circular, uh, Polar Circular Council who was talking to us because they are the front lines. They're not only facing melting ice and changing in weather patterns, but what we've seen is the, the long range transport of chemicals coming from uh, all parts of the world is also building up in the species there and they are consuming those species. So when we have the impacts of climate change and they have toxicity in those, uh, in those food systems, then we've seen uh, emerging research that shows that the exposure is multifold, which means it multiplies 10, 20, 30 times. So back to my original premise is we share this common planet. We share, I think, a common mandate, although our sub-mandates are different. And finally, that should be enough to get us to work together because when everybody wins, well, when everybody wins, we all win. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's great. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Valerie Hickey, the Head of Environment and the Ocean at the World Bank, which for some of you who may not know, is a UN agency. And oh. as a bank, we're, of course, interested mostly in money. And this talk is often about money. And a lot of the conversation ends up discussing how to get more money on the table. But I want to spend my minute talking about how do we better use as a UN family, the existing money that's on the table. And I want to be a little bit controversial. I want to talk about the vertical funds, particularly the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility. The World Bank and the UN agencies are the major intermediaries through which governments get access to these funds. And because we compete instead of collaborating, the whole is less than the sum of the parts. 
We are robbing money and we are especially robbing time from the countries by not working together. This has to stop. We have to stop seeing each other as competitors, sometimes as enemies. We have to start collaborating, using our comparative advantage, using the money that makes sense, doing it quickly and doing it together, not doing it against each other. So that's my first plea as a UN family. Let's stop competing. Let's start collaborating on behalf of the governments for whom we serve. We sometimes forget that, I think, as a UN family, that we are international civil servants for the countries of the world. And it is our job to deliver for them, not for ourselves. And that's my second point. Less than 40% of all overseas development assistance goes through governments. We demand governments do better for their people, and then we don't allow them the money to do it. And we create parallel delivery mechanisms, including through UN agencies. Sometimes in very fragile environments, that makes sense. But my plea here is as a UN family, where we can, we need to work through governments. Particularly when we access the vertical funds, the GCF, the GEF money, we need to make sure that governments have access and we need to make sure to help them trickle that money down to the communities so that both poorest communities in every country and poor countries, and particularly the large island ocean nation states, get access to money faster and get access to money when they need it to do what's needed. And we do that together instead of working against each other. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sando Giambo. I'm the executive director of the UN Global Compact. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about a, another part of the family, and that's the private sector. And, uh, you know, important constituency, non-state actor, and really, really important for delivery for all of the work that we want to do as the UN family. Um, all of us here on the panel have spoken about the work that we do. All of it is delivered with the private sector at some level. It's either for innovation, it's for co-creation, it's for financing. This happens across climate transitions, energy transitions, food systems transitions, digital. We all work with the private sector. You know, what can we do better? Uh, a couple of things I'm going to talk about. I mean, first of all is provide technical support. You know, all of the CEOs that we work with say it would be great to get more technical support, more insights from the UN, and simply have a conversation with them that allows good co-creation from the start, not simply a discussion that happens at the end, um, you know, sometimes often predicated solely on financing. So what can we do different with the innovation, the resources, the people, the technologies that the private sector brings to the table? Um, a couple of things that private sector asks for, and I just want to highlight them here, increase ambition from governments all the time. In many ways, private sector does go ahead, innovates and blazes the trail. The second is really about a level playing field. How can we better use regulation, policy, compliance measures to get more and better out of the private sector? And the third is really to look at ways in which we can leverage some of these investments more creatively, more sustainably to deliver um, for countries, for governments, and certainly for UN agencies. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to follow your path because you, you trade. Good afternoon. I'm Zoritza Jurosevic. I'm the executive director of the World Tourism Organization. Thank you for, for giving me the, the beautiful floor because um, we are trading services. And uh, tourism was the third export earning category in trade in 2019 and dropped to the ninth position uh, after the collapse of tourism uh, during the crisis. That said, I think that this is well important to understand that according to our latest measurement, uh, tourism uh, emits about 8% of global carbon emissions and 5% are related to transport. So the three other percent are related to buildings, food, services, and other means uh, that are um, part of the ecosystem of the sector. And all of my colleagues here, uh, we, we work with all of you. I know that uh, we have a privileged relation and a build up with UNEP, uh, with whom we lead the program of One Planet, and with UNFCCC. Uh, by launching the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action. And actually, the roadmap is very simple. It integrates all the aspects we just shared right now, measuring. I think we need really to have a common ground, not only to measure globally, but as we deal with trade and we deal with a lot of enterprises and private sector, we need to try to have a push to harmonize measurement because we need the baseline to know and understand where we start and where we go. Many 
um, there's many tools available for measuring, but we're really pushing to have an harmonized system. That is one. The second is when we come to decarbonization and regeneration, we touch upon two main things. One is on circularity business models. When it comes to the business operations, because we are trade, we produce and we consume. We consume goods and services, and we produce uh, services or center, certainly as well good. So basically, that is very important to empower the enterprises, which are 80% of them are SMEs. Um, the big companies know how to do, but this is where we lift as well the power of the UN system, because the reach out is very important. And we are not present everywhere, and I like very much the recommendation of the UN country teams. I think this is really where we need to head up. On the regeneration, looking at biodiversity and CBD, same, uh, we collaborate because we live um, of the processing and the use of natural area, being there on land, on an ocean. And on ocean, I think in particular, knowing that 40% of the blue economy is tourism, we need to be even more careful. But Blue economy and oceans are as well maybe an opportunity to the third element of importance on financing. And thank you for uh, making that note. Um, I, can, I don't feel bad because we have never accessed those funds because we simply are too small. But, um, but um, we're looking at them, we're monitoring them, and we're trying to help countries to be part of the solution. I mean, some of the country are better than, than others. Uh, definitely, the collaboration needs to move towards not only empowering institutions altogether, but as well, I think, and Ralph, what you said is very true. I think it's all about people. I think that people really need to have to be more conscious. And maybe as we are present everywhere, because we are United Nations, nations are made of people. Maybe we tend to forget that. Mm -hmm. So maybe stop looking global. I think we need to look individual and we need to really trickle down to the people. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can we give a round of applause to all of those, please? Uh, that was an extraordinary set of insights. Thank you. And some great suggestions as well. I think I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to very quickly summarize what I heard and we'll move on to the next panel. And if we have time at the end, we will do a bit more discussion about what the MG could do. But I think I was already hearing some quite strong and brilliant suggestions that built on each other from these extraordinary panelists. And so my quick summary would be this. So first of all, what I, he I heard about data. I heard that from several different people, that why, why are we all collecting data separately and wasting this resource when we could be collaborating and collating? So that's one thing that, that came across quite strongly. I also heard this thing about country level activity being specific for the, for the regions, being specific for the countries. And in the same context of that, empowering governments and working through governments, we hold them to account, and yet we're not, we're not giving them the wherewithal to do that. So I heard that too. Um, and in the same spirit, also actively looking for links. So this powerful comment about the about the food system made me think I heard variants of this in everybody. It's we should be looking for how food uh, fits with climate. We should be looking how chemist chemicals fit with climate. We should be looking actively for the connections. And this is something that maybe the EMG could think about convening some of those conversations to say, where are the nexuses where we can have the power? And I like that example of that seed within the food uh, group where, where different agencies are already trying to do that. And particularly, I want to know much more about this roadmap for 1.5 degrees and the SDGs and connecting them. Um, I heard about empowering and leveraging beyond governments, finance, not competing for finance, as well, but actually realizing that we're in this together. And leveraging our partners in business, that came up a couple of times, so that this is where the delivery arm and the leverage can be. Um, and so again, with, with some of those things, I think a more, a more time for a conversation, discussion about what that leverage might look like across the different groups will be powerful. Um, and then above all, we have the same mandate. We have the same mandate. We're trying to achieve the same thing so we can look for these nexuses within that mandate. That was an extraordinary rich discussion. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Hello. So can I invite my second panel up to the stage, please? And uh, Hussein, with great love. Hussein? Can someone poke him? <laughs> Hussein! Can I invite my second panelist up to the stage, please? So we again have another esteemed panel. We have Mustina Asaf, who's the United Nations Resident Coordinator for the UAE. 
We have Mr. Jorge Moreira da Silva, who is uh, Executive Director of the UN Office of uh, Project Services. We have, can I invite you all to come up, please? And if you're not speaking to be sitting down. We have um, uh, Pamela Coke Hamilton, who is Executive Director of the um, International Trade Center. We have Ms. Ginotza Puri, who is Associate Vice President, Strategy and Knowledge for the International Fund for Agriculture and Development. We have Mr. Gerno Laganda, who is Director of Climate and Disaster Risk Reduction Service at the World Food Programme. We have Mr. Vladimir Ryabibin, Ryabininen, who is Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO and Assistant Director General of UNESCO. We have Ms. Najat Mokhtar, who is Deputy Director General of the Department of Nuclear Sciences and Applications at the International Atomic Energy Agency. We have Ms. Arti Hala Maini, who is Director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. That's my personal favorite at the moment. And we have Mr. Andrew Harper, who is Special Advisor on Climate Action to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Okay, so if I can just invite you to. If we can get this going. All right. All right, we do need to start now, please. Um, I, I had a previous job herding cats, which makes me particularly well 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 suited for this. So again, would I, I'd like to ask you if you could introduce yourself and then say your comments about what 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 the challenges are, what the opportunities are in this space. Yes, I'm I'm your personal favourite. I'm the Aki oh. Holomaini, the director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. It's a great pleasure to meet everybody. I've only been in the post two months, so it's a particular pleasure to meet you for the first time. Um, we know there's a global climate crisis because we can see it from space. Uh, space systems are supporting climate action in multiple ways, but deployment of the solutions still depends on individual nations' uh, initiatives rather than in pursuit of a coordinated and concerted effort. And that's where the EMG can come in. Um, consider IUU fishing, unreported, illegal, uh, unregulated fishing. In Peru, there was a law put through which obliged uh, shipping boats to carry satellite equipment and to report on their catches. As a result, Peru saw that illegal fishing went from 300 to 40 boats in one year. But what happens? Those boats now sail to other shores. They sail all the way to China. So what are we doing for the environment there? So that's one example of where we need proper coordination to ensure that this kind of solution is understood, available, and deployed in every member state of the United Nations. Um, in terms of the challenges, space isn't just the photographer. When we walk around here, we see all these satellite images. It's like when we go to events, we see the tech support, we see the photographers. We are more than just the tech support. We are a major driver of sustainable development. Uh, space can help reduce carbon emissions from aviation. It can help reduce IUU fishing. It can help reduce deforestation, reduces the use of uh, fuel and pesticides. The list goes on and on, but it even helps reduce uh, the mortality rates resulting from a lack of preparedness, mitigation, and uh, adequate response to disasters. So USA, my office, we lead on UN space. That's the interagency coordination mechanism that brings together 33 agencies and entities that have, are concerned or, or want to use space technologies. I hope that by working together with EMG um, and UNEP in specific, specifically, we can really work to deepen the understanding of the space solutions that exist um, so that we're not just seen as a tech support, as I said, uh, that accompanies the work of other agencies and entities. I look forward to collaborating with you all. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. If you'd like to hand on. Are we morning or afternoon? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Good day, everybody. Um, my name is Dina Asaf. Uh, I'm the United Nations uh, Resident Coordinator here in the UAE. 
So therefore, my day-to-day -day job is the coordination of the United Nations. Lucky me. Uh, and so therefore, this uh, topic is relevant to the whole concept of the work of RCs and the goal that we have in bringing the UN together. I'll focus on two key points and an area of uh, collaboration I think we can improve that might be useful for our discussion. But from, from the UN's perspective and the role that I hold, and I've been working in coordination for over 12 years now, uh, in the area of climate change specifically, I think we need to ensure that our solutions are holistic. So when we talk about the SDGs, we all know that they're an integrated approach and we say it's holistic. So when we talk about UN agency collaboration, it mimics the same. We can't uh, focus just in one area or another, but it is that holistic approach which makes the United Nations strong. So this would be a, a very important priority for us to continue. I heard in the first panel the mention of the UN country team, which is what the resident coordinator leads, the UN country team. But for the UN country team to be effective, the agencies need to empower their representatives to ensure that collaboration can actually happen and it's not just uh, pure rhetoric. So we can do better. We can do better in ensuring that our agencies are uh, proactive in finding ways to engage together in a holistic manner. Secondly, on, uh, on this issue, I wanted to focus on localization. Uh, there, it's not a one approach for every country in the world. So we need to ensure that our UN country teams are able to customize their support to the local context and priorities of that country and not find just one cookie cutter approach that we expect to be for everyone. And finally, I'll just uh, stress an area of collaboration which I think is of particular importance. In the uh, first uh, panel, they spoke about data, et cetera. I would add to that the issue of partnerships and uh, collaboration around partnerships. As the United Nations, the key of what makes us uh, effective is not just our uh, expertise and what we know, but the networks of partners that we build and who we engage with, how we bring the rest of the world together, working with us. But within the UN system, we still have a siloed approach towards partnerships. So I say to all of us here, there's many of us, uh, first panel, second panel, maybe third panel, uh, different parts of the UN. Here in the UAE, we have 32 UN agencies working with the United Arab Emirates. But unfortunately, in my experience of five years in this country, agencies are unwilling to share information on partnerships uh, and how they can better collaborate together. So this is an area that I think, for example, from this COP28, uh, I would ask all of us here to make sure that we're trickling down that information and across, not just in our agency. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Jorge Moreira da Silva. I'm the executive director of UNOPS, just started seven months ago. I'm a, a COP veteran. I started at the age of 28 when I was a member of the European Parliament, starting at COP5, and in the last 24 years, coming to almost all COPs, uh, I think that the role of the UN uh, has been fundamental, inspiring change. So at this stage, I think that we need to bring the UN at its best because we need to leapfrog. And in this area, I think that we must start by filling some gaps. Uh, we don't have a UN um, agency dedicated to energy. But I think that there is no agency that is not working on, on energy. We are all working on energy. So I think that if we want to, to get net zero on energy, for sure, this can only be possible if we have a good coordination on, on energy. So I would, I would provide this first input. And I see lots of fragmentation and lots of competition and lots of overlaps and lots of missing elements. So I think that this element is crucial. The second, it's about the nexus. We have all this uh, nice branding about humanitarian development peace nexus, but this cannot be dealt in isolation. We need to uh, link much better the climate agenda with humanitarian, with the development and with peace. See what's happening in Gaza, the conversation about fuel, uh, when uh, obviously if we would have Gaza relying more on solar energy, we would not be facing the issues that are now being faced. So I think it's fundamental that when we address humanitarian peace development, that we integrate uh, climate, 
uh, at the core. Third, we need to align all development cooperation with climate action. And we have a huge responsibility, colleagues. So 40% of all ODA goes through multilateral agencies. In the last six years, I was leading the DAC secretary. And this number is not only being consistent, but it's increasing, which means that we have a huge obligation, a huge responsibility in making a good use of the 40%. 40% it's 80 billion, 80, 80 billion. We are missing four to six uh, trillion uh, a year, we know. So, but the 80 billion can be catalytic. In this area, I think that we have to assume responsibilities in our own emissions. Uh, and this means that not just the 45% reduction by 2030, the net zero beyond before 2050, but going to the scope three. So I think that we should stop hesitating on the scope three and aligning ourselves into making commitments on scope three. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Liliana Anawatsu Jacob from the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, speaking for the Executive Secretary. Um, I think a lot has been said and done already, so I'm not going to repeat, but I very much like the story of the regional specificities, the, the story of the local specificities. But let me also highlight that actually with climate change, we are closer than we all think. Um, the problems are shared problems. When we talk about dust storms in Europe, something I never thought I would ever talk about, sandstorms in, in Finland, something I would have never thought I would ever mention. We are getting closer to Dubai than, than we think. Um, another story um, in that holistic approach, which I think is totally pertinent in, 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 this, in this kind of collaboration, is also to include the cities include the very, very local level. Mm -hmm. What can we do there? Because a lot of us will be living in cities and more of us will be living in cities soon. Um, very important and close to our heart at UNEC. Um, I heard a lot about data and um, I work very much with forests and particularly outer space, digital data, um, satellite data. What about foresight? What about horizon scanning? I mean, I think this is something that EMG could definitely take up more. Let's see what happens, modeling. This, these are expensive um, approaches that, for example, we as an agency have difficulties um, you know, bearing the costs ourselves, but we could all do this together. We have the strength, we have the force. And uh, I think this could definitely be something. And the other thing I very much liked and we very much support is working very much closer with the member states. We are an intergovernmental process agency where we can only exist because our member states tell us mm -hmm. we can exist. So definitely include them. There is expertise out there. There's a lot of knowledge out there. And I think we can really, really build on that. Thank Brilliant. you very much. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I'm Najat Mokhtar. I'm the Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So we are science-based, we are technology-based. We offer atoms for climate. And we are working with most of you, FAO, ITU, uh, UNESCO, and many. But there is room to do much more because uh, I think with this planetary crisis, um, we cannot forget science and technology. And we need to scale up what we have developed and what we had the proof of concept. Uh, we, uh, at the agency, we have the biggest data on precipitations. We have developed technologies for climate smart agriculture to measure ocean acidification, blue carbon, um, uh, manage uh, or underground water or soil mapping in agriculture. So all this can be used with many of you and it's time to scale up it's time to really work together and use how we can complement each other. We, we heard about data, we heard, we heard about, but I think science technology uh, can be used not only at lab level, but at country level, scale it for more impact. And we are ready to, to work with you on this. And I think EMG is really uh, need to be strengthened in that sense to uh, really look at what works and scale it up. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Andrew Harper, Special Advisor of the High Commissioner on, on Refugees, and um, it's great to be next to Gurno because I think I'd, I'd like to push back a bit in terms of the silos because I think, like, operational agencies, we've got no choice but to work together. Um, like, we're working in some of the most fragile, conflict-affected areas in the world, and 
we've got, it just doesn't make sense not to start pooling our resources together, having common offices, having pooled vehicles, um, because we can't afford it. We just do not receive the funding that's required to address our, our needs. So we either work together or we'll become increasingly um, irrelevant because we won't be able to deliver what we what we require. So it's not, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think the UN's got the answers to the issues that we're being faced with. So like banding together is great, but we have to be expanding our partnerships so that we can recognize what the challenges are, but investing in those people who are the best in class. And you mentioned foresight. Like if we're talking about foresight, then we need to be looking at the research institutes that are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in these areas uh, with CGIR or with, with Potsdam Institute uh, or of Columbia. And we get them as, as key elements there. But in terms of UNHCR specific, um, we're, we're fully committed because we've got 550 officers that will not be viable if we continue to run on diesel. Um, it, it's about walking the talk. We've got 6,000 vehicles, which are mainly diesel. We've got another 7,000 diesel generators. So it, it's not only good for the environment, it also makes the business case, the business sense. So if another agency has got a, the business model to support the trans, for transition from diesel to renewables, and we'll go for it. But it's probably got to be based on the private sector because we're not very good at creating a sustainable response, uh, which is long-term. So, um, so we're working with WFP, uh, we're working with UNICEF, we're working with ICRC um, to do better jobs. Like just to give you one example, we, we distribute about four to five million blankets per year. Um, we're, we're now making sure that 100% of those blankets are, are using recycled plastic. Like, and it's actually cheaper. And they're, they're not losing strength or warmth. So there are simple things that we can do if we invest in it. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Gernot. I work with the World Food Program. And when you see the trucks of the World Food Program or the trucks of UNHCR rolling, then we have already had a collective failure, a failure to predict, failure to protect, a failure of foresight. And uh, when we discuss what is actually the, the current uh, issue that, that we have sleepless nights over, it's basically the people that now live in an area of loss and damage. It's COP28, 28 years of constantly climbing uh, emission trajectories. Um, adaptation gap report said 21 billion, which is only a 10th to a 15th to what is necessary. And we seem to still be waiting about more financing, which is never gonna come. So I would also like to reiterate that we need to become more effective hmm. working with the financing that is already in the system. The world is fragmented in the humanitarian financing, development financing, climate financing, and other thematic pockets. And that uh, fragmentation drives sometimes also fragmentation of programs in the field. And I think as a UN family, we need to be cognizant of this fragmentation we see we need to build more integrated programs so that we can protect these folks who do not have the luxury to wait until international finance mechanisms are reformed or loss and damage financing is there at a commensurate level so my number one priority my one number one ask for all of us would be let's work a little bit more innovatively in, in an integrative manner on the sequencing and combination of different finding sources we, financing sources we have available at the UN country team level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am Vladimir Ibinin. I am executive secretary of the Intergovernmental Geographic Commission of UNESCO, also assistant director general of UNESCO. RTU, uh, th th two months uh, in your job, right? I'm three months before my retirement, so I can tell you the truth. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, uh, let me first speak uh, about the ocean. You know, ocean basically is a sick, is a sick patient. Uh, the sick patient has many diseases. The good news is that the sick patient is uh, treated by many doctors. The bad news is that doctors do not speak to each other. Okay. We need to cure the patient rather than to treat the diseases. And there are ways of doing this. So uh, first of all, 
uh, many organizations come through United Nations Oceans and dimensions of climate, biodiversity, economy, they all come together. They, they're all dependent on science. IUC is developing the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And it turned into the largest undertaking in the history of ocean sciences ever. And it is revolutionary science, not only kind of technical, but also quite social uh, with ethical dimensions, programs like empathy in the ocean, like leadership of women in the ocean, young uh, early career ocean professionals. So we're really changing the situation. And I think I invite you to cooperate uh, with the science and then benefit uh, uh, through the decade of ocean science in your own job. Now speaking about UNESCO, uh, UNESCO is about also education, science and culture. So we run our world heritage sites, biospheric reserves uh, uh, and, and many other things. And this is where we develop the science, we develop the data, we develop also the capacity to teach people how to live in harmony with Mother Nature. And we basically offering to you that enormous potential of all these sites uh, so you can uh, work with us on this and address together climate and biodiversity. But you know, we won't be able to do it unless we change the minds of people. That's exactly one of the most important elements of the UNESCO institution, changing minds of people. And I think uh, if we add, add to this, work on uh, education, uh, category two chairs, institutes, then uh, changing culture, also bringing ethical perspective, bringing indigenous and local perspective, then there will be some seeds of growth that will be contributing both to climate, biodiversity, and many other things that we would like to improve. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. A round of applause for our panelists, please. Um, I, I promise you we didn't fix this. We actually made sure that each panel had a, a, a sufficiently wide range of different agencies. But what I found fascinating there, did you hear it too, is that the first panel was setting out some of the things that needed to happen. And this panel was actually talking more about the how, actually how you go about it. So the specific, and it's not necessarily the solutions because we still need to make the how happen. And I think that's where the, where the ENG might come in. But here's what I heard. So I heard, I heard a lot about science this time. We heard about data before, but this time we were hearing about science and we were hearing about the, the power of that. But also what I heard was the other agencies don't know what I have to offer. I have things that you can use. And I heard that from several different people at this panel. And that's, that's powerful. Also, um, not just we should, we should work around country teams, but how do we empower the country teams and actually give them the mandate to collaborate rather than just saying let's do it with the country teams that's another how um also it's not just us the agencies connecting but it's connecting how we do our partnerships i heard that a lot on this particular panel and different kinds of partnerships in the first panel there was talk about finance and business and so on but it got that discussion got a lot richer and, and deeper here the kinds of partnerships that we could connect in our in our work with that go beyond finance and business i heard you know academic institutions science the potsdam institute places like that and if you have different relationships maybe that could be a better coordination too um, and then I heard this thing about education, hearts and minds and a coordinated narrative. And that's maybe one of the areas that this could be most important. Um, I'm going to go in a moment to a little bit of a discussion. We have a little bit of time to do that. But the, the one quote that I also wanted to highlight from this discussion was, with climate change, we are all closer than we think. With climate change, we're all closer than we think. It's not sustainable to operate in the silos that currently exist. It's great to celebrate the ones that don't but it's not sustainable to operate in the ones that currently do. So thank you very much to all the panelists if I'd like to invite you to step up there. So now we have a few minutes to discuss that. I've, I've set out um, what, what I, I summarized, what I heard from those things, uh, but do we have a roving microphone? Do we have a microphone that can... Um, that can go around. So uh, we have some discussants that are here in the room who, who, who I'd like to call on now. Who would like to make a comment or an observation about this? So shall I come forward? Maybe that people can see. I think maybe because we'll pass it around. Yeah, so okay. Thank you so much. So um, I'm Edel Günther, United Nations University, and I have two solutions to present. One regarding data. We just launched a sustainability nexus analytics, informatics, and data program where we already collected 181 tools 
If you want to find it online, currently it's sustainabilityaid.net. We will move to the UNU website soon or reach out to me. And the second solution is we is uh, regarding the country level work. We uh, got funding from the German Academic Exchange Service for 64 doctor students. And we partner here with UNDCO. And if you work for one of the country teams, come to me and we can partner and we can finance a student for three and a half years that then works with you on a very specific topic. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so who else has an observation here? Can, can someone else take this microphone around for me, please? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Delila Hamu, Director of External Relations at the World Intellectual Property Organization. I think we have heard one or two mentioning innovation, mentioning uh, technology. I think that the power of harne uh, harnessing technology to reduce, I think, the, the climate burden is very, very important. WIPO has a database that has more than uh, 124,000 technologies available uh, to use. And uh, the, the, we have also the needs of 140 countries because we were talking about the importance of also involving member states in this conversation. Uh, I think that this initiative is excellent. There's a lot that we have heard today. Mm -hmm. Let's work together. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe create synergies, see how we can come together. For example, my organization, we don't have financing problems. We have the technology available to be used. Let's use it. And I think this is will make really a difference in the, tackling the burden of uh, climate change. Thank okay, you. thank you. So what we've heard there straight away, we heard about uh, the possible an option for data. We heard an, about an option for uh, for empowering, for working with uh, nation states. Um, oh, I'd like to hear any other observations about what the EMG can do. This is the question. What can the EMG do to, to actually um, uh, resolve some of the issues that we had? Um, Great. Thank you and welcome everybody. My name is Ben Schachter. I coordinate the work of the United Nations Human Rights Office on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, and we're very happy to co-lead um, along with UNEP and UNDP, an issue management group, so a work stream on the right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment um, under the United Nations Environment Management Group. And that's what I wanna talk about uh, very briefly is the right to a healthy environment as a solution and human rights-based approaches as a solution. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its sixth assessment report stated very clearly and unequivocally that rights-based approaches lead to more effective and sustainable outcomes for people on the planet. So not only are human rights legally binding, morally and ethically required things that need to be complied with, laws, they're actually more effective policy. Yeah. So, so just, just a, as a quick question, so so what could the EMG do to help coordinate in that context, to, uh, specifically around climate? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so what we are doing, in fact, is through the EMG, we've been coordinating joint UN system messaging on human rights and working to integrate human rights uh, through our advocacy and in different COP decisions and outcomes. Uh, working to advocate for integration of rights in nationally determined contributions at the country level. And um, we have tomorrow, in fact, a one UN system side event organized uh, in the, the under the umbrella of the issue management group on human rights and environment and side event room two on human rights and climate justice. So we'd really welcome you all to join us there. But, but if I may just very briefly, uh, what, I, what I want to say is that human rights, they're in the Paris Agreement. They need to be operationalized. And everything you heard today from every single UN agency 
touched on somebody's rights. We're talking about people. We're not talking about gigatons of carbon. We're talking about real human suffering. And if people in these rooms in these spaces don't get it and they don't talk about it and they don't ensure that people can come here, that they can participate, that they're safe and secure, they can say what they believe, what they feel and what they need, then we are not doing our job and we are not protecting people's rights and we're not sure. going to protect the planet. So environmental defenders, last thing, there are so many being killed every week. And one of the things the EMG IMG just did is put out new guidance on protecting environmental human rights defenders to so support our UN country teams in doing so. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, yes, I will. And just very briefly, we have a lot. Yeah, of I will be brief. Thank you so much. My name is Chizu Raoki. I come from the Global Environment Facility. It's the vertical fund that the World Bank mentioned. Yes. We're actually a financial mechanism for this particular convention as well as five other conventions, including the, the Stockholm Convention that uh, Rolf talked about. So um, one thing I noticed today, is, and I guess it was a little bit implicit, is that uh, we were talking about the triple planetary crisis, but we didn't really talk about integrated solutions that would touch upon nature and climate. And investing in nature will actually have dividends for climate. Investing in climates would actually have dividends for nature. And that, I think, is something that really needs to come across very strongly. And, um, and there were some discussions on how to use the available resources more effectively. And we really would like to see the resources that Jeff can provide as the financial integrator for a lot of issues that are integrated in nature that you know some of the uh, agencies are working with. So um, our sort of proposal for the EMG is that we also heard that every Every institution here has a mandate to address climate change, but your sub-mandates as well as your area of expertise is actually different. Someone talking about data, someone talking about setting up legal instruments, someone talking about capacity building, some are also talking about something else. So can EMG play a little bit more of a coordinating role so that there is less fragmentation in the approach in the UN-wide system, and that could be done at the highest level of uh, leadership. So there is clear signals being sent. And at the same time, there has to be the engagement of countries as to what they would like the UN system to do. And that could actually be done through the country programming or UN country, uh, UN country uh, teams or any other country-led programs that the, the different conventions are supporting that we're also a part of actually uh, trying to facilitate. So those are the elements I wanted to highlight. Absolutely Thanks. brilliant, thank you. I'm starting to see a pattern here and I do love to see patterns. Do you want to come back here? Thank you. I'm Mustafa Kamal. I'm director of the uh, Just Transition Program at the International Labour Organization. I think we all know that climate change impacts on people, on workers and enterprises. So what it means is that there is a critical social dimension in the decarbonization agenda. And this is, again, what the IPCC says in the last assessment report, that social justice, just transition, are enablers of both mitigation and adaptation. So we think that in the work program here, there's a discussion on, on just transition. Uh, the EMG could try to pull together efforts on this social dimension of the ecological transition that will tackle issues of labor. You know, there's a big um, ask by trade unions. They are you know, driving their own agenda. There's some issues with enterprises, but we are very clear. There is a positive narrative. Ambition on climate is not a job killer. It will generate more jobs, but I think that narrative on just transition and the social dimension, we need to make it clear, it make it sound, and, and the EMG could help bring together you know, agencies that deal with that social dimension. These human rights is also linked, but, but that's a broader agenda on the social dimensions of the, the, the climate agenda. Brilliant, thank, thank you. you. The ideas are coming so thick and fast, my, my hands are getting sore. And then we'll continue. I'm, I'm grateful to go after Mustafa. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Hendricks. I'm the ASG and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women in our program policy and intergovernmental work. And my thinking around what could the EMG do really is uh, building from this point of the social dimension. Um, and certainly it is around how we can collectively call for more gender responsive climate action. 
and leverage the power and the voice of the EMG in that regard. I've brought with me four quick priorities um, of how the EMG's voice could be shaped. And the first one really is just to echo Mustafa's last point. And that is in our acknowledgement of just transitions, as we shape that from a gender lens, let's do so looking at women's rights and access to decent work and so, the so interconnections with labor. I'm so sorry to jump in, but can you go quickly? Because we're, we're, we're being told we're going to be thrown out of the room. So we've got one more person to go. Um, and I will keep the other three points for another time. Tell, tell, us, tell, tell us quickly. Sure, tell us quickly. Anna, the second And um, the third point was on data. So the second point was on? Care and the first point was on care and data. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I am Leah Lam from WHO uh, World Health Organization, <laughs> Assistant Director General. So first of all, I'm very grateful that we're together, not because of COVID, because of climate. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize two points. One, EMG has to be very seriously about country focus. Country focus. Empower your country team role. Strengthen the horizontal connection. I myself serve as WHO representative. I know how that could work well. And a lot of legacy we learn from the COVID we can improve. Secondly, sense of urgency. We talk about crisis, climate crisis is a health crisis, but also crisis for others. But we are not exercising the crisis management mood. Our mindset not yet there. So we have to be ahead of curve, sure. in particularly country level. I fully support we need to empower your resident coordinator role to connect all of us. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and speaking of a sense of urgency, uh, we, we have to stop now, I'm afraid. So we'll, Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And giving the sense of urgency, I will be <laughs> extremely brief. We're the, uh, the UNCCD, the Convention to Combat Desertification. We're the voice on land in the UN system. And we are a huge part of the climate solution. We definitely would like to have greater collaboration on two key issues, drought resilience, which we're seeing through the International Drought Resilience Alliance, and the second one on the goal that we all have to restore land between now and 2030 to sustain our planet. Thank you again. Brilliant, thank you. Hello everybody, Gautam Narasimhan from UNICEF. The EMG has a critical role in addressing the trust deficit that the world has in the United Nations system. Great one. The United Nations, we are facing a trust deficit right now. People do not believe that we as a UN family have the solutions to address the impacts upon the most vulnerable. The UN system is the best that we have, however. Similarly, the EMG is amongst the best that we have in bringing the UN agencies together. So we would very much like it if the UN, if the EMG could help create, create and maintain a platform for adaptation solutions that address the needs of the most vulnerable. Ourselves in UNICEF, of course, we work with so many of you. We work on social sectors and on education and reducing our own, but we need finance, we need data, we need so many of the other things that people here contribute. Brilliant, thank you. So in great haste, in great haste, I'm gonna try and summarize all of that, imagine that, wish me luck. But I would say that anybody who had something to offer to suggest about what the EMG could do, who didn't have a chance to say everything or even to say it at all, Please tell us, we want to hear, the point of this was not just to have a discussion now, but to make a work program. This is actually about, you're going to have to come through on what you're promising. Um, guys, guys, the, Hussein, you need to hear this because this is going to be your job, so you need to be listening to this bit. So um, this is actually the brief that I was given in moderating this panel, this extraordinary panel of extraordinary people, was this is about a work program. Not just saying this is what's needed, but this is how, how to do it, but what the EMG is actually going to do next year and in the convenings. And what I heard in that last session, I heard uh, about, I, I mean, I'm glad we had the brilliant gender balance in the panels, but I heard about gender, I heard about people, I heard about social issues, I heard about climate justice. That came out so much more strongly in, in, in the people coming up at this last bit. It was about people, it's all about people, and we forget that at our peril. And, and actually addressing the trust deficit that's something that hadn't come up, but I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, coming from outside the UN system, there is an immense trust deficit. Nobody believes you can do this, but everybody needs you to. 
Nobody believes you can do this, but everybody needs you to. So watch this space. There's going to be a whole bunch of new convenings with more time to address these issues and to dig into them in detail. And the EMG really wants to be at the heart of that. So I'm going to finish by saying thank you to everybody who's spoken. And just to remind everybody, um, I'm going to hand over to Hussein, who is going to say no words at all <laughs> about thank you for coming because he's too busy preparing for next year. But what I, I want to finish up with is just another very serious point. This really matters. This could not matter more. It's not a game. We know that it's not a game, but this really matters. And I think I want to remind you, I told you I was going to, what we heard at the very beginning, those quotes at the very beginning, which is the UN Secretary General requires that agencies work hand in hand to do this lift together. It will take us all. We hold this coordination. The EMG holds this coordination in trust for the whole system. And when the whole UN system lifts, we lift in strength. I wish you, I, I wish you strength, ladies and gentlemen, in your endeavor, and I'll be watching it all the way. Thank you very much. There's nothing quite like seeing a healthy coral reef. The amount of life is unbelievable. These are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Coral reefs as an ecosystem cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but they support 25% of all marine life and keep the ocean healthy, which is essential to all life on Earth. It used to be the case that only individual species were threatened with extinction, not entire ecosystems but climate change has completely changed the game. In the case of coral reefs, it's an ecosystem that's home to thousands of species, which in turn provide food and income for hundreds of millions of people. We have an initiative for effective implementation, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, as well as agreed targets and tools to scale action through the Coral Reef Breakthrough. Now, we just need the will. Let's be the first generation ever to save an entire ecosystem for people and the planet. Now, let's get on with it. There's nothing quite like seeing a healthy coral reef. The amount of life is unbelievable. These are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Coral reefs as an ecosystem cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, 
but they support 25% of all marine life and keep the ocean healthy, which is essential to all life on Earth. It used to be the case that only individual species were threatened with extinction, not entire ecosystems. But climate change has completely changed the game. In the case of coral reefs, it's an ecosystem that's home to thousands of species, which in turn provide food and income for hundreds of millions of people. We have an initiative for effective implementation, the Global Fund Coral Reefs, as well as agreed targets and tools to scale action through the Coral Reef Breakthrough. Now, we just need the will. Let's be the first generation ever to save an entire ecosystem for people and the planet. Now, let's get on with it. There's nothing quite like seeing a healthy coral reef. The amount of life is unbelievable. These are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Coral reefs as an ecosystem cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but they support 25% of all marine life and keep the ocean healthy, which is essential to all life on Earth. It used to be the case that only individual species were threatened with extinction, not entire ecosystems. But climate change has completely changed the game. In the case of coral reefs, it's an ecosystem that's home to thousands of species, which in turn provide food and income for hundreds of millions of people. We have an initiative for effective implementation, the Global Fund Coral Reefs, as well as agreed targets and tools to scale action through the Coral Reef Breakthrough. Now, we just need the will. Let's be the first generation ever to save an entire ecosystem for people and the planet. Now, let's get on with it. There's nothing quite like seeing a healthy coral reef. The amount of life is unbelievable. These are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Coral reefs as an ecosystem cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but they support 25% of all marine life and keep the ocean healthy, which is essential to all life on Earth. It used to be the case that only individual species were threatened with extinction, not entire ecosystems. But climate change has completely changed the game. In the case of coral reefs, it's an ecosystem that's home to thousands of species, which in turn provide food and income for hundreds of millions of people. We have an initiative for effective implementation, the Global Fund Coral Reefs, as well as agreed targets and tools to scale action through the Coral Reef Breakthrough. Now, we just need the will. Let's be the first generation ever to save an entire ecosystem for people and the planet. Now, let's get on with it. There's nothing quite like seeing a healthy coral reef. The amount of life is unbelievable. These are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Coral reefs as an ecosystem cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but they support 25% of all marine life and keep the ocean healthy, which is essential to all life on Earth. It used to be the case that only individual species were threatened with extinction, not entire ecosystems but climate change has completely changed the game. In the case of coral reefs, it's an ecosystem that's home to thousands of species, which in turn provide food and income for hundreds of millions of people. We have an initiative for effective implementation, the Global Fund Coral Reefs, as well as agreed targets and tools to scale action through the Coral Reef Breakthrough. Now, we just need the will. Let's be the first generation ever to save an entire ecosystem for people and the planet. Now, let's get on with it. There's nothing quite like seeing a healthy coral reef. The amount of life is unbelievable. These are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Coral reefs as an ecosystem cover less than 1% of the ocean floor but they support 25% of all marine life and keep the ocean healthy, which is essential to all life on Earth. 
It used to be the case that only individual species were threatened with extinction, not entire ecosystems. But climate change has completely changed the game. In the case of coral reefs, it's an ecosystem that's home to thousands of species by food and income for hundreds of millions of people. We have an initiative for effective implementation, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, as well as agreed targets and tools to scale action through the Coral Reef Breakthrough. Now, we just need the will. Let's be the first generation ever to save an entire ecosystem for people and the planet. Now, let's get on with it. There's nothing quite like seeing a healthy coral reef. The amount of life is unbelievable. These are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Coral reefs as an ecosystem cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but they support 25% of all marine life and keep the ocean healthy, which is essential to all life on Earth. It used to be the case that only individual species were threatened with extinction, not entire ecosystems, but climate change has completely changed the game. In the case of coral reefs, it's an ecosystem that's home to thousands of species, which in turn provide food and income for hundreds of millions of people. We have an initiative for effective implementation, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, as well as agreed targets and tools to scale action through the Coral Reef Breakthrough. Now, we just need the will. Let's be the first generation ever to save an entire ecosystem for people and the planet. Now, let's get on with it.
Your Excellencies, friends, colleagues, good afternoon and welcome to our Blue Ecosystems Day here at the UNEP Pavilion. Today, I have a great honor to welcome you to this important launch of the Coral Reef Breakthrough, the latest addition to the tremendously important initiative being taken by the UN Climate Change High Level Champions in collaboration with so many of our very best scientific community. Now, when we think about a breakthrough, a breakthrough is essentially the moment that marks a significant advance in the transformation of an economic sector or a natural environment. It's achieving a breakthrough is really truly only possible when actors converge together with clarity, a clear set of simple goals. The 2030 breakthroughs identify where further coordination is needed and urgently galvanize public and private action behind globally significant issues. Each breakthrough establishes an accountability framework. So it's very clear that there's an annual review and dedicated cycle to track the developments towards these goals. Now, recently launched ocean breakthroughs put specific targets on things like marine conservation, offshore renewable energy, ocean-based transportation, and things like aquatic foods and aquaculture. And we have also now two ecosystem-specific breakthroughs, previously on mangroves, and now today with pride, we launch the Coral Reef Breakthrough. These breakthroughs will bring more granularity more accountability and more transparency to achieving our goals, as well as applying to existing targets like the GBF, like the NDCs, like the SDGs. It's really an exciting moment. And I congratulate the climate change high level champions and the numerous UNEP partners, the International Coral Reef Initiative, and of course the Global Fund for Coral Reefs for this tremendous game changing achievement. And it is game changing game changing because 2030 breakthroughs really identify where further coordination is needed and they put science at the foundation of action. For coral reefs, we know we need 30% of our ocean ecosystems protected and restored by 2030. We need a diversity of voices from indigenous groups, local communities, and youth. These voices must be prominent. And we need traditional knowledge helping to guide decision-making. The IPCC report shows that a 1.5 degree rise will already mean the disappearance of 70 to 90% of reefs. And it's staggering. At two degrees, we're talking about 99% of reef loss. At the present, we're underfinanced and we're underprepared, but initiatives like the Global Fund for Coral Reefs are paving the way to deliver more finance. Co-founded by UNEP and the public-private coalition, it's working hard to leverage innovative finance to create truly reef positive solutions, solutions that matter with impact. The grant fund has already raised about 90 million US dollars. The investment fund has raised about 130 million US dollars with ambition to raise to 725 million over the next 10 years between the two funds, at the same time leveraging billions in co-finance. Now this is focused on blended finance in a portfolio of 23 coral nations that globally are hosting some of the Earth's most resilient coral reefs that are very important in terms of the future of coral. Today's event celebrates the launch of not just another initiative, but the global reef breakthrough is grounded by measurable, achievable goals for collective conservation, protection, and restoration of coral reefs at a scale. And its key action points include addressing local drivers of economic of ecosystem degradation, doubling the area of coral reef under protection, accelerating restoration efforts, and securing investments from public and private sources. With the 2030 Coral Reef Breakthrough, we truly have a beacon of hope for the future of coral. And this actually matters. 
because we can't think that just out of sight can be out of mind. Coral reefs matter too much. They matter too much to all of us. They harbor 25% of marine life. And they, even though they cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, scientific advancement has been able to help put the value on some of the goods and services that we get from our planet's reefs, including things like tourism, fisheries, coastal protection, medicine. Um, there's an estimation of $2.7 trillion per year of benefits and about 500 million people drawing benefits from these reefs. Not to mention adaptation and resilience. The engineering models show how coral reefs are masters examples where we can use them as nature-based solutions by forming natural barriers that dissipate as much as 27% of the incidental wave energy. They're protecting shorelines from waves, from storms, from floodwaters, from erosion, from all of the extreme events that we're expecting to become more prominent with climate change. And they help prevent loss of life, property damage, and more ecosystem degradation. The impacts of coastal flooding we know are only gonna get worse during this century, both from population growth as well as climate change. And so protecting the integrity of reefs isn't just something that's nice to do, nice to have, it's, it's a must have. And so as we gather at this pivotal moment in history where we have now the knowledge, we know how to do this. We know how to protect and restore the interconnected blue ecosystem upon which we all rely. We know it will take the will of leaders, civil society, the citizens in this room and those in the halls for COP28 to be that moment when we decided to save the planetary scale ecosystems, again, these are the ones we depend on. On behalf of UNEP, I'm delighted to support this important breakthrough to safeguard our planet's critical blue ecosystems and cultivate a sustainable climate resilient future. I look very much forward to hearing the views of all of our distinguished speakers on these important coral reef breakthrough and on the key actions taking place to achieve its targets and importantly, how we all join forces together to preserve coral reefs for ourselves and future generations. Thank you. It's now a pleasure to hand over the podium to Leticia Carvajal, who is uh, UNEP's head of the marine and freshwater work, and she'll be leading us through uh, the rest of the sessions. Thank you. So good day, everybody, depending on where you are. I know we have this room really packed, but also a great audience uh, in our virtual space. So welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Suzlin, uh, for your leadership uh, and personally for your mentorship. So you are one of the brave female leader leaders in our, in our system, in the international system, pushing this topic forward. I'm really appreciative. So now again, I'm Leticia Carvalho. I am head of Marine Freshwater Branch. I have the pleasure to work in UNAP ecosystem under Susan's leadership. I'm oceanographer from Brazil. The ocean is of course near and dear to my heart and my work. I'm so pleased to be with you today to introduce our first and highly distinguished group of speakers representing the, global, the globe and important ocean states. So first, I would like to invite to the floor, Mrs. Uh, Ana Paula Pratis, Ministerio do Meio Ambiente e Mudança do Clima, Minister of en Environment and Climate Change of Brazil. And I'm speaking in Portuguese because this is my old friend as well. <laughs> Ana Paula is Director of uh, Ocean and Coastal Zone Management at the Minister of Environment. So I'm also very pleased to invite here at His Excellency Stephen, Stephen Victor, Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Environmental of Palau.
Uh, sir, I would like to invite the Honorable Linda Tabuya, Minister of Ministry of Women, Children and Social Protection of Fiji. And finally, I hope my colleagues are giving me the right signals that we have all of our speakers in the room. I would like to invite uh, the Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell, MP, Minister of State in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, UK. I'm very pleased you made it. So just a little second or minute of your patience to get all the miking done and all of our speakers well settled. So our boat will start to sail. Let me start with you, Mrs. Ana Paula Pratis. Let me take the opportunity to commend Brazil that hosts the, hosts the most, most rich and extensive area of coral reefs in the South Atlantic Ocean for its efforts through the GFCR, particularly regarding the program Nossos Corais, or Our Corals, to restore and protect the country's exceptional coral reef formations. I'm very pleased to be able to announce this here. Also allowed me to uh, congratulate for you to be the custodians of a very precious geography, the blue Amazon, that perhaps is not so visible as the green Amazon, but is there and we know very well. Also, of course, I'm delighted for Brazil's upcoming role as president of the G20 and the Ocean 20, that is pretty high in the agenda of this group of countries, particularly on the way to UN Ocean Conference 3. And we at UNEP stand ready to support in all ways we can. With that, I would like to invite you to take the floor. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leticia. It's a very pleasure to be here with you and the elders and uh, talk about the coral reef breakthrough because it's so important for us that we live in the passion with marine ecosystem. And I'm very pleased with you. Uh, my colleague, Brazilian colleague in the Ministry of the Environment. So um, Brazil is noted, uh, as Leticia uh, said before, for its enormous diversity of marine environments and the species, and for having the largest uh, continuous areas of mangroves in the northeast of Brazil and the only coral reef ecosystem in the South Atlantic, which give us a great responsibility as a country. In addition, we have a large expanse of corals at the mouth of the Amazon River, as the Leticia told before, with an estimated size of around 1,000 kilometers in a continuous line, and approximately 9,000 kilometer, square kilometers in area, concentrating a unique diversity of fishes, coral, algae, and spawns, as well as other marine uh, organisms, of course. These corals have the unique characteristics of being a transition zone between Caribbean and Amazonian fauna, and are under pressure from the exploitation of fossil fuels. Do the Brazil's significant leadership and enforces in action in the ocean climate nexus, we decide to create the Department of Ocean and Coastal Management if we, within the Ministry of the Environment, which has been working to include the ocean fully and permanently in the national climate change policy, rebuild the agendas for conservation and sustainable use, of the most vulnerable ecosystems, such as mangroves and coral reef. We are drawing up the National Coral Reef Conservation Strategy, promoting monitoring follow-up 
of reef ecosystem of the Brazilian coast and setting up a coral reef monitoring network in the country, as well as preparing for the next major blanching event is do it take place in the South Atlantic, probably in the coming summer, next, next January. Brazil also was returning this particip participating in the ICRI and the next president, and as the next president of G v G20, we have joined the global platform for accelerating uh, coral reef research and development, CORDAP. As Brazil G20 president, we will continue the important work that starts in Indonesia and follow up by India on ocean protection by emphasizing the importance of marine special planning. We support the 2030 Coral Reef Breakthrough Initiative as an opportunity to scale up actions to strengthen conservation, foster funding for coral reef protection, and call of global leaders to join their force to recognize the key gaps and actions that is needed on a global scale to maintain and conserve coral reefs and coastal communities. And finally, I would like to announce that Brazil recognize coral reef ecosystem as a critical ecosystem that are in risk due to the climate crisis and other anthropogenic extras, support the proposal of resolution forward by ICRI for consideration at the sixth se section of the United Nations Environment Assembly, UNEA 6, in Nairobi next year. This initiative opened an opportunity for everyone to benefit from coordination actions that advance, including funding strategies for the management, protection, conservation, and sustainable use of the ecosystem of the coastal marine system, especially coral reefs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ana Paula. These are very meaningful steps uh, for at the sake of the coral reef breakthrough. Uh, with that, I would like now to turn to His Excellency Stephen Victor that has been with us before today, uh, Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Environment of the Republic of Palau to take the floor and give us your messages. Uh, first, let me just mention Palau Coral's reef, uh, reefs host a diverse assortment of marine species and have survived several bleaching events over the past decades, one of the most resilient in the world. We want you for your actions. We thank you for your actions and we want you to continue to protect your blue ecosystems from hosting the Our Oceans Conference in 2022 to welcoming a GFCR program to, con to conserve near shore marine resources through innovative blended finances, financial approaches. We are very happy when we see your projects coming to the GFCR. We also heard yesterday that Palau uh, already has 80%, 80 percent percent uh, of your marine environmental areas uh, protected. So clearly you are leading the way on achieving the global biodiversity framework and demonstrating leadership on ocean and climate nexus. I invite you to speak and share with us amazing big steps that the big ocean state of Palau is taking. The floor is yours, Minister. Thank you, uh, Leticia, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. I'm uh, very happy to uh, share uh, a panel with which is very gender balanced uh, because I think that is what is uh, needed to address uh, the climate crisis that we're all facing today. We need inclusive leadership on climate and on ocean. We're all here because uh, we know and we believe in the importance of uh, coral reef ecosystems and the ocean. So I will spare you the uh, singing to the choir, but focus on what Palau has done that has brought us uh, to where we are today and hope that can inspire uh, others uh, to replicate what we've done in Palau and Micronesia and the Pacific. 1998 was a defining moment for conservation in Palau. And I'm sure you all know that it was the, the year that uh, we first 
saw a record of elevated temperature in Palawan waters. The reefs turned white, and many of our fishermen were wondering what has happened to our reefs. It's nothing that they've ever seen before. Uh, and so they thought that was the end of coral reefs as they knew it. And they depend on uh, fisheries for livelihood. So that was a, a very much a concern to them. So following that, Palau uh, passed a legislation that uh, would put uh, in place a protected areas network calling for 30% protection of our uh, coral reefs as well as 20% protection of our terrestrial system. Today, we've protected fully no take about 30% of our coral reefs and putting over 85% under effective management. And we've protected 18% of our terrestrial systems. And this is not simply because of government, it's because of what I talk about as inclusive leadership, communities, government, non-governmental organizations that came together and tried to address uh, a problem. We didn't uh, sort of understand where the problem uh, stemmed from. We knew the problem existed and we needed to address it. And so we brought everyone together to figure out how to address it. So that was a, a milestone success for Palau, but we knew uh, that the ocean connects Palau and the rest of the Pacific. And we were lucky that uh, when the rift blitzed, we had recovery because of nearby coral populations that came from Yap in the Federated States of Micronesia. And so that led to uh, the establishment of uh, what we call a Micronesia Challenge, a regional initiative in the North Pacific to protect at least 30% of coastal ecosystem and 20% of terrest uh, terrestrial ecosystems in Micronesia. It's been over uh, close to 20 years uh, that we've worked on these initiatives. Financing has always been a challenge. We have ample local leadership, political leadership, but because of our uh, unique circumstances of lack of finances, there's only so much we can do. And we've looked uh, to the international community uh, to help support uh, innovative uh, uh, solutions that we as small island communities have been able to put together. Uh, partnerships, uh, learning networks, uh, sharing of uh, not only success but failures is very important because if we fail fast, we learn fast and then we can move on to the next thing rather than trying to do the same thing like what we've done with uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, reduction in emissions. We kept asking uh, for higher ambitions and many governments come and make uh, very great and high ambitions, but they're not transparent in how they're implementing them. And so every year uh, we see the same problem persist. And every year we see uh, the impact on climate change on our coral reefs increase. And we're now seeing that impact on people's lives. So how long do we need to wait to really uh, get our act together? Time is no longer on our side. So for us in Palau, uh, we've sort of extended our effort uh, throughout the Pacific. So today, I'm not sure if uh, many of you heard, through the Prime Minister of Tonga, uh, we announced the uh, unlocking Blue Pacific Prosperity. It's an initiative to protect, to manage 100% of the Pacific Ocean, including 30% uh, protection. And the second goal is. Uh, ensuring healthy Pacific people through ensuring of a healthy coastal ecosystems, whereby coral reefs at, at, at the heart, coral reefs and mangrove at the heart of our coastal ecosystems. So we're very happy that the uh, Global Coral Reef Fund has uh, recent, finally uh, approved uh, uh, an investment uh, to Micronesia. I call it an investment uh, because it is investing in nature that will benefit not only Palawans, Micronesians, Pacific Island, but in the global uh, community. And we call on others to uh, help contribute to investing in this unlocking blue prosperity. Tomorrow at 1.30 p.m., we will 
uh, have our Pacific leaders formally announce uh, their commitment. And we hope that some of you with resources will show up and help support and so that we can uh, protect uh, at least 30% of the Pacific Ocean, in including managing 100% for the Pacific people and for the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm an, I, I, need, I must acknowledge uh, the impressive resilience of the people of Palau, taking smart measures towards climate and biodiversity to conserve the corals. So congratulations for that. So now uh, it's time uh, and it's my honor to introduce the Honorable Linda Tabuya, Minister of the Ministry of Women, Children and Social Protection for Fiji. Fiji, just to remind you, which is rich marine biodiversity and vibrant coral reefs, holds a unique perspective on the challenges and opportunities associated with preserving these invaluable ecosystems. Fiji is also the forefront of recent initiative, initiatives to safeguard these precious ecosystems, hosting a GFCR program, aiming to mobilize a GFCR investment program, uh, aiming to mobilize public and private investment to support the resilience of the Fijian coral reefs and local communities. I welcome Minister Linda Tabuya to share insights into the coral reef breakthrough and the role in safeguarding, safeguarding the well-being of our oceans and communities that depend on them. Minister, the floor is yours. Bulavinaka, thank you, Leticia. Um, it's just uh, really an honor to be here representing Fiji. And of course, with my Pacific brother here beside me from Palau and my colleagues on my left and right. Thank you. I join you today um, as the representative of the government of Fiji. As some of you may know, an island nation, if you've been there, whose destiny is really intertwined with the vast, vibrant expanse of coral reefs that adorn our blue oceanic borders. We are home to the third largest continuous barrier reef in the world, the Great Astrolab Reef. And in fact, my coastal village in the island of Kandavu, where I'm from, faces the Great Astrolab Reef, a natural wonder that is not just a reservoir of biodiversity, but a guardian of our shores. Therefore, it is with a profound sense of achievement and fervent excitement that we commemorate the breakthrough. An innovative accountability framework establishing the first ever global targets for the conservation of coral reefs. For Fiji and indeed for the world, this is a pivotal moment to celebrate and recalibrate our efforts and place coral reefs at the forefront of the global environmental agenda. In our nation, coral reefs are revered as the protector of Fiji shielding us from the fury of storm surges, anchoring our food security, and sustaining the livelihoods of a significant portion of our population. In the face of escalating climate challenges, the resilience of our coral reefs has become synonymous with the resilience of our communities. While climate change remains a formidable adversary to our reefs, we are confident that a breakthrough or that the breakthrough provides comprehensive action points to address local loss drivers, enhance resilient space conservation, and develop large scale restora restoration solutions. The successful implementation of these action points is crucial, not only for the health of world's coral ecosystems, but also for the prosperity of coastal communities like my own. Therefore, a key element of this strategy involves bridging the coral reef funding gap. The goal is to secure at least 12 billion US dollars by 2030. Today, we call on donors, financial institutions, private investors, and philanthropic entities to join this groundbreaking journey. And I join my brother from Palau in that call. The sum of USD $12 billion, while seemingly like a high number, but considering the astronomical value of these ecosystems and the extent of global capital available for investment, this figure is feasible. 
I am thrilled to highlight that in Fiji, the wheels of this monumental endeavor are already in motion. The Global Fund for Coral Reefs, a testament to the power of public-private partnerships, is actively mobilizing investments to fortify the resilience of our coral reefs and communities. Fiji has pioneered this initiative, launching the first program under this fund in early 2021. From fostering reef positive enterprises to innovating in organic fertilizer production and waste management, we are trailblazing paths that reduce harmful impacts on our reefs and simultaneously bolster our economy. But these efforts must be significantly scaled. And more importantly, the path to success is not one we can walk alone. Our reefs, though geographically localized, are globally interconnected. The sustainable blue economy must be a universal pursuit tailored to safeguard marine ecosystems worldwide. In conclusion, and with a heart full of hope, what remains is a uni unified global effort and investment to deliver. By delivering on the breakthroughs targets, we deliver well-being for Fiji and other coastal nations whose longevity and prosperity depends on our coral reefs. Let us learn from the ocean's wisdom and the coral's resilience, uniting to ensure that these guardians of our past and present remains a vibrant front of a part of our future. Vinaka and thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Linda Tabuyo. What an honor listening from you. So now I would like to welcome our uh, last but not least speaker. Uh, and I would like to welcome the Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell MP. Minister of State in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. The UK, I must say, uh, has long taken decisive action for the ocean uh, through its Blue Planet Fund, which finances initiatives to protect and restore marine habitats, including the ones supported by the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. The BBF, BPF, uh, the Blue Planet Fund is instrumental in enhancing resilience, fostering adaptation and mitigating the impacts of climate change by, by promoting nature-based uh, solutions. As we advocate for sustainable practices, it's imperative to underscore that the Blue Planet Fund, the major goal is to safeguard at least 30% of the global ocean by 20 by 30. By 2030. This commitment is a crucial step in shielding our ocean from the consequences of climate change. It's really important to acknowledge these objectives find strong support to the funds, uh, through the funds significant contributions to the, to the GFCR. And I'm here to really acknowledge uh, the goodwill of the UK in supporting this work. And we would like now to please to hear your remarks uh, on how the groundbreaker coral reef breakthrough will drive action and how the UK has committed support, uh, has committed to support achievements of the breakthrough targets. Um, Johannes, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Leticia, very much indeed for that. And thank you to my brilliant and eloquent uh, colleagues uh, from Palau and Fiji and, and from Brazil, who, of course, will be taking over the G20 and uh, with whom we have the privilege of sharing a pavilion at this wonderful uh, COP. Uh, so it is inspiring to see so much ambition for coral conservation on the global stage. I'm the British uh, Minister for Development, and we know in the British Foreign Office that coral reefs are vital to national economies and provide essential resilience to coastal communities in the face of increasing climate-related uh, disasters. The UK's waters are home to cold water coral reefs, and we have approximately 5,000 square kilometres of corals across our UK overseas territories. Uh, these corals are vital to national economies and the social well-being of residents. And together, this makes the British family responsible for the 12th largest area of coral reefs in, in the world. 
Britain was one of the first to commit funding for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs back in 2021. And more recently, we stepped up as the GFCR co-chair alongside the United Nations Environment Programme, represented by you, Letitia. Uh, international work to protect these vital marine habitats is absolutely essential. And I am therefore delighted today to announce that Britain is endorsing the coral reef uh, breakthrough. Uh, Britain is the largest donor to the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, investing £33 million to the grant fund between 2021 and 2025. Uh, Britain is also committed to doubling our international climate finance to £11.6 million and to spending at least a third of that on nature and nature-based solutions, including mangroves and colleagues. So I'll end, Letitia, if I may, by saying that because the decline in coral reefs is a global issue, it makes, us, it, makes it all the more urgent that we come together to implement sustainable financing mechanisms to tackle their decline. And I hope to see many more governments and those in the private sector increase their support for the coral reef breakthrough. A truly global effort is the only way we are going to see this through. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Andrew Mitchell, and thanks UK for the generous um, donation and for Ignite the action under the GFCR and for the partnership in the co-chairmanship. So what can more, what could, could I say more? I mean, this is just a brilliant panel. We have a big coastal state. We have two big ocean states here and we have a whole community represented. We have political will. We have the ones championing mobilizing finance. This is just uh, an amazing model that I can't stop to champion because there is so much potential. So with that, I would like to thank you all uh, the esteemed spe speakers uh, for their leadership and officially launching the Coral Reef Breakthrough here today. You have given us invaluable insights into the importance of this remarkable moment. And I hope you will join us for the rest of the panel because we still have another session to deep dive in what the breakthrough really means for the international community in support of the global coral reef conservation and climate smart action. Thank you very much for joining us today.
uh, targets by 2030. Each of you joined me on stage because you are leaders of action for coral reefs, representing a foundation, the private sector, and the coral community youth. We look forward to hearing for your perspectives and how we can ensure the coral reef breakthrough targets catalyze action, concrete actions. So I ask a little bit of a patience just for our guest speakers to get settled with their microphones. What you see now, it's even more interesting than what you just heard. I can, I, I can tell you. We are almost there. Here we go. So allowed me to introduce, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Right Honor Princess Hala Bint Khaled, Khaled bin Sultan Al Saud, president of the Khaled bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation. Welcome to the stage. Also, I would like to introduce Mr. Craig, Craig Kaut, the CEO of Pegasus Capital Advisors and the foundational member uh, of the GFCR. Pleasure having you, Craig. Mr. Cyril Gooch, CEO and founder of Parley for the Oceans, and you will discover what is this very soon. So with that, I would like to say, Your Royal Highness, uh, I would like to start with you by asking how you are involved in the Coral Reef Breakthrough and what is your institution's role in supporting achievements of the targets? The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with our distinguished panel. Uh, today, I'm wearing two hats. So one hat is the president of the Khaled bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation, which is a, found a nonprofit organization my father started 23 years ago. So we're just coming up on our uh, 25th anniversary, and we're, we're very excited about that. Um, since uh, the foundation's founding, we've engaged in uh, we've engaged engaged close to 300 scientists, managers, and technical experts from all over the world to work on coral reef conservation. Um, for example, our global reef expedition sailed around the world and assessed the state of coral reefs, uh, identifying th uh, those at risk and made our data available to governments to use um, in establishing their MPAs. Our award-winning uh, outreach and education programs uh, improve ocean literacy around the world and inspire the next generation of ocean leaders. Our efforts to create the first maps of Saudi Arabia's uh, Red Sea reefs are finally paying off. Uh, they're now being used to inform the creation of a network of cons conservation areas in the kingdom that will protect coral reefs. I'm also honored to be here as a Saudi citizen and uh, who's very proud of my country emerging as a global leader in coral reef conservation. The Saudi leadership has recognized the challenge to conserve and restore corals and is taking dom action domestically and internationally. The kingdom made a commitment to protect 30% of its waters by 2030, and as co a custodian of about 5% of global coral reefs, that's quite a big deal. We've created and resourced institutions to achieve the, uh, the goals of the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So Saudi organizations such as the National Center for Wildlife uh, and the General Organization for Conservation of Coral and Red Sea Turtles in the Red Sea are spearheading coral conservation in the kingdom. Saudi, uh, Saudi private companies such as Red Sea Global and uh, Neom uh, are paying special attention to coral reef conservation and engaging in the restoration and restoration efforts as part of envi environmentally conscious tourism projects. Education and awareness efforts are also uh, being made in this regard, leading up to the projects opening uh, opening their doors to their first visitors. 
The kingdom also championed and created the Coral, uh, the Coral Research and Develop, uh, Development Accelerator platform, better known as CORDAP, as the G20 initiative, and is ho uh, hosting CORDAP's foundation as, with the kingdom as its home. And CORDAP now engages with, I believe, over 70 countries um, and institutions. With all this in mind, I'm grateful to the Coral Reef Breakthrough Initiative for bringing international leaders together to take actionable steps towards conserving and restoring coral reefs. Your Highness. Thank you very much. Thanks for bringing the cord up to the family together with ICRI, with GFCR, and so many other champions of the corals in the world. So your fundamental uh, support is much appreciated. With that, let me now turn to my friend, co and fellow uh, member of the executive board of the GFCR, uh, Craig Ecault. He is the CEO of the Pegasus Capital, and you will know now uh, the role of the Pegasus Capital Advisors uh, to talk about the investment fund of the coral reefs and including what it is or has raised uh, to the date towards to the breakthrough targets and what it's so exciting in terms of new investments deals uh, you have for the fund, and I hope you have good news for us. I don't want to anticipate any. Frag, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and um, congratulations to the high-level climate champions, IPRI, and all of our colleagues at the UN, and particularly our partners on the grant side who've been so active in helping to bring this breakthrough to light. Um, we are the investment partner at the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. It is, when people talk about creative financing, it is a model of blended finance. Um, our prince, our anchor investor on the junior basis is the Green Climate Fund. Um, they work closely with us. Um, we have additional wonderful partners in Mindaroo and um, Builders Vision. And in part because of this breakthrough, we are rapidly mobilizing beyond the 125 billion dollars we've already raised, and I think we'll have some substantial closings additionally. Um, and the grant fund is an important part of the blended finance mechanism, and we work closely with Pierre and his team and you in working on investments. Um, I'm also excited to preview the speaking of creative financing, um, the UAE has created a facility which will be unveiled a little later this week or next week. Um, focusing on, on food security and resilience. And we will be through this fund and another GCF fund of ours, um, major participants in that. And it will free up more capital. I mean, we heard from the minister from Fiji how far behind we are, we need to act urgently. And speaking of urgently, the key, all of this is about for us investing. And investing is about scale, acceleration, scale and replication. So we've made an investment in a major sargassum platform in the Caribbean. We've started a, a number of eco, um, ecotourism projects. One advancing very quickly is in Grand Bahama, which will also involve coral restoration. And I'm really excited today with this person who looks very different than me to announce that we are investing with Cyril and Parley for the Oceans in what will be a global ocean cleanup program. So. He will tell you what we are about to do truly at a global scale. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Greg. And we very much welcome the good news anticipated that I'm sure that Cyril will now uh, fit the bill telling us exactly uh, these investments are going to turn into. So allowed me to introduce the representative of the new Reef Positive Investment. Sorry. Sorry. Just concerting. Uh, So I was a little lost here. Apologies for that, but actually, uh, Craig just has uh, spoken about it. Apologies, uh, uh, friends, this is long day. Uh, but I really would like to build upon what Craig uh, Pegasus CEO just mentioned. Uh, that Cyril has created, Cyril Gruch has created is the founder of Parley. And Parley for the Oceans is the global environment organization and network where creators, thinkers, and leaders come together to take action for the ocean. Using intercepted marine, and this is very important, marine plastic debris, and you all know that there is a global international effort in order to, in order to reduce and even to sort uh, the marine uh, plastic pollution into the oceans or being carried on into the oceans, 
Pali creates premium un up upcycled materials for a range of sports, fashion, design, and luxury industries. Pali has partnered with global brands to support marine plastic upcycling, including Adidas, Dior, and American Express. I now turn to you, Cyril, to share with us what this journey is. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope I get some. Yes, here we go. So I'm going to stand up. Sorry for that. I can't talk when I'm sitting. So I have to have my cable following. Um, yes, we taking action. Stephen Victor just said it. And we tried to operate in, the, in Palau. We actually tried to operate in a lot of countries out there, small island development states. And it's not that easy. Taking action is not a word. It means going out there and working, going out there building relationships, going out there and actually having operators on the ground, finding the people, the communities that are willing to collaborate because we're not coming there with a boat as white, whiteies and telling people what to do. We need to find allies. We need to help people to help us to understand the problems and end the problems out there. Play for the Oceans is a negotiation of peace. It's an environmental organization and our target, and the clicker doesn't work, um, our target is to end, I would say, on one side, the plastic crisis by intercepting trash, but on the other hand, acknowledging that plastic is a design failure. It's a toxic material, and we will not end this crisis by cleaning up. It's shedding, it's leaching, it's gassing off. And yes, we invented a way to make lots of money with trash, with, with stuff nobody wants to touch, even if it costs so much to pick it up in the Maldives, in Seychelles. And we're doing that, and I brought some of these poisonous little items with me in a beautiful Dior bag. Because end of the day, that's what we have to do. We go out and clean up. But then you are out there at the end of the world, when you're sitting there in Palau, in the Maldives, in Seychelles, at the Great Barrier Reef, and you sit there day by day, cleaning up, going through the sand, picking up the small pieces. You just realize with your heart, not even with your brain, this can never be cleaned up. It's a design failure. This material is toxic. It breaks down and it will always shed. And yes, you can now say recycling is not the solution, but today it is one of the only solutions that we actually have at scale because we are putting more plastic out than ever. And we're going to keep putting out more plastic for the next 15 years. We are plastic addicts. This house wouldn't stand without plastic. I wouldn't be here without plastic. Here is plastic. My clothes are plastic. Your pants stretch because of plastic. Your chewing gum is plastic. Your tea bag is plastic. We are depending on plastic. The only way out of the plastic crisis is to invent new materials. And I have to say, the fossil fuel industry saved the whales. Plastic bags saved the forests. But now we are so many people. Now we have to save ourselves from the old inventions, the old technologies that had a good place and time. And that's why the ultimate solution of future materials, biofabricated materials, natural materials, replacement of toxic substances. But in the meantime, we're going out there, we're cleaning up, we're taking all the trash we find. We spend a fortune doing so, sometimes $100 per kilogram. And in order to fund that, because nobody on planet Earth will pay $100 for a kilogram of bad health, crazy, screwed up material, we needed to create a vehicle. And that vehicle is our own brand, Parley. We established Parley over the last 11 years as a consumer brand. And it sits on shoes. Athletes win World Cups. Messi was wearing a Parley outfit. It was our trash. Actually, trash from Maldives. We have made 120 million products with trash. We turned trash into gold when nobody actually saw that coming. The way we're doing it, we work with communities, we hire people, we give them jobs, and we make them happy. So they are happy to work with us. And that, that they become models for our brand just by doing their work. Suddenly, cleaning up the oceans, cleaning up beaches, cleaning up the rivers becomes the biggest advertising campaign on earth, and it's not even advertising. So people are buying these brands, these products with our brand on it to be part of that movement. And we have 
maximized our knowledge, our pain has been hard the last 11 years, and we have not taken on an investor. We have earned the money ourselves with our ideas. We have, have created value. But now is the step where we know how to do this. We know how to end the crisis in a country by intercepting all the trash, by educating people to phase it out, by changing laws, but also by building the foundation for new materials, because this has to happen step by step and fast. And that's the partnership that we are now having with the first investor we ever, ever allowed to be an investor because they are united with us um, through values and they're bringing us into a family of powerful players, sovereign states, uh, intergovernmental organizations, private sector. And that's the alliance that we need now to make what we did over 11 years available to every country that has the problem and to make Pali for the Oceans and Pali Ocean Defense Program huge. And that's the foundation to then phase in new materials that are not anymore toxic. But first, we have to clean up. And taking action means going out there and actually doing the work. Thank you. Piro, thanks a lot for bringing us into the concrete world. This was fantastic. We have solutions, we have knowledge, we have political will. Again, we need to mobilize finance. We have mechanisms. The GFCR is this. So thanks a lot for bringing us into the concrete solutions. With that, I would like to do some final announcements. Um, as the Global Fund uh, for Coral Reefs Executive Board Co-Chair, I'm pleased to today to make additional announcements of on behalf of all of the family and our coalition in the GFCR. GFCR's coalition's coalition members are proud to announce that it has already mobilized an initial 200 million US dollars towards the coral reef breakthrough targets. I think we need a big clap for this. The breakthrough funding commitment represents recent pledges from donors and investors, including Bloomberg, Philanthropies, Builders Vision, Mindaro Foundation, the Green Climate Fund, as well as the government of France, Canada, UK, United Kingdom, and United States. So again, thanks to all of these ones, uh, really moving the needle and taking us to the next step. Moving forward, the GFCR, GFCR coalition aims to directly raise and invest an additional 500 million US dollars uh, toward coral reef breakthrough actions. So we are 200, we have 300 to go. Uh, and this should happen uh, by 2030. Leveraging investments with the potential to amplify conservation returns for coral nations at the scale of at least $2.5 billion. So the GFCR coalition is also pleased to announce that the expansion of its portfolio of work to support conservation and sustainable blue economy in five additional coral nations. Let me say Sri Lanka, Jordan, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and Palau. We are very much looking for the other ones that will come uh, after this one. And this is going to be a continuity force of the coalition of the, within the GFCR. I would like to thank you very much, the brilliant panelists, the investors, the donors, uh, the philanthropies, and the creative ones that are actually finding solutions for our problems in the oceans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. No, race. I I ask I ask. Please, colleagues, we still have a final speaker. So, and this is the most important person. It's the future generation. So don't, don't, don't give up yet. So let me please now call our last speaker. That's Grace Catapang, GFCR Frontline Youth Ambassador from the Philippines and the Blue Alliance Philippines Communication and Science Coordination. Please stay in the room because this is the most fascinating and the future person in this room. Grace, you have the floor, please.
Hi, everyone. I am Grace. I am the Global Fund for Coral Reefs Frontline Union Representative. I am from the Philippines. And I also work with Blue Finance and Blue Alliance in the Philippines, supported by the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. I stand here now as one of the 55 million Filipino coastal community members, depending on the ocean. For us, protecting our remaining coral reefs is not just about safeguarding marine biodiversity. It is also about preserving our way of life. And I am here too, representative of the global youth, maybe the same age as your daughter or niece. And I speak for us and our future. The coral reefs in the Philippines are part of the coral triangle, often referred to as the Amazon of the seas. In our waters, three quarters of all known coral species exist. Beyond their ecological significance, they are integral to the livelihood of communities and the economic prosperity of our country. As an archipelagic nation, our coasts in the Philippines are filled with vast, beautiful coral reefs. However, these ecosystems are in peril, facing a crisis that demands immediate action. And the crisis is not just facing the reefs in my region. It is a global crisis. For many of you in the room, it is your generation's actions that have led to the alarming disappearance of 50% of our Earth's coral reefs. What's left for us, the young and future generations, are the remains of these once striving ecosystems. I am just 22 years old, and in my short two decades of existence, I have witnessed ecosystems falling apart, increasing wildfires and coral bleaching. People in my community are suffering. Frequent storm evacuations, loss of homes, jobs, and even lives. And on a global scale, Indigenous peoples, fisher folks, and farmers, those on the front lines of climate change, are the most vulnerable and severely impacted by the loss. Yet despite these realities, progress remains slow and commitments are not yet sufficient nor collective. We are not just facing a gentle ecological shift. We are seeing the potential loss of an entire ecosystem. And the youth of my generation are witnessing the relentless destruction of nature. This is not a distant concern. It is a crisis unfolding right before our eyes. And we, the global youth community, have had enough. At this crucial time, Silence is no longer an option. The will of the communities at the front lines of this crisis and our very own aspirations will be heard. We are urging your action now, and I am here on behalf of youth and frontline communities to announce a challenge for your collective efforts, working with us side by side to deliver on the targets of the 2030 Coral Reef Breakthrough. At this critical juncture, time is no longer on our side. We must recognize our shared responsibility to protect our reefs. Through my work with Blue Finance and Blue Alliance in the Philippines, a female marine ranger supported by our program, Ate Vilma, told me, Kung wala ang kalikasan, Wala rin tayo. Meaning, without nature, there is no us. We can't exist. As Ranger Vilma relayed, your leadership on this effort is not only vital to the health of our planet, but also essential to the well being of humanity. Recognize that this urgency is also for your children and grandchildren. Think about the world you want them to inherit, a world where coral reefs thrive 
providing food security, livelihoods, and coastal protection. Through collective action, we can power resilience and foster a culture of sustainability, a culture that knows how to respect all forms of life, and a culture that embraces the harmony of coexistence with nature. Let us never take this power for granted. Let us collectively meet the urgent challenge to deliver on the coral reef breakthrough targets, ensuring a sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Can you give me the mic again? It's working. Thanks, Grace, for your courage for your vibrance, for your energy, for your intelligence. And it's, it's just an honor to share this space and this generation with you. Hopefully we honor what you are saying as well, giving you time to take action. So finally, finally, we have these two final speakers, Grace, and the next one that I will invite are taking us to the future. Grace, because she is the future. And I would like also to introduce um, some very important person, uh, His Excellency Hervé Berville, State Secretary for uh, the Ocean in the France government. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite you to take us to the future of the United Nations uh, Future Ocean Conference in Nice, uh, two years ahead of us. So please take the floor to tell us, take us uh, to the road to Nice. Thank you very much. Bonsoir. Okay, so I learned something today. Look, you're not the future when you're under 33, because you said she's the future. I'm 33, so I thought you would say, and he's also the future, but I'm not. So when you're more than 33, you're not the future. <laughs> no, I'm, it's a great pleasure uh, being here. Um, I thought you wanted me to talk about a little bit our engagement about the coral reef breakthrough for France, but I will also try to 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 give you a little bit of um, of what we want to do together for the United Nations Ocean Conference, even if I eluded a little bit uh, this um, uh, morning. Um, I'm here uh, because the day that you had here uh, at this uh, beautiful uh, United Nations Environment Program Pavilion is really critical uh, for our capacity to tackle the, the big challenge of our time, the challenge of climate change and the loss of biodiversity. And if there is something we have to remember from this day, day and those events is that, and you mentioned it, I'm pretty sure during the, the whole event in the whole day, is that there is no way we will be able to achieve uh, our goal of uh, the 1.5 degrees, achieving our goal of giving a livable planet to the future generation to our kid without taking into account the ocean and without merging those two agenda, climate and biodiversity. And without recognizing and making sure that the, all the leaders, and I was with the, the Prince of, of Monaco who mentioned ocean in his speech, uh, and the President Macron also earlier mentioned the necessity, the urgency of uh, uh, making ocean as a priority in our environment, uh, diplomacy, and all of our top uh, uh, financing. If we do not uh, uh, take into account uh, this, first of all, we will not manage to achieve those targets, but we'll also accelerate the, 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 the climate change. We'll also accelerate the loss of biodiversity. And there is something really important for me. We'll be more uh, uh, independent because like uh, the ocean is a key element for food, for water quality, but also for medicine and pharmaceutical uh, issues. So I'm here because for France, I mentioned it earlier this morning, Coral Reef, it's a really key element of our strategy to protect the ocean. We have a, a strategy of protecting 100% of uh, our Posidonia in Mediterranean, and also a, a strategy of protecting 100% of the Coral Reef. I'm pretty sure you know it. If you don't know it, then I'm gonna have a problem with France. That France is home to 10% of the uh, total coral reef in the world, because we have uh, maritime uh, space in the Pacific, 
with French Polynesia, essentially with uh, the Caribbean uh, island, but also the Indian Ocean. So for us, if we want to protect our own ocean, our own uh, maritime space, we need to make sure that we integrate uh, the Coral Reef. We didn't start it one year ago, even if of course we accelerated with the President Macron and since uh, we're, we're doing uh, ocean as a priority of our uh, environment policy, but we joined some Coral Reef coalition, some uh, initiative back in the 1994, uh, uh, back also in 1998, and we grew uh, our financing support to this kind of uh, 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 initiative and, and priority. And I'm really happy also to announce today that we will uh, 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 um, increase our financial commitment to the Global uh, Reef uh, uh, Initiative. I don't want to say the, the, the wrong name, so I'll be um, to the yeah, the Global Coral Reef Fund, because otherwise have, there is quite a lot of different initiatives. I don't want to make any mistake to the Global Reef uh, Fund of 1 million for the year. And we're going to continue increasing our investment, our commitment, because this is for us a key element in our uh, ocean uh, diplomacy. So you see for it, it's important for our neighbors also, for all the small island, for all the, 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 the Pacific uh, state, the Caribbean states, we need to be there, of course, to finance, but also to bring and to share the science. And it goes, uh, and, and, and it tell me the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, now continue on the United Nations Ocean Conference. We're just in the ocean pavilions uh, talking uh, with some scientists, with the uh, economic actors, trying to really um, acknowledge the fact that this conference will be a key moment in a really busy year. And I really urge you, even if you will be really busy with the 10 years of the COP21, the 10 years of the financing of the SDG, the Sendai uh, protocol, we'll have also another COP, the COP30 will be in Brazil, really important, especially for the first. But I urge you to make sure that the United Nations Ocean Conference is still at the top of your agenda. And we have the opportunity in a really important year for international environment diplomacy to put uh, ocean at the center. So the battle also is to make understand our citizen and the leader that the, the race or the marathon, and, and I know you all now uh, quite well trained for marathon because when you have to go to the other side, it's quite a long walk. Uh, so now we're, we're ready for the, for the, big, the, the, the big year. Um, make, make understand the citizen and also um, the leaders that even if we had success, we had success with the BBNG adoption, uh, 15 years of discussion, we manage even if it was a complicated time, even if we we're like in a really conflicted geopolitical landscape, we managed last March to conclude this BBNG treaty, really important one BBNG treaty, because it covers 50% of the ocean. We managed not to start the deep sea mining uh, with a really important meeting of the International Civil Authority in July that say, okay, we're going to uh, uh, pause, or at least we're going to put uh, as a priority the research. And we were four countries one year ago, we are now 20 for countries, but we should be really careful that those victories are not like um, diverting us for the big fight. And the big fight is of course also plastic pollution, is also the fight against illegal fishing, is also the decarbonization of the maritime transport, is also of course the protection of the biodiversity within national jurisdiction. And the United Nations Environment Program is doing a, a fantastic job with all this regional sea convention. So we need to make sure that even if we had some victories, we still realize that we still have a marathon to win. And the, four, the, the, the first 100 meters are not the entire race. So that's why for the United Nations Ocean Conference, we'll have three we call it side event, but it's not really side event. That's for me something I really at the core of also the discussion, but that's not the diplomatic uh, process of the United Nations Ocean. So we'll organize a one ocean science event, gathering more than 2,000 scientists three days before the beginning of the United Nations Ocean Conference to make sure that the scientists, they come and bring uh, the leader 
all the state of the art uh, science on all the different uh, issues. I hope there will be some really key uh, science on marine turtle, sea turtle, because that's my favorite animal. Uh, but it's not something personal. Um, and we'll make sure also to include traditional knowledge and indigenous science, because if we do not take into account those kind of science, then we're going to have an issue implementing, and we're going to have an issue in terms of inclusion, in terms of an, an inclusion and and and, um, and and collaboration and cooperation with, for example, uh, uh, the Pacific Island. So for me, and I want to ask to uh, the the head of our research uh, body, I told them we need to have like really an integration of the indigenous science because this is the only way we'll be able also to take into consideration what a lot of people are already doing and doing well. So that is the first one, the Ocean Science Conference. The second one, it is really important, especially, and I see a lot of people from a lot of different places, is to also have before the conference, uh, a, a conference dedicated, uh, a side event dedicated to the cities. And with especially a focus on the sea rise uh, uh, level and how we can create a coalition and we mandate uh, our mayor of Nice will organize uh, the conference to be the one working, leading this coalition and making sure that when the leaders, when the government, when the other state are discussing the issue of the ocean, they take into consideration, of course, uh, the, the cities. Because what is probably the mistake, the only mistake of the COP21 is that we didn't take into consideration enough the cities. But they're the one who has to implement then after the policy. They're the one who has to take uh, 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 the specificities and have to to, to adapt those national policies to, to the reality of the ground. So what we want with the President Macron is to make sure that the cities are integrated, but not only coastal cities, not only uh, uh, littoral cities as we say in French. We need to make sure that the cities far from the sea are also integrated. Why? Because when you talk about plastic pollution, chemical pol pollution, you need to discuss with the cities where you produce this kind of, how you produce where you can have this kind of, of pollution. So we need to integrate even like, I don't know, like uh, uh, Dallas, uh, we need to integrate Strasbourg, we need to integrate uh, Varsovie, we need to integrate, uh, sorry, I'm not gonna do all the cities, but making sure that landlocked cities are integrated because it goes, the issue, and, and the UN is a perfect like uh, body also for that, from the, the city down the river, the fleuve, and then going to the to the to the to the port, and and we need to do that also to protect those coastal communities. The third and the last side event, really important, is the one on blue economy, and 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 there is here like people leading the way on on financing and the 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 this blue economy, the blue carbon. We need to really change completely the way we're seeing it, and and blue economy is not only. I don't really like the, this word thing. We need to fill the gap uh, to finance uh, uh, the ocean. No, it's not only filling the gap. It's just like reversing the table and making sure that we oceanize uh, our the market. We oceanize all our uh, product. And 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 we're we're discussing with uh, some of uh, people here in the room the fact that ocean is a key element for food, for medicine, but um, also for water quality. So we need to make sure that we mainstream those kind of uh, innovative and, and blue finance uh, uh, in the market, and also doing it in 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 with the approach of the just transition, making sure that there is no. Uh, a, a bigger gap between the, the OECD countries and the Global South in terms of uh, access to financing, but also innovation, innovating. So I'm hopeful, and it will be like a, a special event uh, in Monaco, and this one on blue uh, uh, finance, blue economy, is critical uh, also to, to, to make sure that we take into consideration the fact that ocean is uh, a key element in our economic sovereignty. 80% of the trade is through maritime route. 90% of what you have in your phone is coming through submarine cables. So we need to make sure that it's really at the top of uh, the agenda. And I'm really proud to uh, tell you that France announced two days ago, President Macron, a fund of uh, public private fund of 1.5 billion euros to accelerate the decarbonization of uh, the maritime transport. But also uh, we uh, managed to organize with the US uh, a meeting, uh, the first agreement between five shipping companies, CMHSM, Merckx, uh, MSC, and Apagloid, big players, 
that put aside the competition and they're doing fierce competition. When you in this business, each container is a battle. But for the sake of the climate change, they were in the room with us here at the COP28 for the first time, and they agreed on accelerating uh, the transition, they agreed on accelerating the financing of new fleet, they agreed on accelerating the reduction of emission. And that's something really important because maritime transport is 3% of the total emission. So when they take action, it changes also our capacity of tackling uh, uh, climate change. So you see, there is a lot of uh, uh, things we want to discuss uh, in uh, 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 um, Nice. We'll do it with, of course, the sense of urgency, but also with the, the conviction the conviction that mobilizing people toward like beautiful goal, because what we're discussing here is just to make sure that we protect something that is really beautiful, that I want to give it uh, to, my, to my kids, to my children. And doing it with the conviction that ocean is one element, is just one space. There is a six name for six or five different like uh, ocean, but it's one ocean. When there is a pollution uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, it can, spill into Indian Ocean. So for the first time for me, we have an element that can really unite us, even if you're not like uh, ocean or maritime country, you can st you still are related through the river to the ocean. And because it is a blue planet. So for us, we're talking about, of, of course, our past, because we're coming from the ocean. Life came from the ocean. We just left uh, this uh, blue uh, space. And I'm convinced, and I, I'm sure it's the same for you, that our futures lie on our capacity to protect the marine biodiversity, to protect the deep sea, the battle of the century, making sure we do not start this uh, craziness, and also making sure that uh, the blue economy, it's a resilient economy, it's a regenerative economy, it's finance, and it's for the people from the OECD country, from the global south. So let's ratify BBNG, let's pause on deep sea mining, let's uh, sail together toward uh, the Unite 3 and NIST. Thank you very much. His Excellency Minister Eve, uh, allowed me to tell you and break the diplomatic protocol, you are definitely part of the youth and you have a long time there with this energy. So now I would like really to close this panel and invite everybody and everyone to join our cocktail and, and a reception that's happening in the back of our pavilion and it's also together with our colleagues in the ocean pavilion, the sister pavilion of this one. Please go there and mingle. Thank you very much.